Chapter 1 of The Pirate Island, A Story of the South Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Pirate Island, A Story of the South Pacific by Harry Collingwood. Chapter 1. The Wreck on the Gunfleet. It was emphatically a dirty night. The barometer had been slowly but persistently falling during the two previous days. The dawn had been red and threatening, with a strong breeze from southeast. And as the short, dreary November day waxed and waned, this strong breeze had steadily increased in strength, until by nightfall it had become a regular November gale, with frequent squalls of arrowy rain and sleet, which, impelled by the furious gusts, smote and stung like hail, and cleared the streets almost as effectually as a volley of musketry would have done. It was not fit for a dog to be out of doors, so said Ned Anger as he entered the snug bar parlor of the anchor at Brightlingsea, and drawing a chair close up to the blazing fire of wreckwood which roared up the ample chimney, flung himself heavily down thereon to await the arrival of the pint which he had ordered as he passed the bar. "'And yet there's a many poor souls as has to be out in it, and as is out in it,' returned the buxom hostess, entering at the moment with the aforesaid pint upon a small tray. It's to be hoped as none of em won't meet their deaths out there among the sands this fearful night, she added, as Ned took the glass from her, and deposited his tuppence in the tray in payment therefore. A sympathetic murmur of concurrence went round the room in response to this philanthropic wish, accompanied in some instances by doubtful shakes of the head. Ay, ay, we all hope that, remarked Dick Bird. Dicky Bird was the name which had been playfully bestowed upon him by his chums, and by which he was generally known. We all hopes that, but I, for one, feels uncommon duberous about it. There's hardly a capful of wind as blows, but what some poor unfortunate craft leaves her bones out there, with a jerk of the thumb over his shoulder to seaward. And mostly with every wreck there's some lives lost. I say, mates, I suppose there's somebody on the lookout? Ay, ay, responded old Bill Maskell, from his favorite corner under the tall old-fashioned clock case. Bob's gone across the creek and up to the tower as usual. The boy will go. Always says as how it's his duty to go up there and keep a lookout in bad weather. So as his eyes is as sharp as needles, and since one is as good as a hundred for that sort of work, I thought I'd just look in here for an hour or two, so as to be on the spot if in case any of us should be wanted. I've often wondered how it is that it always falls to Bob's lot to go upon the lookout in bad weather. How is it? asked an individual in semi-nautical costume at the far end of the room, whose bearing and manner conveyed the impression that he regarded himself, as indeed he was, somewhat of an intruder. He was a ship chandler shopman with an ambition to be mistaken for a genuine salt and had not been many months in the place. Well, you see, mister, the way of it is just this, explained old Maskell, who considered the question as addressed more especially to him. Bob was took off a rack in the Maplin when he was a mere babby, the only one saved. Found him wrapped up warm and snug in one of the bunks on the weather side of the cabin with the water surging up to within three inches of him. So ever since he's been old enough to understand he've always insisted as it was his duty, by way of returning thanks like, to take the lookout when a rack may be expected. And don't you make no mistake... There ain't an eye so sharp as his for a signal rocket in the whole place. Sees them almost afore they be fired, he do. And did you ever try to find his relatives? asked the shopman. Well, no, I can't say as we did exactly, answered old Bill. Cause you see, we didn't rightly know how to set to work at the job. The ship as he was took off of was a passenger ship, the Lightning of London, and as I have said afore, he was the only one saved. There were nobody else as we could ax any questions of, and, the ship hailing from London, there was no telling where his friends might have come from. There was R.L. marked on his little clothes, and that was all. So we was obliged to content ourselves with having that fact tacked on to the yarn of the rack in all the papers, in the hope that some of his friends or relations might get to see it. But, bless your heart, we ain't heard nothing from nobody about him, never a word, so I just adopted him, as the saying is, and called him Robert Ledgerton, arter old shipmate of mine that's been drowned this many a year, poor chap. 
"'And how long is it since the wreck happened?' inquired the shopman. "'Well, let me see,' said old Bill. "'Blessed if I can rightly tell,' he continued, after a moment or two of reflection. "'I've got it wrote down in the family Bible at home, but I can't just rightly recollect at this moment. "'It's somewheres about fourteen or fifteen years ago this winter, though.' Fourteen year next month,' spoke up another of the company, decidedly. "'It was the same gale as my poor brother Joe was drowned in.' "'Right you are, Tom,' returned Bill. "'I remember it was that same gale now, and that's fourteen year agone. "'And the women as took charge of poor little Bob when we brought him ashore "'reckoned as he was about two year old or thereaway. "'They told his age by his teeth. "'Same as you would tell a horse's age, you know, mister.' "'Aye, that was a terrible winter for Rex, that was,' remarked Jack Willis, a fine, stalwart young fellow of some five-and-twenty. "'It was my first year at sea. I'd been bound apprentice to the skipper of a collier brig called the Nancy, sailing out of Harwich. The skipper's name was Daniel. Long Tom Dennell, they used to call him, because of his size. He was so tall that he couldn't stand upright in his cabin, and he'd been going to sea for so many years that he'd got to be regular round-shouldered.' I don't believe that man ever knowed what it was to be ill in his life. He used to be awful proud of his good health, poor chap. He's dead now. Drowned. Jumped overboard in a gale of wind at her a man as fell off the foretopsail yard while they was reefing. And, good swimmer as he was, they was both lost. Now, he was a swimmer, if you like. You talk about young Bob being a good swimmer, but I'm blessed if I think he could hold a candle to this here long Tom Dannel as I'm talking about. Why, I recollect once when we was lying windbound in Yarmouth Roads. At this point, the narrator was interrupted by the sudden opening of the door and the hurried entry of a tall and somewhat slender, fair-haired lad, clad in oilskin jumper, leggings, and sou'wester hat, which glistened in the gaslight. While, as he stood in the doorway for a moment, dazzled by the abrupt transition from darkness to light, the water trickled off him and speedily formed a little pool at his feet on the well-sanded floor. This newcomer was Bob Ledgerton, the hero of my story. "'Well, Bob, what's the news?' was the general exclamation, as the assembled party rose with one accord to their feet. "'Rockets going up from the middle in the gun fleet,' panted the lad, as he wiped the moisture from his eyes with the back of his hand. "'All right,' responded old Bill, then drawing himself up to his full height, and casting a scrutinizing glance round the room, he exclaimed, "'Now, mates,' How many of you is ready to go out? Why, all of us, in course, Dad, replied Jack Willis. T'was mostly an expectation of being wanted that we come down here tonight, and we've all got our oilskins, so you've only got to pick your crew and let's be off. A general murmur of assent followed this speech, and the men forthwith ranged themselves along the sides of the room so as to give Bill a clear view of each individual and facilitate a rapid choice. Then I'll take you, Jack, and you, Dick, and you, and you, and you, quickly selecting a strong crew of the stoutest and most resolute men in the party. The chosen ones lost no time in donning their oilskin garments, a task in which they were cheerfully assisted by the others, and while they were so engaged, the hostess issued from the bar with tumblers of smoking hot grog, one of which she handed to each of the adventurers, saying, There, boys, drink that off before you go out into the cold and the wet. It'll do none of you any harm, I'm sure, on a night like this, and on such an errand as yours. And you, Bill, if you save anybody and decide to bring them into Brightlingsea, send up a signal rocket as soon as you think we can see it over the land, and I'll have hot water and blankets all ready for the poor souls against they come ashore. Aye, aye, mother, I will, replied old Bill. Only hope we may be lucky enough to get out to em in time. The wind's dead in our teeth all the way. Now, lads, if you're all ready, let's be off. Thank you, mother, for the grog. The men filed out, Bill leading, and took their way down to the beach, a very few yards distant, the dim flickering light of a lantern being exhibited from the water's side for a moment as they issued into the open air. There's Bob waiting with the boat. What a chap he is, ejaculated one of the men, as the light was seen. I say, Bill, you won't take Bob, will you, on an errand like this here? Oh, I responded Bill. He'll want to go, and I promised him he should next time as we was called out. He's a fine, handy lad, and old enough to take care of himself by this time. Besides, it's time he began to take his share of the rough work. 
Reaching the water's edge, they found Bob standing there with the painter of a boat in his hand, the boat itself being partially grounded on the beach. They quickly tumbled in over the gunwale. Bob then placed his shoulder against the stem head, and with a powerful shove, drove the boat stern foremost into the stream, springing in over the bows and stowing himself away in the eyes of the boat as she floated. It appeared intensely dark outside when the members of the expedition first issued from the hospitable portal of the anchor, but there was a moon, although she was completely hidden by the dense canopy of fast-flying clouds which overspread the heavens, and the faint light which struggled through this thick veil of vapor soon revealed a small fleet of fishing smacks at anchor in the middle of the creek. Toward one of these craft the boat was headed, and in a very few minutes the party were scrambling over the low bulwarks of the Seamew, Bill Maskell's property, and the pride of the port. The boat was at once dragged in on deck and secured, and then, without hurry or confusion of any kind, but in an incredibly short time, the smack was unmoored and got under way, a faint cheer from the shore following her as she wound her way down the creek between the other craft and, hauling close to the wind, headed toward the open sea. In a very few minutes the gallant little Seamew had passed clear of the low point upon which stands the Martello Tower, which had been Bob's place of lookout, and then she felt the full fury of the gale and the full strength of the raging sea. Even under the mere shred of sail, a balance-reefed mainsail and storm-jib, which she dared to show, the little vessel was buried to her gunwale, while the sea poured in a continuous cataract over her bows, across her deck, and out again to leeward, rendering it necessary for the crew to crouch low on the deck to windward, under the partial shelter of her low bulwarks, and to lash themselves there. It was indeed a terrible night. The thermometer registered only a degree or two above freezing point, and the howling blast, loaded with spindrift and scud water, seemed to pierce the adventurers to their very marrow, while, notwithstanding the care with which they were wrapped up, the continuous pouring of the sea over them soon wet them to the skin. But the serious discomfort to which they had voluntarily exposed themselves, so far from damping their ardor, only increased it. As the veteran Bill, standing there at the tiller, exposed to the full fury of the tempest, with the tiller ropes pulling and jerking at his hands until they threatened to cut to the bone, felt his wet clothing clinging to his skin, and his sea boots gradually filling with water, he pictured to himself a group of poor, terror-stricken wretches clinging despairingly to the shattered wreck out there upon the cruel sands, with the merciless sea tugging at them fiercely, and the wind chilling the blood within their veins until, perchance, their benumbed limbs growing powerless, their hold would relax, and they would be swept away. And as the dismal scene rose before his mental vision, he tautened up the tiller ropes a trifle, the smack's head fell off perhaps half a point, and the wind striking more fully upon the straining canvas, she went surging out to seaward like a startled steed, her hull half buried in a whirling chaos of flying foam. Old Bill, the leader of this desperate expedition, was a fisherman in winter and a yachtsman in summer, as indeed were most of the crew of the Seamew on this eventful night. Many a hard-fought match had Bill sailed in, and more than one flying fifty had he proudly steered, a winner past the flagship, but his companions agreed, as they crouched shivering under the bulwarks, that he never handled a craft better or more boldly than he did the seamew on that night. One good stretch to the eastward, until the middle light bore well upon their weather quarter, and the helm was put down. The smack tacked handsomely, though she shipped the sea and filled her deck to the gunwale in the operation, and then away she rushed on the other tack, with the light bearing well upon the lee bow. In less than an hour from the time of starting, the light ship was reached, and as the smack, luffing into the wind, shaved close under the vessel's stern with all her canvas a shiver, Bill's stentorian voice pealed out, "'Middle, ahoy! Where away's the rack? About a mile and a half to the nord, on the weather side of the gun fleet. Fancy she must have broke up. Can't make her out now. Wish you good luck,' was the reply. "'Thank ye,' roared back Bill." Ease up main and jib sheets, boys, and stand clear for a jibe. Round swept the little seamew, and in another moment, with the wind on her starboard quarter, she was darting almost with the speed of her namesake along the weather edge of the shoal, upon her errand of mercy. All eyes were now keenly directed ahead and on the lee bow, anxiously watching for some indication of the whereabouts of the wreck. 
and in a few minutes the welcome cry was simultaneously raised by three or four of the watchers. There she is! Aye, there she is, sure enough, responded old Bill, from his post at the tiller. He, having, like the rest, caught a momentary glimpse under the foot of the mainsail of a shapeless object, which had revealed itself for a single instant in the midst of the whirl of boiling breakers, only to be lost sight of again as the leaping waves hurled themselves once more furiously down upon their helpless prey. As the smack rapidly approached the scene of the disaster, the wreck was made out to be that of a large ship, with only the stump of her main mast standing. She was already fast settling down in the sand, the fore part of the hull being completely submerged, while the sea swept incessantly over the stern, which, with its full poop, formed the sole refuge of the hapless crew. "'Now, boys,' remarked old Bill, when they had approached closely enough to perceive the desperate situation of those on the wreck. "'Now, boys, whatever we're going to do has got to be done smart. The tide's rising fast, and in another hour there won't be enough of yon ship left to light a fire with. "'Are you all ready with the anchor?' "'Aye, aye, all ready,' was the prompt response. The helm was put down, and the smack plunged round head to wind, her sails flapping furiously as the wind was spilled out of them. There was no need for orders. The men all knew exactly what to do, and did it precisely at the right moment. Jib and mainsail were hauled down and secured in less time than it takes to describe it, and then, as the little vessel lost her way, the heavy anchor, carried expressly for occasions like the present, was let go and the cable veered cautiously out so that the full strain might not be brought to bear upon it too suddenly. Old Bill, meanwhile, stood aft by the taffrail with the lead line in his hand, anxiously noting the shoaling water as the smack drifted sternward toward the wreck. "'Hold on forward!' he shouted at last, when the little seamew had driven so far in upon the sand that there was little more than a foot of water beneath her keel when she sank into the trough of the sea. "'Now lay aft here, all hands!' and let's see if we can get a rope aboard of them. The smack was now fairly among the breakers, which came thundering down upon the shoal with indescribable fury, boiling and foaming and tumbling round the little vessel in a perfect chaos of confusion, and falling on board her in such vast volumes that had everything not been securely battened down beforehand, she must inevitably have been swamped in a few minutes. As for her crew, every man of them worked with the end of a line firmly lashed round his waist, so that in the extremely likely event of his being washed overboard, his comrades might have the means of hauling him on board again. Nor were these the only dangers to which the adventurers were exposed. There was the possibility that the cable, stout as it was, might part at any moment, and in such a case their fate would be sealed, for nothing could then prevent the smack from being dashed to pieces on the sands. Yet all these dangers were cheerfully faced by these men from a pure desire to serve their fellow creatures, and without the slightest hope of reward, for they knew at the very outset that there would not be much hope of salvage, with a vessel on the sands in such a terrible gale. The wreck was now directly astern of the smack, and only about one hundred feet distant, so that she could be distinctly seen, as it fortunately happened, that the sky had been steadily clearing for the last quarter of an hour, allowing the moon to peep out unobscured now and then through an occasional break in the clouds. By the increasing light, the smack's crew were not only enabled to note the exact position of the wreck, but they could also see that a considerable number of people were clustered upon the poop of the half-submerged hull, some of them being women and children. The poor souls were all watching, with the most intense anxiety, the movements of those on board the smack, and if anything had been needed to stimulate the exertions of her crew, it would have been abundantly found in the sight of those poor helpless mothers and their little ones, clinging there to the shattered wreck in the bitter winter midnight, exposed to the full fury of the pitiless storm. A light heaving line was quickly cleared away, and one end bent to a rope becket securely spliced to a small keg, which was then thrown overboard and allowed to drift down toward the wreck, the line being veered freely away at the same time. The crew of the wreck, anxiously watching the motions of those on board the smack, at once comprehended the object of this maneuver, and as the keg drifted down toward them, made ready to secure it. But the set of the tide, the wash of the sea, or some other unexplained circumstance, caused it to deviate so far from its intended course that it passed at a considerable distance astern of the wreck, notwithstanding the utmost endeavors of those on board to secure it, in consequence of which it had to be hauled on board the smack again, and thus valuable time was lost. The smack's helm was at once shifted, 
and the tide, aided by the wind, gave her so strong a shear in the required direction that it was hoped a repetition of the mischance would be impossible. The keg was again thrown overboard. The line once more veered away. Buoyantly it drifted down toward the wreck, now buried in the hissing foam crest of a mighty breaker, and anon riding lightly in the liquid valley behind it. All eyes were intently fixed upon it, impatiently watching its slow and somewhat erratic movements. When the smack seemed to leap suddenly skyward, rearing up like a startled courser, and heeling violently over on her beam's end at the same moment, there was a terrific thud forward, accompanied by a violent crashing sound, and the seamew's crew had barely time to grasp the cleat or belaying pin nearest at hand when a foaming deluge of water hissed and swirled past and over them. The breaker of which it formed a part, sweeping from under the smack down toward the wreck in an unbroken wall of green water, capped with a white and ominously curling crest. The roller broke just as it reached the wreck, expending its full force upon her already shattered hull. The black mass was seen to heel almost completely over in the midst of the wildly tossing foam. There was a dull report, almost like that of a gun, a piercing shriek which rose clearly above the howling of the gale and the babble of the maddened waters. And when the wreck again became visible, it was seen that she had broken in two amidships, the bow lying bottom upward some sixty feet farther in upon the sand, while the stern, which retained its former position, had been robbed of nearly half its living freight. And to make matters worse, the floating keg had once more missed its mark. This repeated failure was disheartening. The tide was rising rapidly. Every minute was worth a human life, and it began to look as though, in spite of all effort, the poor souls clinging to the wreck would be swept into eternity before the seamew's crew could effect a communication with them. "'Let's have one more try, boys,' exhorted old Bill. "'And if we misses her this time, we shall have to shift our ground and trust to our own anchor and chain to hold us until we can get them off.' Risky work that would be, as each man there told himself but none thought of expressing such a sentiment aloud, preferring to take the risk rather than abandon those poor souls to their fate. The line and keg were rapidly hauled on board the smack once more, and Bill was standing aft by the taffrail watching for a favorable moment at which to make another cast, when Bob exclaimed excitedly, "'Vast heaven, father! Tain't no use trying that dodge any more. We're too far to leeward. Cast off the line and take a turn with it round my waist. I'm going to try to swim it. I know I can do it, Dad, and it's the only way we, as we can do any good. The old man stared aghast at the lad for a moment. Then he glanced at the mad swirl of broken water astern, then back once more to Bob, who, in the meantime, was rapidly divesting himself of his clothing. God bless you, boy, for the thought, he at length ejaculated. God bless you, but it ain't possible. Even if the water was warm, the breaking seas would smother you. But bitter cold as it is, you wouldn't swim a dozen yards. No, no, Bob, my lad. Put on your duds again. We must try summat else. But Bob had by this time disencumbered himself of everything save a woolen undershirt and drawers, and now instead of doing his adopted father's bidding, he rapidly cast off the line from the keg, and making a bowline in the end, passed it over one shoulder and underneath the other arm. The next instant he had poised himself lightly upon the taffrail of the wildly tossing smack, and a mighty breaker sweeping by, with comparatively smooth water behind it, without a moment's hesitation thence plunged head foremost into the icy sea. The broken water leaped and tossed wildly, as if in exultation over the spout where the brave lad had disappeared, while all hands, both those on board the smack and the people on the wreck, waited breathlessly for his reappearance on the surface. An endless time it seemed to all, and but for the rapid passage of the thin light line out over the smack's taffrail, indicating that Bob was swimming swiftly under water. Old Bill Maskell would have dreaded some dreadful mishap to his protege, but at last a small round dark object appeared in bold relief in the midst of a sheet of foam, which gleamed dazzling white in the clear cold light of the moon. It was Bob's head. There he is, was the exultant exclamation of every one of the smack's crew, and then they sent forth upon the wings of the gale a ringing cheer, in which those upon the wreck faintly joined. "'Now, boys,' exclaimed old Bill, "'clear away this here line behind me, some of you, "'and look out another nice light handy one "'to bend on to it in case we wants it.' "'The old man himself stood on the taffrail, "'paying out the line and attentively watching "'every heave of the plunging smack, "'so that Bob might not be checked "'in the smallest degree in his perilous passage, 
nor, on the other hand, be hampered by having a superabundance of line paid out behind him for the tide to act upon and drag him away to leeward. The distance from the smack to the wreck was but short, a mere hundred feet or so, but with the heavy surf to contend against and the line sagging and swaying in the sea behind him, it taxed Bob's energies to their utmost limit to make any progress at all. Indeed, it appeared to him that instead of progressing, he was, like the keg, drifting helplessly to leeward with the tide. The cold water, too, chilled him to the very marrow and seemed to completely paralyze his energies, while the relentless surf foamed over his head almost without intermission, so that he had the utmost difficulty in getting his breath. Nevertheless, he fought gallantly on until, after what seemed to be an eternity of frightful exertion, he reached the side of the wreck and grasped the rope which its occupants flung to him. He was too completely exhausted, however, to mount the side at that moment, and while he clung to the rope, regaining his breath and his strength, a mighty roller came sweeping down upon the sands, burying the smack for the moment as it rushed past her, and then surging forward with upreared threatening crest toward the wreck. There was a warning cry from those on board the wreck as they saw this terrible wall of water rushing down upon them, and each seized with desperate grip whatever came nearest to hand, clinging thereto with the tenacity of despair. Bob heard the cry, saw the danger, and had just time to struggle clear of the wreck and pass under her stern when the breaker burst upon them. Blinded, stunned, and breathless, he felt himself whirled helplessly hither and thither, while a load like that of a mountain seemed to rest upon him and press him down. At last he emerged again, considerably to leeward of the wreck, but with the rope which they had thrown him still in his hands. As he gasped for breath and shook the salt water out of his eyes, something swayed against him beneath the surface, something which he knew instantly must be a human body. In a second he had it in his grasp and, dragging it above water, found it to be the body of a child, apparently about two years old. At the same moment a powerful strain came upon the line which he held in his hand, and he had only time to take, by a rapid movement, two or three turns of it round his arm when those on the wreck began to haul him on board. In less time than it takes to tell it, he was dragged inboard and lay panting and exhausted upon the steeply inclined deck of the wreck where the curious crowd of haggard-eyed anxious men and women gathered round him. A man dressed in a fine white linen shirt and blue serge trousers, he was the master of the ship and had given his remaining garments to shield the poor shivering frightened children, was in the act of kneeling down by Bob's side, apparently intending to question him, when a piercing shriek was heard and a woman darted forward with the cry, "'My child! My child!' and seized the body, which Bob had brought on board and still held in his arms. This incident created a diversion, and Bob speedily recovering the use of his faculties and rapidly explaining the intentions of those on board the smack, a strong hawser was soon stretched from the seamew to the wreck, a bosun's chair slung there too, and the transport of the shipwrecked crew and passengers at once commenced. The journey, though short, was fraught with the utmost peril. For it being impossible to keep the hawser strain taut, the poor unfortunate wretches had to be dragged through rather than over the surf, and when all was ready the women, who were of course to go first, found their courage fail them. In vain were they remonstrated with. In vain were they reminded that every second as it flew bore mayhap a human life into eternity with it. The sight of the wild surf into which the hawser momentarily plunged completely unnerved them, and they one and all declared that, rather than face the terrible risk, they would die where they were. At last Bob, who knew as well as, if not better than, anyone on board the importance of celerity, whispered a word or two in the captain's ear. The latter nodded approvingly, and Bob at once got into the chair, some of the ship's crew rapidly but securely lashing him there, in obedience to the captain's order. When all was ready, the skipper, approaching the terrified group of women, took one of their children tenderly in his arms, and before the unhappy mother could realize what was about to take place, handed it to Bob. The signal was instantly given to those on board the smack, who hauled swiftly upon the hauling line. Bob went swaying off the gunwale with his precious charge and circled safely in his arms, and in another moment was buried in a mountain of broken water which rushed foaming past, only to reappear instantly afterwards, however, and in the very brief space of time he and his charge had safely reached the smack. The little one was handed over to the rough but tender-hearted fisherman, but Bob, seeing that he could be useful there, at once returned to the wreck. There was now no further difficulty with the women. The mother whose child had already made the adventurous passage was frantic to rejoin her baby, 
and eagerly placed herself in the chair as soon as Bob vacated it. She, too, accomplished the journey in safety, and then the others, taking courage once more from her example, quietly took their turn, some carrying their children with them, while others preferred to confide their darlings to Bob or to one of the seamen for the dreadful passage through the wintry sea. The women once safe, the men made short work of it, and in a little over two hours, twenty-five souls, the survivors of a company of passengers and crew numbering in all forty-two, were safely transferred to the Seamew, which, slipping her cable, at once bore away with her precious freight for Brightling Sea. End of chapter one. Chapter two of The Pirate Island, A Story of the South Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 2. The Betsy Jane Once fairly out of the breakers, the fishermen, at great risk to their little craft, opened the companion leading down into the sea mew's tiny after-cabin, and the poor souls from the wreck were conveyed below, out of the reach of the bitter blast and the incessant showers of icy spray. Bob and two or three others of the smack's crew also went below and busied themselves in lighting a fire, routing out such blankets and wraps of various kinds as happened to be on board, and in other ways doing what they could to ameliorate the deplorable condition of their guests. Fortunately, the wind, dead against them on the way out, was fair for the homeward run, and the seamew rushed through the water at a rate which caused Dicky Bird to exclaim, Blessed if the little huzzy don't seem to know as they poor innocent babbies' lives depends on their getting into Mother Salmon's hands and atween her hot blankets within the next hour. Just see how she's smoking through it. Very soon the middle lightship was reached, and as the smack swept past, old Bill shouted to the lightkeepers the joyful news of the rescue. A few minutes afterwards, three rockets were sent up at short intervals from the smack as an intimation to Mother Salmon that her good services were required and in due time the gallant little smack found her way back to her moorings in the creek. The anchor was scarcely let go when three or four boats dashed alongside, and, "'Well, Bill, old man, what luck?' was the general question. Five and twenty, thank God. Men, women, and children,' responded old Bill. "'Did you catch sight of our rockets, boys?' "'Ay, ay, never fear, and mother ashore there. She's never turned in at all this blessed night.' said as she was sure you'd bring somebody in, and a rare rousin' fire she's got roaring up the chimbley, and blankets no end, all the beds made up and warmed, and everything ready, down to a rattlin' good hot supper. So let's have these poor souls up on deck. You've got em below, I suppose, and get em ashore. They must be pretty nigh froze to death, I should think. At Bill's cheery summons, the survivors from the wreck staggered to the smack's deck, their cramped and frozen limbs scarcely able to sustain them, and the bewildered glances which they cast round them at the scarcely ruffled waters of the creek glancing in the clear frosty moonlight, with the fishing smacks and other small craft riding cosily at anchor on either side, the straggling village of Brightlingsea within a stone's throw, a tiny light still twinkling here and there in the cottage windows, and a perfect blaze of ruddy light streaming from the windows of the anchor and flooding the road with its cheerful radiance. The bewildered glances with which they regarded this scene, I say, showed that even now they were scarcely able to realize the fact of their deliverance. But they were not left long in doubt about it. As they emerged with slow and painful steps from the smack's tiny companion, strong arms seized them, all enwrapped in blankets as they were, and quickly but tenderly passed them over the side into the small boats, which had come off from the shore for them. Then, as each boat received its complement, shove off! was the word. The bending oars churned the water into miniature whirlpools, and with a dozen powerful strokes the boat was sent half her length high and dry upon the shore. Then strong arms once more raised the sufferers, and quickly bore them within the wide open portal of the hospitable anchor, where Mother Salmon waited to receive them. "'Eh, goodness sakes alive!' she exclaimed, as the first man appeared within the flood of light which streamed from the anchor windows. "'You, Sam, you don't mean to say as there's women amongst them. "'Ah, that there is, mother,' panted Sam, "'and children, poor little helpless babbies, some on em too.' The quick warm tears of womanly sympathy instantly flashed into the worthy woman's eyes, but she was not one prone to much indulgence in sentiment, particularly at a time like the present, so instead of lifting up her hands and giving expression to her pity in words, 
she faced sharply round upon the maids who were crowding forward, with the curiosity of their sex, to catch a first glimpse of the strangers, and exclaimed, "'Now then, you idle huzzies, what do you mean by blocking up the passage so that a body can get neither in nor out? Do you want these poor souls to be quite froze to death before you lets them in? You, Emily, be off to number four and run the warming pan through the bed, and give the fire a good stir. Emma, do wake up, child, and take a couple of buckets of hot water up to number four and put them in the bath. Run, Mary Jane, for your life, and see if the fire in number seven is burning properly. And you, Susan, be off and turn down all the beds." The maids rushed off to their several duties like startled deer, while the mistress turned to Sam and directed him to convey his burden to number four, herself leading the way. A number of women, the mothers and wives of the fishermen, had gathered at the anchor as soon as it was known that the smack had gone out to a wreck, in order that they might be at hand to render any assistance which might be required. They were all collected in the bar parlor, and two of them now rose, in obedience to Mother Salmon's summons, and following her upstairs, took over from Sam their patient, and, shutting the door, lost not a moment in applying such restoratives and adopting such measures as their experience taught them would be most likely to prove beneficial. The rest of the survivors speedily followed, the women and children being promptly conveyed to the rooms already prepared for them, but the men, for their most part, proved to be very little the worse for their exposure, seeming to need for their restoration a good hot supper more than anything else. And this contingency also having by Mother Salmon's experience and foresight been provided for, the rescued and their rescuers were soon seated together at the same table busily engaged in the endeavor to restore their exhausted energies. One man only of the entire party seemed unable to do justice to the meal spread before him, and this was the master of the wrecked ship. He seated himself indeed at the table and made an effort to eat and drink, but his thoughts were evidently elsewhere. He could not settle comfortably down to his meal, but kept gliding softly out of the room to glide as softly back again after an absence of a few minutes, when he would abstractedly swallow a mouthful or two and then glide out once more. At length, after a somewhat longer absence than before, he returned to the room in which the meal was being discussed, the look of care and anxiety on his face replaced by an expression of almost overwhelming joy, and, walking up to Bob, somewhat astonished that individual by exclaiming, "'Young man, let me without further delay tender you and your brave comrades my most hearty thanks for the rescue of my passengers, my crew, and myself from a situation of deadly peril, a rescue which was only effected at very great hazard to yourselves, and which was successfully accomplished mainly, I am sure your comrades will join me in saying, through your indomitable courage and perseverance. The debt which I owe you is one that it will be quite impossible for me ever to repay.' I can merely acknowledge it and testify to the overwhelming nature of my obligation. For to your gallant behavior under God, I owe not only the deliverance of twenty-five human lives from a watery grave, but also the safety of my wife and only child. All, in fact, that I have left to me to make life worth living. As I have said, it will be quite impossible for me ever to cancel so heavy a debt. But what I can do, I will. Your conduct shall be so represented in the proper quarter as to secure for you all the honor which such noble service demands. And, for the rest, I hope you will always remember that Captain Staunton, that is my name, will deem no service that you may require of him too great to be promptly rendered. And what I say to you especially, I say also to all your gallant comrades who will, I hope, accept the grateful thanks which I now tender to them. Poor Bob blushed like a girl at these warm outspoken praises, and stammered some deprecatory remarks, which, however, were drowned by the more vigorous disclaimers of the rest of the fishermen and their somewhat noisy applause of the shipwrecked captain's manly speech, in the midst of which commotion Mother Salmon entered to enjoin strict silence and to announce the gratifying intelligence that all the women and children were doing well, including the skipper's little daughter, the apparently lifeless body of whom Bob had recovered when he first boarded the wreck. A low murmur of satisfaction greeted this announcement, and then all hands fell to once more upon their supper, which was soon afterwards concluded, when old Bill and his mates, shaking hands heartily all round, retired to seek the rest which they had so well earned, while the shipwrecked men were disposed of as well as circumstances would allow in the few remaining unappropriated bedrooms of the hospitable anchor. 
By noon next day, the shipwrecked party had all so far recovered that they were able to set out on the journey to their several homes. Captain Staunton sought out old Bill and arranged with him respecting the salvage of the wrecked ship's cargo, after which he handed the veteran fisherman, as remuneration for services already rendered, a draft upon the owners of the diadem, which more than satisfied the smack's crew for all their perils and exertions of the previous night. He then left for London to perform the unpleasant duty of reporting to his owners the loss of their ship, mentioning, before he left, the probability of his speedy return to personally superintend the salvage operations. In bidding adieu to Bob, who happened to be present while the final arrangements with old Bill were being made, Captain Staunton remarked to him, "'I have been thinking a great deal about you, my lad. You are a fine, gallant young fellow, and it seems to me it would be a very great pity for you to waste your life in pursuit of the arduous and unprofitable occupation of fishing. What say you? Would you like to take to the sea as a profession?' If so, let me know. I owe you a very heavy debt, as I have already said, and nothing would afford me greater pleasure than to repay you, as far as possible, by personally undertaking your training, and afterwards using what little interest I possess to advance you in your career. Think the matter over, and consult with your father upon it. He was not then aware of poor Bob's peculiar position. And let me know your decision when I return. Now, once more, good-bye for the present." The weather having moderated by the next day, the Seamew's crew commenced salvage operations at the wreck, and for more than a week all hands were so busy, early and late, that Bob had literally no time to think about, much less to consult with old Bob respecting Captain Staunton's proposal. On the third day the chief mate of the diadem appeared at Brightlingsea, having been sent down by the owners to superintend the work at the wreck. He announced that he had been sent instead of Captain Staunton, in consequence of the appointment of the latter by his owners, to the command of a fine new ship then loading in the London docks for Australia. It appeared that Captain Staunton stood so high in the estimation of his employers, and possessed such a thoroughly established reputation for skill and sobriety that, notwithstanding his recent misfortune, there had been no hesitation about employing him again. A few days later, a letter came from the captain himself to Bob confirming this intelligence, and stating that he had then a vacancy for his young friend if he chose to fill it. Bob, however, as has already been remarked, was at the time too busy to give the matter proper consideration, so he wrote back saying as much, and hinting that perhaps on the return of the ship to England he might be glad to have a repetition of the offer. To this letter a reply soon came, announcing the immediate departure of the ship, and containing a specific offer to receive Bob on board in the capacity of apprentice on her next voyage. The idea of taking to the sea as a profession was so thoroughly novel to Bob that he had at first some little difficulty in realizing all that it meant. Hitherto he had had no other intention or ambition than to potter about in a fishing smack with old Bill, living a hard life, earning a precarious subsistence, and possibly, if exceptionally fortunate, at some period in the far distant future, attaining to the ownership of a smack himself. But a month or two later on, when all had been saved that was it was possible to save from the wreck, and when nothing remained of the once fine ship but a few shattered timbers embedded in the sand, and showing at low water like the fragment of a skeleton of some leviathan, when Bob found time to fully discuss the matter with old Bill Maskell and his mates, these worthies painted the advantages of a regular seaman's life over those of the mere fishermen in such glowing colors, and dwelt so enthusiastically upon the prospects which would surely open out before our hero under the patronage of a man like Captain Staunton that Bob soon made up his mind to accept the captain's offer and join him on his return to England. Having once come to this decision, the lad was all impatience for the time to arrive when he might embark upon his career. As it is with most lads, so it was with him. The prospect of a complete change in his mode of life was full of pleasurable excitement, and perhaps it was only natural that, now he had decided to forsake it, the monotonous humdrum fisher's life became almost unbearably irksome to him, Old Bill Maskell was not slow to observe this, and with the unselfishness which is so eminently characteristic of him, though he loved the lad as his own soul, he decided to shorten for him, as far as possible, the weary time of waiting, and send him away at once. Accordingly, on the first opportunity that presented itself, he remarked to Bob, I say, boy, I've been turning matters over in my mind a bit, and it seems to me as a voyage or two in a coaster do you a power of good, afore you ships aboard a South Spainer, 
you're as handy a lad as a man need wish to be shipmates with, aboard a fore and aft rigged craft. But you ought to know summat about square rigged vessels, too, afore you sail foreign. Now, what do you say to a trip or two in a collier brig? Just to learn the ropes like, eh? Note, South Spainer, a term frequently employed by seamen to designate a foreign going ship, especially one sailing to southern waters. Life on board a collier is not, as a rule, a condition of unalloyed felicity, but Bob was happily, or unhappily, ignorant of this. The suggestion conveyed to his mind only the idea of change, and his face lighted joyfully up at his benefactor's proposition, to which he at once eagerly assented. Bob's slender wardrobe was accordingly at once overhauled and put into a condition of thorough repair, Bill, meantime, employing himself laboriously in an effort to ascertain through the medium of a voluminous correspondence, the whereabouts of an old friend of his, last heard of by the said Bill as in command of a collier brig, with a view to the securing for Bob a berth as ordinary seaman under a skipper of whom Bill knew something, and who could be trusted to treat the lad well. Old Bill's labors were at length rewarded with success, Captain, as he loved to be styled, Turnbull's address in London being definitely ascertained, together with the gratifying intelligence that he still retained the command of the Betsy Jane. Matters having progressed thus far satisfactorily, Old Bill's next business was to write to Captain Turnbull, asking him if he could receive Bob on board, and in about a month's time a favorable answer was received, naming a day upon which Bob was to run up to London and sign articles. Bob's departure from Brightlingsea was regarded by his numerous friends in the village quite in the light of an event. And when the morning came, and with it the market cart which was to convey him and his belongings, together with old Bill, to Colchester, where they were to take train to London, nearly all the fishermen in the place, to say nothing of their wives and little ones, turned out to say farewell. The journey was accomplished in safety and without adventure, and shortly after noon Bill and Bob found themselves threading their way through the narrow crowded streets to the captain's address, somewhere in the neighborhood of Wapping. On reaching the house, the gallant skipper was found to be at home, in the act of partaking, together with his wife and family, of the midday meal, which on that occasion happened to be composed of pickled pork and taters. Old Bill and Bob were gruffly but cordially invited to join the family circle, which they did, Bob making a thoroughly hearty meal, quite unmoved by the coquettish endeavors of Miss Turnbull, a stout, good-tempered, but not particularly beautiful damsel of some seventeen summers, to attract the attention and excite the admiration of Pa's handsome new sailor. Captain Turnbull proved to be a very stout but not very tall man, with a somewhat vacant expression of feature, and a singular habit of looking fixedly and in apparent amazement for a full minute at anyone who happened to address him. These, with a slow, ponderous movement of body, a fixed belief in his own infallibility, and an equally firm belief in the unsurpassed perfections of the Betsy Jane, were his chief characteristics and as he is destined to figure for a very brief period only in the pages of the present history, we need not analyze him any further. After dinner had been duly discussed, together with a glass of grog, so far at least as the captain, his wife, and old Bill were concerned, our two friends were invited by the proud commander to pay a visit of inspection to the Betsy Jane. That venerable craft proved to be lying in the stream, the outside vessel of a number of similar craft moored in a tier, head and stern to great slimy buoys, laid down as permanent moorings in the river. A wherry was engaged by the skipper for which old Bill paid when the time of settlement arrived, the captain being apparently unconscious of the fact that payment was necessary, and the three proceeded on board. The brig turned out to be about as bad a specimen of her class as could be met with, old, rotten, leaky, and dirty beyond all power of description. Nevertheless, her skipper waxed so astonishingly eloquent when he began to speak her praises that the idea never seemed to occur to either Bill or Bob that to venture to see in her would be simply tempting providence, and it was consequently soon arranged that our hero was to sign articles, nominally as an ordinary seaman, but, in consideration of his ignorance of square-rigged craft, to receive only the pay of a boy. This point being settled, the party returned to the shore, old Bill and Bob going for a saunter through some of the principal streets, to enjoy the cheap but rare luxury, to simple country people like themselves, of a look into the shop windows, with the understanding that they were to accept the hospitality of the Turnbull Mansion until the time for sailing should arrive on the morrow. Bob wished very much to visit one of the theaters that evening, 
a theater being a place of entertainment which up to that time he had never had an opportunity of entering. But old Bill, anxious to cultivate on Bob's behalf the good will of the Betsy Jane's commander, thought it would be wiser to spend the evening with that worthy. This arrangement was accordingly carried out, the best parlor being thrown open by Mrs. Turnbull for the occasion. Miss Turnbull and Miss Jemima Turnbull contributed in turn their share toward the evening's entertainment by singing Hearts of Oak, The Bay of Biscay, Then Farewell My Trim Built Wary, and other songs of a similar character, to a somewhat uncertain accompaniment upon a discordant jangling old piano, the chief merit of which was that a large proportion of its notes were dumb. Their gallant father, meanwhile, sipped his grog and puffed away at his churchwarden in a high-backed, uncomfortable-looking chair in a corner near the fire, utterly sunk, apparently, in a fit of the most profound abstraction from which he would occasionally start without the slightest warning, and in a most alarming manner, to bellow out, generally at the wrong time and to the wrong tune, something which his guests were expected to regard as a chorus. The chorus ended, he would again sink like a stone, as abruptly back into his inner consciousness as he had emerged from it. So passed the evening without the slightest pretense at conversation, though both Bill and Bob made several determined efforts to start a topic, and so as music, even of the kind performed by the Mrs. Turnbull, Paul's after a time, about 11 p.m., old Bill hinted at fatigue from the unusual exertions of the day, proposed retirement, and, with Bob, was shown to the room wherein was located the shakedown offered them by the hospitable skipper. The shakedown proved to be in reality two fair-sized beds, which would have been very comfortable had they been much cleaner than they were, and our two friends enjoyed a very fair night's rest. Bob duly signed articles on the following morning, and then, in company with his shipmates, proceeded on board the Betsy Jane. Captain Turnbull put in an appearance about an hour afterwards when the order was given to unmoor ship, and the brig began to drop down the river with the tide. Toward evening a fine fair wind sprang up, and the Betsy Jane, being only in ballast, then began to travel at a rate which threw her commander into an indescribable state of ecstasy. The voyage was accomplished without the occurrence of any incident worth recording, and in something like a week from the date of sailing from London, Bob found himself at Shields, with the brig under a coal drop, loading again for the Thames. Some half a dozen similarly uneventful voyages to the Tyne and back to London were made by Bob and the Betsy Jane. The life of a seaman on board a collier is usually of a very monotonous character, without a single attractive feature in it unless, maybe, that it admits of frequent short sojourns at home, and Bob's period of service under Captain Turnbull might have been dismissed with the mere mention of the circumstance, but for the incident which terminated that service. It occurred on the sixth voyage which Bob had made in the Betsy Jane. The brig had sailed from the Tyne, loaded with coals for London as usual, with a westerly wind which, however, shortly afterwards backed to south-southwest, with a rapidly falling barometer. The appearance of the weather grew very threatening, which, coupled with the facts that the craft was old, weak, and a notoriously poor sailor with the wind anywhere but on her quarter, seemed to suggest, as the most prudent course under the circumstances, a return to the port they had just left. The mate, after many uneasy glances to windward, turned to his superior officer, who was sitting by the companion placidly smoking, and proposed this. The skipper slowly withdrew his pipe from his mouth, and after regarding his mate for some moments, as though that individual were a perfect stranger who had suddenly and unaccountably made his appearance on board, ejaculated, Why? Well, I'm afeard we're going to have a very dirty night on it, was the reply. Umph, was the captain's only commentary, after which he resumed his pipe and seemed inclined to doze. Meanwhile, the wind, which had hitherto been of the strength of a fair working breeze, rapidly increased in force with occasional sharp squalls preceded by heavy showers of rain, while the threatening aspect of the weather grew every moment more unmistakable. The brig was under topgallant sails, tearing and thrashing through the short choppy sea in a way which sent the spray flying continuously in dense clouds in over her bluff bows, until her decks were mid-leg deep in water, and her stumpy topgallant masts were whipping about aloft to such an extent that they threatened momentarily to snap off short at the caps. It was not considered etiquette on board the Betsy Jane for the mate to issue an order while the captain had the watch, as was the case on the present occasion, but seeing a heavy squall approaching, he now waved etiquette for the nonce and shouted, 
Stand by your togallant halyards. Let go and clue up. Haul down the jib. Eh, said the skipper, deliberately removing his pipe from his mouth and looking round him in the greatest apparent astonishment. Down rushed the squall, howling and whistling through the rigging, careening the brig until the water spouted up through her scuppers and causing the gear aloft to crack and surge ominously. "'Let fly the topsail halyards, fore and main!' yelled the mate. The men leapt to their posts. The ropes rattled through the blocks. The yards slid down the topmasts until they rested on the caps. And with a terrific thrashing and fluttering of canvas, the brig rose to a more upright position, saving her spars by a mere hair's breadth. Captain Turnbull rose slowly to his feet, and advancing to where the mate stood near the main rigging, tapped that individual softly on the shoulder with his pipe stem. The mate turned round. Captain Turnbull looked fixedly at him for some moments, as though he thought he recognized him, but was not quite sure, and then observed, "'I say, are you the captain of this ship?' "'No, sir,' replied the mate. "'Very well, then,' retorted the skipper. "'Don't you do it again.' Then to the crew, all of whom were by this time on deck, "'Bows down your reef tackles and double reef the tarpsels, then stow the mainsail.' "'Don't you think we'd better run back to the Tyne "'afore we drops too far to leeward to fetch it?' inquired the mate. The captain looked at him in his characteristic fashion for a full minute, inquired, "'Are you the captain of this ship?' And then, without waiting for a reply, replaced his pipe between his lips, staggered back to his seat, and contemplatively resumed his smoking. The fact is that Captain Turnbull was actually pondering upon the advisability of putting back when the mate unluckily suggested the adoption of such a course. Dull and inert, as was the skipper of the Betsy Jane, he was by no means an unskilled seaman. The fact that he had safely navigated the crazy old craft to and fro between the Thames and the Tyne, in fair weather and foul, for so many years, was sufficient evidence of this. He had duly marked the portentous aspect of the weather, and was debating within himself the question whether he should put back, or whether he should keep on and take his chance of weathering the gale, as he had already weathered many others. Unfortunately, his mind was, like himself, rather heavy and slow in action, and he had not nearly completed the process of making it up when the mate offered his suggestion. That settled the question at once. The captain was as obstinate and unmanageable a man as ever breathed, and it was only necessary for someone to suggest a course, and he would at once adopt a line of action in direct opposition to it. Hence his resolve to remain at sea in the present instance. Having finally committed himself to this course, however, he braced himself together for the coming conflict with the elements, and when the watch below was called at eight bells, all hands were put to the task of placing the ship under thoroughly snug canvas before the relieved watch was permitted to go below. The brig was normally in so leaky a condition that she regularly required pumping out every two hours when under canvas, a task which in ordinary weather usually occupied some ten minutes. If the weather was stormy, it took somewhat longer to make the pumps suck, and accordingly, no one was very much surprised when, on the watch going to the pumps just before eight bells, an honest quarter of an hour was consumed in freeing the old craft from the water which had drained in here and there during the last two hours. Their task at length accomplished, the men in the skipper's watch, of whom Bob was one, lost no time in tumbling into their berths, all standing, where they soon forgot their wet and miserable condition in profound sleep. Captain Turnbull, contrary to his usual custom, at the conclusion of his watch retired from the deck only to change his wet garments and envelop himself in a suit of very old and very leaky oilskins when he resumed once more his favorite seat by the companion, stolidly resolved to watch the gale out, let it last as long as it might. Note, all standing in this case means without removing any of their clothing. A gale in good truth it had by this time become, the wind howling furiously through the brig's rigging and threatening momentarily to blow her old, worn, and patched canvas out of the bolt ropes. The dull, leaden-colored, ragged clouds raced tumultuously athwart the moonlit sky, now veiling the scene in deep and gloomy shadow as they swept across the moon's disk, and anon opening out for an instant to flood the brig, the sea, and themselves in the glory of the silver rays. The caps of the waves, torn off by the wind, filled the air with a dense salt rain, which every now and then gleamed up astern with all the magical beauty of the lunar rainbow. But though the scene would doubtless have ravished the soul of an artist by its weird splendor, 
it is probable that such an individual would have wished for a more comfortable viewpoint than the deck of the Betsy Jane. That craft was now rolling and pitching heavily in the short choppy sea, smothering herself with spray everywhere forward of the foremast, filling her decks with water, which swished and surged restlessly about and in over the men's boots tops with every motion of the vessel, and straining herself until the noise of her creaking timbers and bulkheads rivaled the shriek of the gale. At four bells the Betsy Jane gave the watch just half an hour of steady work to pump her out. This task at length ended, the men, wet and tired, sought such partial shelter as was afforded by the lee of the longboat where she stood over the main hatch, the lee side of the galley, or peradventure, the interior of the same, and there enjoyed such forgetfulness of their discomfort as could be obtained in a weasel-like surreptitious sleep, with one eye open, on watch for the possible approach of the skipper or mate, all of them, that is, except one, who called himself the lookout. This man, well cased in oilskin, stationed himself at the bowsprit end, which, being just beyond the reach of the spray from the bows, was possibly as dry a place as there was throughout the ship, excepting perhaps her cabin, and sitting astride the spar and wedging his back firmly in between the two parts of the double forestay, found himself so comfortably situated that in less than five minutes he was sound asleep. Captain Turnbull, meanwhile, occupied his favorite seat near the companion, and smoked contemplatively, while the mate staggered fore and aft from the mainmast to the taffrail on the weather side of the deck, it being his watch. Suddenly the mate stopped short in his walk, and the skipper ejaculated, Umph! The attention of both had at the same moment been arrested by something peculiar in the motion of the brig. Sound the pumps, observed the skipper, apparently addressing the moon, which at that moment gleamed brightly forth from behind a heavy cloud. The mate took the sounding rod, and, first of all drying it and the line carefully, dropped it down the pump well. Hauling it up again, he took it aft to the binnacle, the somewhat feeble light from which showed that the entire rod and a portion of the line was wet. More than three feet water in the hold, exclaimed the mate. Call the hands, remarked Captain Turnbull, directing his voice down the companion as though he were speaking to someone in the cabin. The crew soon mustered at the pumps and manned them both, relieving each other every ten minutes. After three quarters of an hour of vigorous pumping, there was as little sign of the pump sucking as at the commencement. They were then again sounded, with the result that the crew appeared to have gained something like three inches upon the leak. The men accordingly resumed pumping, in a half-hearted sort of way, however, which seemed to say that they had no very great hope of freeing the ship. Another hour passed, and the pumps were again sounded. Three foot ten! The leak gains on us, proclaimed the mate in a low voice, as he and the skipper bent together over the rod at the binnacle lamp. Shortly afterwards, the wheel was relieved. The man who had been steering, taking at the pumps the place of the one who had relieved him. A hurried consultation immediately took place amongst the men, and presently one of them walked aft to where the skipper was seated and remarked, The chaps is saying, skipper, as how they thinks the best thing we can do is to upstick and run for the nearest port. The skipper looked inquiringly at the man for so long a time that the fellow grew quite disconcerted, after which he shook his head hopelessly, as though he had been addressed in some strange and utterly unintelligible language, and, withdrawing his pipe from his mouth, pointed solemnly in the direction of the pumps. The man took the hint and retired. The mate, who had witnessed this curious interview, then passed over to the lee side of the deck, and steadying himself by the companion, bent down and said in a low voice to his superior, after all, Cap'n, Tom's about right. The old barky will go down under our feet unless we can get her in somewheres pretty soon. Captain Turnbull, with his hands resting on his knees and his extinguished pipe placed bowl downwards between his teeth, regarded his mate with the blank astonishment we may imagine in one who believes he at last actually sees a genuine ghost, and finally gasped in sepulchral tones. Are you the captain of this ship? The mate knew that after this, there was nothing more to be said, so he walked forward to the pumps and, by voice and example, strove to animate the men to more earnest efforts. Another hour passed, the pumps were again sounded, and now it became evident that the leak was rapidly gaining. The general opinion of the men was that the laboring of the brig in the short sea had strained her so seriously as to open more or less all her seams, or that a butt had started. They pumped away for another hour, and then, feeling pretty well fagged out, 
and finding on trial that the leak gained upon them with increasing rapidity, they left the pumps and began to clear away the boats. The mate made a strong effort to persuade them to return to their duty, but, being himself by that time convinced of the impossibility of saving the ship, he was unsuccessful. Seeing this, he too retired below, and hastily bundling together his own traps and those of the skipper, brought them on deck and placed them in the stern sheets of the longboat. The men had by this time brought their bags and chests on deck, and finding that the brig had meanwhile settled so deep in the water that her deck was awash, they lost no time in getting their belongings, as well as a bag or two of bread and a couple of breakers of water, into the boat. The Betsy Jane was then hove to, and as she was rolling far too heavily to render it possible to hoist the boat out, the men proceeded to knock the brig's bulwarks away on the lee side, with the intention of launching her off the deck. This task they at last accomplished, aided materially therein by the sea, which was by this time washing heavily across the deck. The crew then passed into her one by one, Bob among the rest, and made their final preparations for leaving the devoted brig. Seeing that all was ready, the mate then went up to the skipper, who still maintained his position on his favorite seat, and said, Come, skipper, we're only waiting for you, and by all appearances, we mustn't wait very long neither. Captain Turnbull raised his head like one awakened from a deep sleep, glanced vacantly round the deserted decks, pulled strongly two or three times at his long-extinguished pipe, and then two tears welled slowly up into his eyes and, overflowing the lids, rolled one down either cheek. Then he rose quietly to his feet, and, with possibly the only approach to dignity which his actions had ever assumed, pointed to the boat and said, "'I'm captain of this ship. You go fust.' The mate needed no second bidding. He sprang to the ship's side and stepped thence into the boat, taking his place at the tiller. Captain Turnbull, with his usual deliberation, followed. He was no sooner in the boat than the anxious crew shoved off, and, bending to their oars, rowed as rapidly as possible away from their dangerous proximity to the sinking brig. The short summer night was past, day had long since broken, and though the gale still blew strongly, the clouds had dispersed, and away to the eastward the sky was ablaze with the opal and delicate rose tints which immediately precede the reappearance of the sun. A few minutes later, long arrowy shafts of light shot upward into the clear blue sky and then a broad golden disk rose slowly above the wave crests and tipped them with liquid fire. The refulgent beams flashed upon the laboring hull and grimy canvas of the brig as she lay wallowing in the trough of the sea a quarter of a mile away, transmuting her spars and rigging into bars and threads of purest gleaming gold, and changing her for the moment into an object of dreamlike beauty. The men with one accord ceased rowing to gaze upon their late home, as she now glittered before their eyes in such unfamiliar aspect, and as they did so, her bows rose high into the air, dripping with liquid gold, then sank down again slowly, slowly lower and lower still until, with a long graceful sliding movement, she plunged finally beneath the wave. There goes the old hooker to Davy Jones's locker, sparkling like a diamond. God bless her. Goodbye, old lass. Goodbye, shouted the men, and then as she vanished from their sight, they gave three hearty cheers to her memory. At the same time, Captain Turnbull rose in the stern sheets of the boat, and facing round in the direction of the sinking brig, solemnly lifted from his head the old fur cap which crowned his somewhat scanty locks. He saw that her last moment was at hand, and his lips quivered convulsively for an instant. Then in accents of powerful emotion he burst forth into the following oration. Then fare thee well, my old Betty Jane. Farewell for ever and a day. I am bound down the river in an old steamboat. So pull and haul, O, oh, pull and haul away. Goodbye, old ship, a handsomer craft, a purtier sea boat, or a smarter vessel under canvas, whether upon a taut bowline or going free, never cleared out of the port of London. For a matter of nigh upon forty year you've carried me, man and boy, backwards and forwards in safety and comfort over these here seas. And now, like a jade, you goes and founders, a desartin' of me in my old age. Arter a lifetime spent upon the heaven bosom of the stormy ocean, where the winds do blow, do blow, you're bound today to your last moorings in old Davy's locker. Well then, good-bye, Betsy Jane, my beauty. 
dear you are to me as the child of a man's age. May your old timbers find a soft and easy resting place in their last birth, and if it warn't for the old woman and lasses ashore there, I'd as lief go down with thee as be where I am. Then, as the brig disappeared, he replaced the fur cap upon his head, brushed his knotty hand impatiently across his eyes, flung his pipe bitterly into the sea, and sadly resumed his seat. A minute afterwards he looked intently skyward and exclaimed, Give way, boys, and keep her dead for it. I'm captain of this boat. The men, awe-stricken by the extraordinary display of deep feeling and quaint rugged eloquence, which had just been wrung from their hitherto phlegmatic and taciturn skipper, stretched to their oars in dead silence, mechanically keeping the boat stern on to the sea, and so regulating her speed as to avoid the mischance of being pooped or overrun by the pursuing surges. About midday, by which time the gale had broken, they sighted a schooner bound for the Thames, the master of which received them and their traps on board. Four days afterwards they landed in London, and upon receiving their wages up to the day of the Betsy Jane's loss, dispersed to their several homes. End of chapter 2Chapter 3 of The Pirate Island, A Story of the South Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Pirate Island, A Story of the South Pacific by Harry Collinwood. Chapter 3. Hurrah, my lads, we're outward bound. Bob returned to Brightlingsea just in the nick of time, for on the day following his arrival home, a letter reached him from Captain Staunton, announcing that gentleman's presence once more in England, and not only so, but that his ship had already discharged her inward cargo and was loading again for Australia. He repeated his former offer and added that he thought it would be a good plan for Bob to join him at once, as he might prove of some assistance to the chief mate in receiving and taking account of their very miscellaneous cargo. Bob and old Bill consulted together, and finally came to the conclusion that there was nothing to delay the departure of the former, as his entire outfit could easily be procured in London. Bob accordingly replied to Captain Staunton's note, naming the day but one following as that on which he would join, and on that day he duly put in an appearance. Bill, as on the occasion when Bob joined the Betsy Jane, accompanied the lad to London, the ship was lying in the London dock, and the first business of our two friends was to secure quarters for themselves, which they did in a comfortable enough boarding house close to the dock gates. They dined, and then sallied forth to take a look at the Galatea, which they found about halfway down the dock. She was a noble craft of 1,600 tons register, built of iron with iron masts and yards, wire rigging, and all the most recent appliances for economizing work and ensuring the safety of her passengers and crew. She was a beautiful model, and looked a regular racer all over. Her crew were comfortably berthed in a roomy house on deck forward, the fore part of which was devoted to the seamen, while the after part was occupied by the inferior officers. Captain Staunton and the chief mate had their quarters in light, spacious, nicely fitted cabins, one on each side of the foot of the saloon staircase while the apprentices were berthed in a small deck-house just abaft the main mast. The saloon was a splendid apartment, very elaborately fitted up in ornamental woods of several kinds, and with a great deal of carving and gilding about it. The upholstering of the saloon was of a kind seldom seen afloat except in yachts or the finest Atlantic liners. The stern windows, even being fitted with delicate lace curtains, draped over silken hangings. Eight berths, four on each side of the ship, afforded accommodation for sixteen passengers. These were located just outside the saloon, and the space between them formed a passage leading from the foot of the staircase to the saloon doors. Bill and Bob had to find out all these things for themselves, the mate at the moment of their arrival on board being the only person present belonging to the ship, and he was so busy receiving cargo that he could scarcely find time to speak to them. On being told who they were, he simply said to Bob, "'All right, young'un, Captain Staunton has told me all about you, and I'm very glad to see you. But I haven't time even to be civil just now, so just take a look round the ship by yourselves, will you? I expect the skipper aboard before long, and he'll do the honors.' In about half an hour afterwards Captain Staunton made his appearance, and, hearing that Bill and Bob were down below aft somewhere, at once joined them in the saloon. 
he shook them both most heartily by the hand, and, in a few well-chosen words, expressed the gratification he felt at renewing his acquaintance with them, and at the prospect of having Bob with him. "'I have spoken to my owners concerning you,' he said to Bob, "'and have obtained their permission to receive you on board as an apprentice. You will dress in uniform, and berth with the other apprentices in the after-house. Your duties will be light, and it will be my pride as well as my pleasure to do everything in my power to make a gentleman as well as a thorough seaman of you, and so fit you in due time to occupy such a position as the one I now hold, if not a still better one. He suggested that Bob should sign his indentures on the following day, and then proposed that they should go at once, in a body, to see about our hero's uniform and outfit, the whole of which, in spite of all protestation, he insisted on himself presenting to the lad. On the following day, Bob signed his indentures as proposed, and joined the ship, assisting the chief mate to receive and take account of the cargo. Four days of this work completed the loading of the vessel and the taking in of her stores, and a week from the day on which Bob first saw her, the Galatea hauled out of dock and proceeded in charge of the chief mate down the river as far as Gravesend, where her captain and passengers joined her. It is now time to say a descriptive word or two concerning the various persons with whom our friend Bob was for some time to be so intimately associated. Captain Staunton, as the head and chief of the little community, is entitled to the first place on the list. He was a tall, handsome man, in the very prime of life, being about thirty-five or forty years of age. His features were finely molded, the lines about the firmly closed mouth indicating great decision and fixity of purpose while the clear, steadfast gray eyes beamed forth an assurance of the kindly and genial disposition of their owner. Light auburn hair, in short cut but thickly clustering curls, crowned his shapely head, and a closely cut beard and mustache shaded the lower part of his deeply bronzed face. For the rest, his broad, massive shoulders indicated unmistakably the possession of great strength, whilst his waist, slim almost as that of a woman, his lean, muscular lower limbs, and his quick springy step told of great bodily activity. His disposition was exactly what one would, from a study of his externals, judge it to be. Frank, generous, genial, kindly, and sympathetic to his friends, but a fearless and formidable foe to any who might be so ill-advised as to constitute themselves his enemies. Mr. Bowles, the first mate, or chief officer, as he preferred rather to be termed, thinking this title sounded more dignified than the other, was a big, burly, loud-voiced individual, a thorough seaman, a strict disciplinarian, and possessed of a general disposition to stand no nonsense from anybody, but particularly from the seamen, who, as a class, were regarded by him with an eye of great suspicion. He was, however, scrupulously just and straightforward in his dealings with all men, and, if a seaman proved himself to be capable and willing, he had nothing to fear from Bill Bowles, as this individual was in his more genial moods wont to style himself. If, however, on the other hand, a man proved lazy, or incapable of executing the duties he had undertaken to perform, let him look out for squalls. The second mate was in every way a marked contrast to the chief. He was a tall, thin, sallow-complexioned man, with straight black hair, thick eyebrows, and thin, feeble-looking whiskers the latter very lank and ragged, as he seemed never to trim them. His eyes were believed to be black, but no one seemed to be at all certain about this, as he would never look any man long enough in the face to allow the question to be decided. His glances were of a shifting, stealthy description, and his face habitually wore a morose, dissatisfied expression, with a dash of malice thrown in, which made those who were brought into contact with him eager to get away from him again as speedily as might be. It need scarcely be said that, with these characteristics, he soon made himself universally unpopular. This was his first voyage under Captain Staunton. His name was Carter, and it was understood that he was distantly related to one of the members of the firm owning the Galatea. The third mate was a young fellow named Dashwood, formerly an apprentice. He had been out of his time rather more than a year, and the present was his second voyage with Captain Staunton. He was a smart young fellow, anxious to get on in his profession, and, a, and very good-natured. There were three other apprentices, or midshipmen, as they called themselves, Ralph Neville, John Keane, and little Ned Edwards, the latter being Bob's junior by a year. 
while the others were his elders respectively by three years and one year. It is not necessary to minutely describe these youths, as they are destined to perform only a very unimportant part in this narrative. Then there were the passengers, of whom the ship took out her full complement. First among these must be placed Mrs. Staunton, the captain's wife, though she could scarcely be called a passenger since she paid no fare, the owners allowing their captains the privilege of taking their wives to sea with them. That the captain should have his wife with him was regarded indeed by the owners as a decided advantage for, in the first place, she could conveniently act the part of chaperone to young and unprotected lady passengers when there were any. And in the next, they were justly of opinion that the captain would take extra care of the ship if she held a being so dear to him as his wife. Mrs. Staunton was considerably younger than her husband, being, if one may venture to disclose such a secret, about twenty-eight years of age. She was a very beautiful woman, rather above medium height, of a very amiable and affectionate disposition, and in all respects a worthy mate to her noble-hearted husband. She always went to sea with Captain Staunton, and made his private cabin a very palace of elegance and comfort for him. Their little daughter May, now three years old, the same little creature who had been so happily saved by Bob from a watery grave on the night of the wreck on the gun fleet, was also on board. There were three other lady passengers, all unmarried, on board on the present occasion. The elder of the three, a Miss Butler, was a lady of a certain age, with a quiet, subdued manner, and nothing remarkable about her, either in character or appearance. The two others were cousins, both of them being young and very pretty. The younger of the twain, Blanche Lasselle, was making the voyage on the recommendation of her physician, her health having been somewhat delicate of late. "'There are no very alarming symptoms at present, my dear madam,' was the doctor's assurance to Blanche's mother, "'and a good long sea voyage, say out to Australia and back, will be more beneficial than a whole pharmacopoeia of drugs.' In accordance with which opinion, Blanche's passage had been taken out and home on board the Galatea and her fair self especially confided to the care and protection of Captain and Mrs. Staunton. This young lady was eighteen years of age, fair-haired, blue-eyed, petite, very merry and light-hearted, and altogether exceedingly attractive and lovable. Her cousin, Violet Dudley, age twenty-two, was a tall and stately brunette, with a wealth of dark, sheeny chestnut hair, almost black in the shade, magnificent dark eyes which flashed scornfully, or melted into tenderness, according to the mood of that imperious beauty, their owner, and a figure the ideal perfection and grace of which are rarely to be met with out of the sculptor's marble. The rich, healthy color of her cheeks and full, ripe lips, and the brilliant sparkle of her glorious eyes, showed that it was not for health's sake she had undertaken the voyage. She was on board the Galatea in order that her cousin Blanche might have the benefit of her companionship, and also because a favorable occasion now presented itself for her to visit some friends in Sydney, whither the Galatea was bound. The rest of the passengers, thirteen in number, were gentlemen. Of these it will be necessary to describe three only, namely, Mr. Forrester Dale, Mr. Fortescue, and Mr. Brooke. Messrs. Dale and Fortescue were partners, being contractors in a rather large way, and Mr. Brooke was their general manager and right-hand man. The trio were now going out to Australia on business connected with a large job about to be undertaken in that colony, for which they were anxious to secure the contract. Mr. Dale, or Mr. Forrester Dale as he preferred to be styled, was a somewhat querulous individual, with an unhappy knack of looking at the dark side of everything. Add to this the fact that he entertained a very exalted idea of his own imaginary excellences, and believed himself to be almost, if not quite, infallible and it will be seen that he was not likely to prove a very desirable traveling companion. Rex Fortescue, on the other hand, was so thoroughly good-tempered that it had grown to be a tradition among the employees of the firm that it was impossible to put him out. He was never known to lose his temper, even under the most exasperating circumstances. He took the worries of life easily and would seriously inconvenience himself to help others. He was as energetic and industrious as he was good-natured, Work was his recreation, and it was notorious that to his energy it was chiefly due that the firm of which he was a member had attained its eminence. His senior partner characteristically took all the credit to himself, and had gradually brought himself to believe that in establishing the business he had seriously impaired his own health, 
but everybody else who knew anything about them knew also that the junior partner was the life and soul of the business. Rex was not what would be termed a handsome man by any means, but his frank, pleasant, good-tempered face proved far more permanently attractive than mere physical beauty without these embellishments could ever hope to be. Mr. Brooke differed from both his employers, where, indeed, will you meet with two men exactly alike. Of the two, however, he most nearly approximated to the senior partner, inasmuch as that, like that gentleman, he entertained a very high opinion of his own abilities, stood greatly upon his dignity, and was childishly jealous of any preference shown for others before himself. Unlike Mr. Dale, however, he was a man of limited education. He had read much, but his reading had been almost wholly superficial. He possessed, upon an infinite variety of subjects, that little knowledge which is a dangerous thing. There was consequently no topic of conversation upon which he had not something oracular to say. He was wont to maintain his own opinion with a very considerable amount of heat, and so obstinate was he that it was quite impossible to convince him that he was ever in the wrong. He was essentially a vulgar man, but as might naturally be supposed from what he has already been said, he regarded himself as a polished gentleman, and in his efforts to act up to his ideal of this character, he often used words of whose meaning he had but a very imperfect idea, and always in the wrong place. His chief redeeming points were that he was thoroughly master of his business, honest as the day, and did not object to rough it when occasion required. The characteristics of this trio came prominently into view when they, with the rest of the passengers, boarded the ship at Gravesend and proceeded to take possession of their cabins. The bulk of the passengers' luggage had been shipped in dock and passed down into the afterhold upon the top of the cargo, in order that it might be out of the way, but easily come atable if required during the voyage. Each one, however, as he or she came up the ship's side and stepped in on deck, bore in his or her hand one or more bundles of wraps, deck chairs, and other impedimenta. The first to make his appearance was Mr. Forrester Dale. He was not ashamed to take precedence even of the ladies. He walked straight aft, glancing neither to the right nor to the left, ascended the half-dozen steps leading up to the top of the monkey poop, and at once dived down the saloon companion. Arrived at the bottom of the staircase, he stood there, blocking up the way, and began to call discontentedly for the steward to show him his cabin which that official hastened to do. Mr. Fortescue was among the last to leave the boat, which had brought the passengers alongside, and he was closely followed on board by Mr. Brooke. On reaching the deck, they both paused to glance round them and aloft at the towering symmetrical masts and spars with their mazy network of rigging. "'Jolly craft, this, isn't she, Brooke?' remarked Rex Fortescue genially. "'Plenty of room and clean as a new pin, although they're only just out of dock.' I think we shall be comfortable here. Oh, yes, assented Brooke. We shall be comfortable enough, I don't misdoubt. And as to roomy, iron ships always is. That's what they builds them of iron for. They then proceeded below, and, like the rest, sought their cabins in order to stow away their luggage. Rex Fortescue shared a cabin with his senior partner, each cabin containing two sleeping berths. As he entered the one which from the number on its door he knew to be his, he found Mr. Forrester Dale struggling viciously with a drawer which, in his impatience to open, he had twisted out of position and hopelessly jammed. "'Oh, I say!' exclaimed Rex as he opened the door and noticed how lofty and roomy and how beautifully fitted up was the place. "'What jolly cabins!' "'Jolly!' retorted Dale. "'I don't see anything jolly about them. I think they're beastly holes. There's not room to swing a cat in them.' "'Well, you don't want to swing a cat in them, do you?' inquired Rex gravely, firing off the venerable joke at his senior half unconsciously. "'I think they are first-rate cabins, considering that they're on board ship. You can't expect to have such rooms here as you have at the Blackthorns. Space is limited to float, you know.' "'H you are, Mr. Fortescue,' shouted Brooke, through the bulkhead, his cabin adjoining that of the partners, and conversation, unless pitched in a low tone, being quite audible from one to the other. I call these cabins splendid. Moreover than that, look how light and atmospheric they are. Why, you wouldn't find lighter or more luxuriant cabins in the Great Eastern herself. I wish, Brooke, you'd shut up and mind your own business, snarled Mr. Dale, as in his irritation he wrenched off a drawer knob. 
You're a good deal too ready with your opinions, and I'll thank you to keep them to yourself until you're asked for them for the future. Here Rex Fortescue interposed, pouring by his tact and good humor oil upon the troubled waters, and bringing harmony out of discord once more, so that by the time everything had been packed away in its proper place, and the dinner bell had rung out its welcome peal, peace reigned undisturbed in the handsome saloon of the Galatea. Meanwhile, the passengers having all embarked, the ship at once proceeded down the river in tow, and when the occupants of the saloon rose from the dinner table and went on deck to enjoy the beauty of the evening, they found themselves off sheerness. In the midst of a fleet of ships and steamers of all builds and all nationalities, some outward bound like themselves, and others entering the river, either under steam, in tow, or under canvas, as the case might be. Here came a magnificent steamship, towering high out of the water, at the close of her voyage from India, with sallow-complexioned passengers scattered about her decks fore and aft, muffled up in thick overcoats, and pacing briskly to and fro to stimulate the circulation of the thin blood in their veins, and looking the picture of chilly misery, though the evening was almost oppressively warm. There on the other side, moved sluggishly along under her old patched and coal-grimed canvas a collier brig, with bluff bows, long bowsprit, and short stumpy masts and yards, the counterpart of the Betsy Jane of glorious memory. Abreast of her, and sailing two feet to the collier's one, was a river barge, loaded down to her gunwale with long, gaily painted spreet and tanned canvas, which gleamed a rich ruddy brown in the rays of the setting sun. Here again came a swift excursion steamer, her decks crowded with jovial pleasure-seekers and a good brass band on the bridge playing A Life on the Ocean Wave, whilst behind her again appeared a clumsy but picturesque-looking billy-boy, or galio from the Humber, the saucy Sioux of Ghoul, with a big brown dog on board, who, excited by the unwanted animation of the scene, rushed madly fore and aft the deck, rearing up on his hind legs incessantly to look over the bulwarks and bark at all and sundry. Then came a large full-rigged ship in tow, her hull painted a dead black down to the gleaming copper, the upper edge of which showed just above the waterline, with the high flaring bow, short counter, and lofty tapering spars, which needed not the stars and stripes fluttering far aloft to proclaim her an American. And behind her again came a great five-masted ironclad, gliding with slow and stately motion up the river on her way to Chatham. "'Oh, what a monster of a ship!' exclaimed little Blanche Lasselle, as the ironclad approached near enough to the Galatea to enable those on board to realize her vast proportions. "'Yes,' said Brooke, who was standing close by, evidently anxious for an opportunity to ingratiate himself with the ladies. "'Yes, that's the Black Prince. I know her well. Fine ship, ain't she?' "'I think you are mistaken, sir, as to the name of that ironclad,' remarked Captain Staunton, who was on the poop with an earshot. "'The Black Prince has only three masts, and she has a raking stem, not a ram.' "'Oh, no, I'm not mistaken,' said the individual addressed. "'Wait till we see her name. You'll find I'm right.' Another minute or so, and the great ship swept close past them, her white ensign drooping from the peak, and her pennant streaming out from her main royal masthead like a fiery gleam in the sunset glow. The lookout men on her forecastle and the officers on her bridge dwarfed to pygmies by comparison with the huge structure which bore them. As soon as she was fairly passed, the word Agincourt flashed from her stern in golden letters so large that they could be easily read without the aid of a telescope. Captain Staunton glanced with an amused twinkle in his eye at his overconfident passenger as much as to say, What do you think of that? Brooke looked just a trifle confused for a moment, then his brow cleared, and he replied to the captain's look by remarking in his usual easy, confident tone, Oh, ah, yes, it's all right. She's been altered, and had her name changed. I remember reading about it somewhere. "'Good heavens!' exclaimed the skipper sotto voce to the chief mate who was standing next to him. "'Why, before the voyage is over, the man will be telling us that the Galatea is her own longboat, lengthened and raised upon.' At 7.30 p.m. the hands were mustered, when the chief and second officers proceeded to pick the watches. Bob, to his great satisfaction, found himself included in the chief officer's watch, with Ralph Neville for a companion. They were told off with two able and two ordinary seamen, for duty on the mizzenmast, 
the two lads being also required to keep the time and strike the bell in spells of two hours each. By seven bells in the first watch, 11.30 p.m., the Galatea was off the North Foreland, with a nice little breeze blowing from east-northeast. All hands were then called, the canvas was loosed and set, the tow rope cast off by the tug and hauled inboard, and the voyage, which was to prove of so eventful a character to those entering upon it, may be said to have fairly commenced. The ship was soon under every stitch of sail that would draw, gliding down through the downs at the rate of about seven knots, and the passengers, most of whom had remained on deck to witness the operation of making sail, then retired to their several berths where, the night being fine and the water smooth, it is reasonable to suppose they enjoyed a good night's rest. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of the Pirate Island: A Story of the South Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. • The Pirate Island: A Story of the South Pacific by Harry Collinwood. • Chapter Four: The Outward Voyage. • By eight o'clock next morning, at which hour the passengers sat down to breakfast, the Galatea was off Dungeness, which she rounded with a somewhat freshening breeze and noon saw her fairly abreast of Beachy Head. The weather was magnificent. The breeze, whilst fresh enough to waft the good ship through the water at the rate of an honest ten knots in the hour, was not sufficiently strong to raise much sea. The only result, therefore, was a slight leisurely roll, which the passengers found agreeable rather than the reverse, and everybody was consequently in the most exuberant spirits, congratulating themselves and each other on so auspicious a commencement to their voyage. As for Bob, he was in the seventh heaven of delight. The noble proportions of the beautiful craft which bore him so gallantly over the summer sea, her spotless cleanliness, the perfect order and method with which the various duties were performed, and the consideration with which he was treated by his superiors, constituted for him a novel experience. In strong contrast to the wet and dirt, the often severe toil, and the rough and ready habits of the collier seamen on board the Betsy Jane. From the moment that Bob had assumed duty on board the Galatea, Captain Staunton had taken pains to make matters pleasant for him. He had spoken freely of the heavy obligation under which he considered that Bob had laid him, and had extolled in the most laudatory terms the lad's behavior during that terrible winter night upon the gun fleet. Bob, therefore, found himself the possessor of a reputation which commanded universal admiration and respect in the little community of which he was a member with the result that he was quite unconsciously accorded a distinction which under other circumstances it would have been vain for him to hope. Thus, when our hero found himself, as he frequently did, a guest at the saloon dinner table, Captain Staunton following the example of the commanders in the Navy by occasionally inviting his officers to dine with him, the passengers almost unanimously received him into their midst with a friendly warmth which they accorded to none of the other subordinates on board, agreeing to regard in him as pleasant eccentricities those frequent lapses in grammar and pronunciation which they would have resented in others as the evidences of a decided inferiority to be kept at a distance by the coldest and most studied disdain captain staunton took an early opportunity to speak to bob respecting his unfortunate lack of education and culture they were alone together in the chart room at the moment whither the skipper had called Bob, in order that their conversation might be strictly private. Robert, said he, he always addressed Bob as Robert, when what he had to say was unconnected with duty. Robert, my boy, I wish to say a word or two to you respecting your education, which, I fear, has been somewhat neglected, as, indeed, might reasonably be expected, seeing how few educational advantages usually fall in the way of a fisher lad. Now this must be remedied as speedily as possible. I am anxious that you should become not only a first-rate seaman and thorough navigator, but also a polished gentleman, in order that you may be fitted to fill the highest posts attainable in the profession which you have chosen. When I was your age, if a man knew enough to enable him to safely navigate his ship from place to place, that was about all that was required of him. But times have changed since then. The English have become a nation of travelers, Passenger ships have enormously increased in number, and the man who now commands one is expected, in addition to his other duties, to play the part of a courteous and intelligent host to those who take passage with him. 
to enable him to perform this portion of his duties satisfactorily, a liberal education and polished manners are necessary, and both of these you must acquire, my boy. There is only one way of attaining the possession of these requisites, and that is study. The intelligent study of books will give you the education, and the study of your fellow creatures, their speech, habits, and demeanor, will give you polish by showing you what things to imitate and what to avoid. Now you have an excellent opportunity to commence both these branches of study at once. Mr. Eastlake, the missionary, takes the greatest interest in you and has offered not only to lend you the necessary books, but also to give you two hours' tuition daily, an offer which I have ventured to thankfully accept on your behalf. And in addition to this, you have sixteen passengers to study. Some of them are perfect gentlemen. Others, I am sorry to say, are anything but that. Your own good sense will point out to you what is worthy of imitation and what should be avoided in the manners of those around you. And I think you are sharp and intelligent enough to quickly profit by your observations. Keep your eyes and ears open, and your mouth as much as possible shut, just for the present, and I have no doubt you will soon make headway. In addition to the two hours' tuition which Mr. Eastlake has promised you, I intend to give you two more. Mr. Eastlake's tuition will be in various branches of useful knowledge, and mine will be in navigation. Your studies will be conducted here in the chart room, and I have very little doubt but that, if you are only half as willing to learn as we are to teach, you will have made a considerable amount of progress by the time that we arrive at Sydney. Indeed, as far as navigation is concerned, it is by no means an intricate science, and there is no reason why you should not be a skilled navigator by the time that we reach Australia. Bob had the good sense to fully appreciate the immense value of the advantages thus preferred to him. He was intelligent enough to at once recognize the vast intellectual distance which intervened between himself, a poor, ignorant fisher lad, and the highly educated men and women who were to be found among the saloon passengers, as well as the wide difference between his own awkward, embarrassed manner and the quiet, easy, graceful demeanor which distinguished some of the individuals to be seen daily on the poop of the Galatea. The sense of his inferiority already weighed heavily upon him. The opportunity now offered him of throwing it off was therefore eagerly and gratefully accepted, and he at once plunged con amore into the studies which were marked out for him. Mr. Eastlake, the gentleman who had undertaken to remedy, as far as time permitted, the serious defects in Bob's education, was exceptionally well qualified for the task. Educated at Cambridge, where he had won a double first, naturally studious, a great traveler, endowed with a singularly happy knack of investing the driest subject with quite an absorbing interest, and a perfect master in the art of instructing, he superintended Bob's studies so effectively that the lad's progress was little short of marvelous. Not content with the two hours of daily tuition which had originally been proposed, Mr. Eastlake frequently joined the lad on the poop or in the waist for the first two or three hours of the first night watch, when the weather happened to be fine and Bob's services were not particularly required, and, promenading fore and aft with his pupil by his side, he was wont to launch into long and interesting disquisitions upon such topics as were best calculated to widen Bob's sphere of knowledge and cultivate his intellect. Nor was Captain Staunton any less successful in that portion of Bob's studies which he had undertaken to direct. Fortunately for our hero, his skipper was not one of those men whose acquaintance with navigation consists solely in the blind knowledge that certain calculations, if correctly performed, will afford certain information. Captain Staunton had studied nautical astronomy intelligently and thoroughly. He knew the raison d'etre of every calculation in the various astronomical problems connected with the science of navigation, and was therefore in a position to explain clearly and intelligently to his pupil every step which was necessary as well in the simple as in the more abstruse and difficult calculations. Thus admirably circumstanced in the matter of instructors, and aided by his own anxiety to improve, Bob made such steady and rapid progress that by the time the ship rounded the cape, he could work a lunar, solve a quadratic equation or any problem in the first two books of Euclid, and write an intelligently expressed, correctly spelt, and grammatical letter, in addition to possessing a large store of knowledge on everyday subjects. Nor was this all. The majority of the passengers, moved by Captain Staunton's frequent references to Bob's exploit on the gunfleet, had taken quite a fancy to the lad, and conversed so frequently and so freely with him 
that his Mave's Hante gradually disappeared, and he found himself able to mingle with them with an ease and absence of self-consciousness which was as pleasing as it was novel to him. Meanwhile the Galatea sped rapidly and prosperously on her way. The breeze with which she had started lasted long enough to run her fairly into the northeast trades, and once in them, the journey to the line was a short and pleasant one. Here a delay of three days occurred, during which the ship had to contend with light, baffling winds and calms, interspersed with violent thunder and rain squalls, the latter of which were taken advantage of to fill up the water tanks. Then on again to the southward, braced sharp up on the larboard tack, with the southeast trade wind blowing fresh enough to keep the royals stowed for the greater part of the time. And then light easterly breezes, just at the time when they fully expected to fall in with strong westerly winds, before which to run down their easting. Here occurred their first check, and instead of being thankful that they had been so greatly favored thus far, everybody, of course, began forthwith to grumble. The passengers perhaps chafed under the delay quite as much as Captain Staunton, but their outward manifestations of impatience were confined, for the most part, to dissatisfied glances at the hard cloudless blue sky to windward, as it met their gaze morning after morning when they came on deck, to shrugs of the shoulders whenever the subject happened to be mentioned, and to scornful, sarcastic, or despondent allusions to the proverbial longevity and obstinacy of easterly winds in general. Except Mr. Forrester Dale, and he, I regret to say, made himself a perfect nuisance to everybody on board by his snappishness and irascibility. The weather was beastly, the ship was beastly, and his demeanor was such as to suggest to the other passengers the idea that he considered them also to be beastly, a suggestion which they very promptly resented by sending him to Coventry. That this metaphorical seclusion in that ancient city was not of the very strictest kind was entirely due to the fact that his partner, Rex Fortescue, and the inimitable Brooke were on board. Rex bore the childish irritability of his senior partner with unparalleled good humor, his strongest protest being a mere shut up, there's a good fellow, and let a man enjoy his book and his weed in peace for once in a while. Factotum Brook attempted quite a different mode of soothing his superior. He demonstrated, to his own complete satisfaction, if not to that of anybody else, that it was a physical impossibility for them to have anything but easterly winds where they were. But he asserted, there was a good time coming. They had had easterly winds ever since they had started. This, by an unalterable law of nature, had been gradually creating a vacuum away there in the easterly quarter, which vacuum must now necessarily soon become so perfect that, by another unalterable law of nature, the wind would come careering back from the westward, with a force sufficient to more than enable them to make up for all lost time. To do Captain Staunton justice, he left no means untried whereby to while away the time and render less oppressive the monotony of the voyage. He suggested the weekly publication of a newspaper in the saloon, and energetically promoted and encouraged such sports and pastimes as are practicable on board ship. Alfresco concerts on the poop, impromptu dances, tableau vivants, charades, recitations, etc., for the evening, and decoits, follow my leader, shooting at bottles, fishing, etc., during the day. By these means, the murmurings and dissatisfaction were nipped in the bud harmony and good humor returning, and triumphantly maintaining their position for the remainder of the voyage. The newspaper was a great success, every incident in the least out of the common being duly recorded therein. The editor was one O'Reilly, an Irishman, who enjoyed the reputation of being one of the most successful barristers in New South Wales, to which colony he was returning after a short holiday trip home. The paper was published in manuscript, and consisted of twenty foolscap pages, which O'Reilly prided himself upon completely filling at every issue. Interesting facts being, for the most part, very scarce commodities, fiction was freely indulged in. The contributors vying with each other in the effort to produce humorous advertisements, letters to the editor upon real or imaginary grievances, and startling accounts of purely fictitious occurrences. In the meantime, two of the passengers had discovered a species of amusement quite out of the line of the captain's program, and which caused that worthy seaman no small amount of anxiety and embarrassment. In a word, Rex Fortescue and Violet Dudley found in each other's society a solace from the ennui of the voyage 
which onlookers had every reason to believe was of the most perfect kind. Such a condition of things was almost inevitable under the circumstances. There were four ladies on board, and thirteen gentlemen passengers, of whom no less than nine were bachelors. Of the four ladies, one, Mrs. Staunton, was married and therefore unapproachable. Miss Butler was an old maid, with a subdued expression and manner ill-calculated to arouse any feeling warmer than respectful esteem, so that there remained only Blanche and Violet, both young, pretty, and agreeable, to act as recipients of all the ardent emotions of the bachelor mind. Although the art, science, or pastime, whichever you will, of love-making, has many difficulties to contend with on board ship, in consequence of the lamentable lack of privacy which prevails there, it is doubtful whether it ever flourishes so vigorously anywhere else. Even so was it on board the Galatea, Violet and Blanche being waited upon hand and foot and followed about the decks from early morn to dewy eve, each by her own phalanx of devoted admirers. These attentions had at first been productive of nothing more serious than amusement to their recipients. But gradually, very gradually, Violet Dudley had manifested a partiality for the quiet, unobtrusive courtesies and attentions of Rex Fortescue, which partiality at length became so clearly marked that, one after the other, the rest of her admirers retired discomfited, and sought solace for their disappointment in the exciting sport of rifle-shooting at empty bottles, dropped overboard and allowed to drift astern, or in such other amusements as their tastes led them to favor. Blanche, however, still kept her division of admirers in a state of feverish suspense, manifesting no partiality whatever for any one of them above another. Indeed, she seemed to take greater pleasure in questioning Bob about his former career, and in listening to his quaint but graphic descriptions of the curious incidents of fisher life, than she did in the compliments or conversation of any of her admirers, a circumstance which caused Bob to be greatly envied. Whilst this was the state of things aft, matters were not all that they should be in the forecastle. The crew were a good enough set of men, and doubtless would have been all right under proper management. But thanks to the surly and aggravating behavior of Mr. Carter, the starboard watch over which he ruled, was in a state of almost open mutiny. And yet so acute was the aggressor that for a long time he gave the men no excuse for legitimate complaint. The utmost that could be said against him being that he was, in the opinion of the men, unduly particular as to the set and trim of the sails, and the superlative cleanliness of everything about the decks. This was all very well during the daytime, but when in the night watches the men were hustled incessantly about the decks, taking a pull here, there, and everywhere at the halyards, sheets, and braces of the already fully distended and accurately trimmed sails, only to be ordered a few minutes later to ease up the lee braces half an inch and take a pull upon the weather ones, or alternately stowing and setting the flying kites, or light upper canvas, they could not help seeing that these things were done less from zeal and anxiety to make a quick passage than for the purpose of indulging a spiteful and malicious temper. At length a crisis arrived. The ship was at the time somewhere about the latitude of the Cape, stretching to the southward and eastward close hauled, with a fine steady breeze from east northeast. It was the second mate's eight hours out that night, and although the weather was beautifully fine, with a clear sky, full moon, and steady breeze, he had been indulging in his usual vagaries throughout the last two hours of the first watch. He never attempted anything out of the common when Captain Staunton or any of the passengers were on deck, as some of them generally were until midnight. And he began them again within a quarter of an hour of coming on deck at 4 a.m. The royals were set when he took charge of the deck, and these he had separately clued up and furled, as well as one or two of the smaller staysails, he allowed the men just time enough to settle down comfortably, and then ordered the recently stowed sails to be loosed and set again, which was done. A short interval passed, and then he had the royals stowed once more, and finally he ordered them to be loosed and set again. Not a man took the slightest notice of the order. "'Did you hear there? Jump aloft, some of you, and loose the royals!' shouted Carter, thinking for a moment that he had failed to make himself heard. Still, there was no response. "'You, Davis, away aloft and loose the fore royal. Boyd, jump up and loose the main. And you, Nichols, up you go and loose the mizzen. Look lively now, or I'll rope's end the last man down from aloft,' exclaimed the second mate, his passion rapidly rising as he found himself thus tacitly opposed. As the last words left his lips, 
The watch came aft in a body, pausing just forward of the mainmast. "'Looky here, Mr. Carter,' said Boyd, a fine, active, willing young fellow, stepping a pace or two in front of his messmates. "'We thinks as them there royals will do well enough as they am for the rest of the watch. They was set when we come pon deck, and that wouldn't do, and you had em stowed. Then you weren't satisfied with em so, and you had em set. That wouldn't do, so you had em stowed again, and stowed they will be for the rest of the watch, as far as I'm concerned. The night's fine, and the breeze as steady as a breeze can be, and the old barky'd carry royals and skysels too, for the matter of that. But if they was set, we should have to stow em again five minutes arterwards. So let em be, say I. A low murmur of assent from the rest of the watch gave the second mate to understand that these were their sentiments also upon the subject. The foolish fellow at once allowed his temper to get the mastery of him. "'Oh, that's what you say, is it, my fine fellows? Very good. We'll soon see whether, when I give an order, I am to be obeyed or not,' he hissed through his clenched teeth. Saying which, he stepped hastily to the door of his cabin, which was situated on deck in the after-house, entered and in a few moments reappeared with a revolver in each hand. Now, he exclaimed, planting himself midway between the poop and the mainmast, let me see the man who will dare to disobey me. I'll shoot him like a dog. Boyd, go aloft and loose the main royal, pointing one of the revolvers full at him. I refuse, exclaimed the seaman. I demand to be taken before a captain. A flash, a sharp report, and the man staggered backwards and fell to the deck while a crimson stain appeared and rapidly broadened on the breast of his check shirt. Two of his comrades instantly raised the wounded man and bore him forward. The remainder rushed with a shout upon the second mate and disarmed him, though not before he had fired again and sent a bullet through the left arm of one of his assailants. The men were still struggling with the second mate when a figure sprang up through the companion, closely followed by a second, and Captain Staunton's voice was heard exclaiming, "'Good heavens! Mr. Carter, what is the meaning of this? "'Back, men, back for your lives! "'How dare you raise your hands against one of your officers?' "'The men had by this time wrenched the pistols out of Carter's hands, "'and they at once fell back and left him "'as Captain Staunton and Mr. Bowles advanced to his rescue. "'The newcomers placed themselves promptly, "'one on each side of the second mate, "'and then the two parties stood staring somewhat blankly at each other "'for something like a minute. "'Well, Mr. Carter,' at last exclaimed Captain Staunton, have you nothing to say, by way of explanation, for this extraordinary scene? What does it mean? Mutiny, sir, that and nothing less, gasped Carter, whose passion almost deprived him of speech. I thank you, sir, and you too, Mr. Bowles, for coming to my rescue. But for that, I should have been a dead man by this time. Oh, no, you wouldn't, Mr. Carter, exclaimed one of the men. We ain't murderers, and we shouldn't have touched you if you hadn't touched us first. "'That will do,' exclaimed Captain Staunton. "'If any of you have anything to say, "'you shall have an opportunity of saying it in due time. "'At present I wish to hear what Mr. Carter has to say,' "'turning inquiringly once more toward that individual.' "'Thus pressed, Carter related his version of the story, "'which was to the effect that the men had refused to obey orders "'and had come aft in so menacing a manner "'that in self-defense he had been compelled to arm himself, "'and further that hoping to check the mutiny in the bud, he had shot down the ringleader. "'So that is the explanation of the shots which awoke me,' exclaimed Captain Staunton. "'And where is the wounded man?' "'In his bunk, sir, bleeding like a stuck pig,' replied one of the men, resorting to simile to aid his description, as is the want of seafaring men generally. "'Phew!' whistled the skipper. "'This is serious. Run, Bowles, and rouse out the doctor at once, if you please.' Mr. Bowles sped to the doctor's cabin and found that individual already roused out with an open case of surgical instruments on the table, and a drawer open, from which he was hastily selecting lint, bandages, etc., the medico having been awakened by the first pistol shot, and, like a sensible man, bestirring himself at once in preparation for the repair of damages, without waiting to learn first whether there were any damages to repair or not. "'Well, Bowles,' he exclaimed, as the worthy chief made his appearance, "'you want me, eh? What's the nature of the case?' "'A man shot.' briefly replied Mr. Bowles. Just so. Heard the shots. Where is the seat of the injury? Don't know? Well, never mind. We'll soon find out. Let me see. Tourniquet. Probe. Splints. Lint. Bandage. Um, um, yes. Just carry these for me, Bowles. There's a good fellow. And lead the way. 
So saying, the worthy man put a quantity of splints, etc., into Mr. Bowles's hands, and gathering up the rest of his chattels, followed the mate to the forecastle, where he at once busied himself in ascertaining the extent of, and finally dressing, poor Boyd's injury. In the meantime, Captain Staunton, assisted by Mr. Bowles, who had speedily rejoined him, had been holding a sort of court of inquiry into the case, and after much skillful interrogation, and the giving of a most patient hearing to the statement of each member of the watch, he had succeeded in arriving at a very near approach to the actual truth of the matter. This, he said, is clearly a case wherein both parties have been gravely in fault. I am compelled in justice to admit to, that you, turning to the members of the watch, appear to have received great provocation, inasmuch as there can be no doubt that you have been greatly harassed by Mr. Carter's habit of unnecessarily interfering with the disposition of the canvas set on the ship. I have, indeed, myself noticed this, my attention often having been arrested by the sounds of making and shortening sail during the night watches, when you all doubtless thought me fast asleep in my berth, and I have had it on my mind for some time past to speak to Mr. Carter on the subject. I should have done so long ago, but for my great repugnance to interfere with my officers, except upon the most urgent grounds. I confess I had no idea that the provocation had been going on for so long a time. The master of a ship, like other mortals, requires sleep, and doubtless many things are said and done whilst he is taking his rest, of which he can know nothing, unless they are brought to his notice by others. It was therefore manifestly your duty, in justice to me as well as in obedience to the law, to make complaint to me of any grievances of which you may have considered yourselves the victims, and that instead of doing so, you took it upon yourselves to resent your grievances by refusing obedience to the orders of your officer, constitute your offense, an offense which, in my opinion, has been sufficiently punished by the wounds inflicted upon two of your number. You have satisfied me that your lapse of duty was in reality a matter strictly between yourselves and the second officer, and in no wise a defiance of my authority, or I suppose I need scarcely say I should not take this lenient view of your conduct." As for you, Mr. Carter, the skipper resumed after a pause, you have placed me in the very unpleasant position of being compelled to suspend you from duty until the arrival of the ship at Sydney. You have proved yourself incompetent to command a watch with that tact and moderation which is so essential to the safety of a ship and the comfort of those on board. And, led away by your heat of temper, you have hastily and unnecessarily resorted to measures of extreme violence, which might, had the men been of similar temper, have led to a dreadful disaster. You may retire to your cabin, sir. Mr. Bowles, do me the favor to call Mr. Dashwood. Young Dashwood was found sitting on his chest, dressed and ready for any emergency. The entire occupants of the ship being by this time on the qui vive, and he was therefore in the presence of the skipper within a minute of the mention of his name. To him Captain Staunton at once delegated the command of the starboard watch, saying at the same time a few words expressive of confidence in his prudence and seamanship. "'One more word, men,' said the skipper, again addressing the watch. "'I have suspended Mr. Carter, not because I regard you as in the right, or as in any way justified in your behavior, but because he was manifestly wrong.' I must therefore very earnestly caution you, one and all, against again refusing obedience to any commands issued by your officers. If those commands are such as to constitute a substantial grievance, or if they should by any chance be such as to manifestly imperil the safety of the ship or the lives of any of those on board, I am always to be found, and the matter must at once be referred to me. I shall always be ready to protect you from tyranny or intemperate treatment, but remember, from this time forward, there must be nothing even remotely resembling insubordination. Now, go back to your duty. The men walked quietly away forward, and Captain Staunton, accompanied by Mr. Bowles, retired below to make an immediate entry of the occurrence in the official logbook. The occupants of the saloon were naturally greatly exercised by the event, which formed the staple of conversation next day. It was interesting to observe the way in which the subject was regarded by the various members of the little community. O'Reilly, the editor of the Galatea Free Press, was wild with excitement at contemplation of the narrow escape they had had from a mutiny and its attendant fight, and he exhibited a curious study of mingled irritation and satisfaction, of irritation that the fight had not come off, 
and of satisfaction that he had not been compelled to take up arms against any of the foxhole hands, every one of whom he regarded in his free-hearted way as a personal friend, and with every one of whom he was a prime favorite. The ladies, who really understood nothing whatever of the merits of the case, with that unerring instinct which invariably leads them to a right conclusion, sided unanimously with the seamen, while a few of the more timid among the male passengers regarded Carter as a sort of hero-martyr, Mr. Dale being especially loud and indiscreet in his denunciations of the recklessness manifested in encouraging the mutinous rascals in their defiance of authority. "'It will end,' he dismally prophesied, "'in all our being murdered in our beds some night. Oh, dear, I wish I had never come to see.' Brooke and one or two more, though they said little, went about the ship for some few days afterwards in evident perturbation of mind, though, to do them justice, had they been obliged, they would have doubtless fought and fought well. Rex Fortescue, perhaps, took matters the most coolly of any. He not only went himself forward, as usual, to hear the yarn spinning and smoke his cigar on the forecastle during the dog watches, but he also took Violet with him, he having noticed long before that the presence of a lady was always sufficient to ensure the strictest decorum on the part of the men. Thus showing the crew, as clearly as he could, that he at least had no doubt of their loyalty. Carter's suspension from duty removed the only discordant element which had ever revealed itself on board, as far as the crew of the ship were concerned. And thenceforward matters went smoothly enough on board the Galatea for the remainder of the passage, which proved to be a rapid one, notwithstanding the delay experienced in running the Cape. It was also an uneventful one, the foregoing occurrence excepted. Nothing further need therefore be said respecting it, than that in good time the ship safely arrived in Sydney's noble harbour, and, landing her passengers, began forthwith the humdrum operation of discharging cargo. End of chapter 4「5 of the Pirate Island: A Story of the South Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Pirate Island: A Story of the South Pacific by Harry Collinwood. Chapter 5: Homeward Bound. At the date of this story, the discharging of a cargo was a much more leisurely operation than it is at the present day and Bob, therefore, had several opportunities of taking a run ashore and looking round the town and suburbs of Sydney. The passengers, such of them, that is, as were residents in or near Sydney, had one and all given Bob most pressing invitations to visit them whenever he could obtain leave, and on the day but one following the arrival of the ship, a very prettily worded and pressing little note had come to him from Blanche LaSalle to say that the friends with whom she and Violet were staying at Cookstown would be delighted to make his acquaintance, so that Bob was never at a loss for a place whither to direct his steps whenever he could get ashore. He consequently managed to see a good deal of the place, and thoroughly enjoyed the seven weeks during which the Galatea lay in Sydney Harbour. The outward cargo discharged, the homeward freight of wool began to come down, and the stevedores were kept busy all day long, screwing it into as small a compass as possible in the hold. Meanwhile, Captain Staunton was in great tribulation. The gold fever was then at its height in Australia. The precious metal had been discovered some years before, but about a month previous to the arrival of the Galatea in Sydney, news had come down the country of the discovery of a new auriferous region, the richness and extent of which was said to be something past belief. The result of this rumor was that every idle loafer who arrived in an Australian port made it his first business to desert from his ship and start hot foot for the gold fields. If the matter had ended here, the shipmasters would have had cause to congratulate themselves, rather than the reverse. But unfortunately for them it was not so. The gold fever had stricken everybody, merchants even, mechanics, clerks, all in fact but the few cool hands who realized that by remaining in the half-deserted towns they were sure of making that fortune the winning of which at the diggings was problematical. And one consequence of this was that when seamen deserted a ship, no one could be found to take their places, and Captain Staunton could stand on his own poop and count at least fifty vessels whose cargoes were on board, hatches battened down and everything ready for sea, but there they lay, unable to sail for want of a crew to man them. Now the Galatea was not in quite so bad a plight as this, for when the last bale of wool had been screwed in and the hatches put on, 
there still remained in her foxhole eight good men who were true, six belonging to the port watch, and two to the starboard, who had resisted all the alluring dreams of fortunes to be made in a day at the diggings. The other eight had deserted in a body one Sunday, very cleverly eluding the police, whose chief duty it then was to prevent such occurrences. The second mate and the cook were also missing, hence Captain Staunton's anxiety. On the one hand, he was averse to the extreme step of taking his ship to sea half-manned, and on the other, he was haunted by the constant dread of losing still more of his men if he remained in port until he had made up his complement. At length, however, to his infinite relief, he chanced upon half a dozen men who, in consideration of the payment of fabulous wages, undertook to ship for the homeward passage. They were as lawless and ruffianly looking a set of fellows as one need ever care to encounter, but as Mr. Bowles observed, they could at least pull and haul, and once at sea and away from the demoralizing influence of the grog shops, who knew but they might settle down into steady, serviceable hands. At all events, they would not want for a good example on the part of their shipmates, the remnant of the original crew, for these were without exception thoroughly steady, reliable men, although one of them was Boyd, the man who had been shot by Mr. Carter for refusal to obey orders. These men secured, Captain Staunton resolved to avoid all further risk by sailing at once. It was true that the ship would be still rather short-handed, which was all the more to be regretted inasmuch as she was in light trim and a trifle crank, but he reflected that he might lie in port for the next six months without securing another man, and it therefore seemed to him best, under the circumstances, to make shift with what he had, and get away to sea forthwith. Hasty summonses were accordingly dispatched to the few passengers who had taken berths, and these all coming on board next day, the anchor was hove up, and evening saw the Galatea standing off the land and heading to the eastward, with every sail set and dragging at her like a cart horse. The passengers were this time only six in number, namely Blanche and Violet, Messrs. Dale, Fortescue, and Brooke, who had lost the contract, which they went out in the hope of securing, entirely through the obstinacy of the head of the firm, and a Mr. Evelyn, formerly a captain in the Royal Engineers, who had thrown up his commission to go gold digging, and who, thanks to his technical training, supplemented by arduous special study of geology, had been successful to an extraordinary degree, and was now returning home master of a handsome fortune. Launcelot, or Lance Evelyn, was a tall, handsome man of about thirty-five, with the physique of a Hercules, the result of some six months' toil and exposure at the diggings, deeply bronzed, clear-cut features, half concealed by a heavy mustache and beard of a golden chestnut hue, clear gray eyes and wavy hair a shade darker than the beard. He proved an immense acquisition to the ladies, who would otherwise have been almost entirely dependent on Rex Fortescue for amusement, Mr. Dale being altogether too savage at his recent failure to make an agreeable associate, which indeed he never was, even at the best of times, while Brooke, willing though he was to do his best, was too pugnacious, ill-bred, and illiterate to be more than just barely tolerated. Rex Fortescue and Violet, it was perfectly clear, were daily sinking deeper into that condition wherein people are conscious of the existence of two individuals only, their two selves, in the whole world, so that poor little Blanche would soon have found herself quite out in the cold had not Mr. Evelyn taken compassion upon her and devoted himself to her amusement. He knew London well, and on comparing notes, it soon transpired that he knew several people with whom Blanche was also acquainted. So they got on capitally together, especially as Lance possessed, in an eminent degree, the art of making his conversation interesting. Later on, too, when he had thawed a little, he would relate story after story of his adventures at the goldfields, some of which convulsed his companion with laughter, while others made her shudder and nestle unconsciously a little closer to the narrator. But notwithstanding this, Blanche still found time to chat occasionally with Bob. The lad was very fond of steering. Indeed, he had won the reputation of being the finest helmsman in the ship, and he was always ready to take a trick at the wheel during either of the dog watches, and so give the rightful helmsman a chance to stay forward and amuse himself with his shipmates. And when this was the case, Blanche generally used to seat herself in a deck chair near him and shatter away upon any topic which came uppermost. She had been thus amusing herself one evening when, as eight bells struck and Bob walked forward on being relieved from the wheel, Lance Evelyn, who had been smoking his cigar on the break of the poop 
and watching from a distance the carryings on of the men upon the forecastle, sauntered to her side in open conversation with the remark, "'How singularly exact a repetition of the same features you will observe in some families. Doubtless you have often noticed it, Miss Lassell. Now there is that fine young fellow Ledgerton. Any one would recognize him as a connection of yours, and I have often been on the point of asking you in what manner you are related to each other. Am I unpardonably inquisitive?' "'By no means, Mr. Evelyn. It is a question easily answered. I am not aware that we are related in the most remote degree.' "'You are not?' he exclaimed in a tone of greatest surprise. "'I am sure I most earnestly beg your pardon. How very stupid of me to make such a mistake. But the resemblance between you two is so very striking that, although no one has ever said a word to lead me to such a conclusion, I have never doubted from the moment I came on board that you must be closely related.' I am sure I am quite at a loss for words wherewith to express my apologies. No apology is necessary, I assure you, Mr. Evelyn, returned Blanche. On the contrary, I feel rather flattered by your supposition, for I greatly admire Robert's many sterling qualities, and what a bold, brave fellow he is, too, notwithstanding his quiet, unassuming manner. If you feel any curiosity as to his history, Captain Staunton will be only too happy to furnish you with full particulars. He can enlighten you far better than I can, and the story is worth listening to. The manner of their first acquaintance especially is a romance in itself. Lance's curiosity was aroused, but instead of referring to the skipper, he preferred to hear the story from Blanche's own pretty lips, and sinking down into a deck chair beside her, he listened with interest to all that the fair girl could tell him respecting Bob. "'Poor fellow!' he remarked when Blanche had finished her story. "'And he has never been able to find a clue to his parentage? "'It is very singular. "'There surely must be relatives of his still in existence somewhere. "'Did the fisherman who saved his life never make in any inquiries?' "'No, it appears not,' answered Blanche. "'According to Robert's own account, "'though he always speaks with the greatest respect and affection "'of the old man who adopted him, "'the people among whom he was thrown "'are very simple and ignorant of everything "'outside the pale of their own calling.' and it would seem that they really did not know how to set about instituting an inquiry. Well, what you have told me has interested me so much, and the lad himself has made such a favorable impression upon me, that I believe I shall really feel more than half inclined to undertake the somewhat quixotic task of seeking his relatives myself when we reach England. Who knows but that it might be my good fortune to gladden the heart of a father or mother whose life has been embittered for years by the loss of perhaps an only son? "'half laughingly remarked at Lance. "'Ah, do not jest upon such a subject,' exclaimed Blanche. "'You evidently have not the least idea "'what a complete blight such a loss may cast upon a parent's life. "'I have. "'There is my poor uncle, Sir Richard, "'who has never held up his head since he lost his wife and child at sea. "'My mother has told me that before his terrible bereavement "'there was not a more genial, light-hearted, happy man living than Uncle Dick.' but he has never been known to smile since the dreadful news first reached him, and though he has always struggled bravely against his great sorrow, I feel sure he looks forward eagerly to the time when he shall be called away to rejoin his wife and his baby boy. "'How very sad!' remarked Lance in sympathetic tones. "'I am slightly acquainted with Sir Richard Lassell, that is to say, I have met him once or twice, and I have often wondered what great trouble it could be that seemed to be pressing so heavily upon him.' If it would not distress you too much, I should like to hear how he met with his terrible loss. I have no objection to tell you, answered Blanche. It occurred very shortly after I was born. My uncle was then a younger son, with very little expectation of ever succeeding to the baronetcy, for there were two brothers older than himself, and he had a captain's commission in the army. He had married a lady of whom, because she happened to have no money, his father strongly disapproved and a serious quarrel between father and son was the consequence. Shortly after his marriage, my uncle's regiment was ordered off to North America, and Uncle Dick naturally took his wife with him. The regiment was moved about from place to place, and finally when my uncle had been married about three years, was broken up into detachments, that which he commanded being sent, in consequence of some trouble with the Indians, to an important military outpost at a considerable distance up the Ottawa River. Of course, it was quite impossible for my aunt to accompany her husband into the wilds, especially as she was then the mother of a son some eighteen months old, and the question which arose was, what was she to do? It was at first proposed that she should establish herself in Montreal until the return of the expedition, 
but a letter reaching her just at that time, stating that her mother's health was failing. It was hastily decided that my aunt should return to England, taking, of course, her little son with her. Everything had to be done in a great hurry, and my uncle had barely time to pack his wife's boxes and see her safely en route for Montreal before he set out with his detachment for the post to which he had been ordered. My aunt arrived safely at Montreal, but failing to find there a ship ready to sail for England, went on to Quebec, which she reached just in time to embark for London. She had written to my uncle from Montreal, and she wrote again from Quebec, the letter reaching her husband's hands as he was on the point of marching out of the fort on a night expedition against a band of hostile Indians who had been discovered in the neighborhood. An engagement took place in which my uncle was desperately wounded and narrowly escaped falling into the hands of the Indians. His men succeeded, however, in saving him and making good their own retreat into the fort, where poor Uncle Dick lay hovering for weeks between life and death. After a long and weary struggle, his splendid constitution triumphed, and with the return of consciousness came anxious thoughts respecting his wife and child. He remembered the letter which had been handed to him as he marched out upon that ill-starred expedition, the letter which he had never had an opportunity to read, and he made eager inquiries respecting it. It was found in an inner breast pocket of his uniform coat, but it had been so thoroughly saturated with his own blood, poor fellow, that it was practically undecipherable. By careful soaking and washing, he at last succeeded in ascertaining that my aunt and her baby had actually sailed from Quebec, but on what date or in what ship it was quite impossible to learn, and that was the last news he ever heard of them. How very dreadful, murmured Lance. Of course he made every possible inquiry respecting their fate. Not immediately, answered Blanche. He waited patiently for news of my aunt's arrival in England, but as mail after mail came without bringing him any intelligence, he grew uneasy, and finally wrote to his mother-in-law asking an explanation for the unaccountable silence. This letter remained unanswered, but just when his uneasiness had increased to such a pitch that he had determined to apply for leave of absence in order to proceed to England, it was returned to him through the dead letter office. This decided him at once. He applied for leave, and it was refused. Then he threw up his commission, and at once proceeded to England, the fearful conviction growing upon him that something dreadful had happened. He stopped at Quebec for a fortnight on his way home, making inquiry at all the shipowners and brokers' offices in the place, endeavoring to learn the name of the ship in which his wife had been a passenger. But, strange to say, he could gain no trace of them. Whether it was that the people of whom he inquired were careless and indifferent, or whether it was that passenger lists were not at that time regularly kept as they are now, it is of course impossible to say. But it is a fact that he was compelled to leave America without the smallest scrap of information respecting his dear ones beyond that contained in the bloodstained letter. On his arrival in England, he proceeded direct to his mother-in-law's former residence to find it, as he feared, in the possession of strangers. He then, with considerable difficulty, hunted up the lawyer who had managed Mrs. Percival's, his mother-in-law's, money matters, and learned from him that the old lady had died some seven months before. And in reply to his further inquiries, he was informed that his wife and child had never reached Mrs. Percival's home. The old lady had certainly expected them, the lawyer said, but she had never received more than one letter which my uncle had hurriedly written, mentioning the fact of their departure for England. Poor Uncle Dick now found himself completely at a loss, so, as the best plan he could think of, he put the affair into his lawyer's hands, handing him also the blood-stained letter. This letter was soon afterwards entrusted to a chemist, who, in attempting to cleanse it, destroyed it altogether, and thus passed away the only clue which my uncle possessed. It is now rather more than sixteen years since my aunt sailed from Quebec, and poor Uncle Dick has never succeeded in gaining a trace of her fate to this day. "'Poor fellow!' ejaculated Lance in an absent sort of way. I'm sure I sincerely pity and sympathize with him. What, going below already? Then allow me to conduct you as far as the companion. Blanche bade Lance good night at the head of the saloon staircase. He raised his smoking cap, and then returning, sauntered up and down the poop for over an hour, with his hands behind him and his eyes fixed on the deck, apparently in a brown study. A few days after the narration of Blanche's story, Lance Evelyn, Noticing Bob at the wheel, strolled up to him and asked him for his history. Miss Lascelles gave me the outlines of it a night or two ago, and it struck me as so peculiar and interesting that I should like to hear full particulars, he explained, puffing lazily at his cigar meanwhile. 
"'Where would you like me to begin, Mr. Evelyn?' asked Bob. "'At the beginning, of course, my dear fellow,' laughingly answered Lance. "'I want to know everything. Do you remember being found on board the wreck?' "'Sometimes I think I do, and at other times I think it must be only the recollection of a dream which has produced a more than usually strong impression upon me,' answered Bob. "'Now and then, perhaps not more than a half-dozen times altogether, when I have been lying half asleep and half awake, a confused and indistinct idea presents itself of a ship's cabin seen through a half-open stateroom door, with a lamp swinging violently to and fro, of a woman's face, beautiful as, oh, I cannot describe it, something like Miss Dudley's, only still more beautiful, if you can imagine such a thing. Then the dream, or whatever it is, gets still more confused. I seem to be in cold and wet and darkness, and I fancy I hear a sound like men shouting, mingled with the roar of the wind and the rush of the sea. Then, then, I seem to have been kissed. Yes, and the beautiful face seems to be bending over me again. But I am in the light and the warmth once more. And then it all passes away. And if I try to carry my thoughts back to the first circumstance, which I can distinctly remember, I see myself again with other boys, paddling about barefoot on the shore at Brightling Sea. Ah, ejaculated Lance contemplatively, I have no doubt but that, if the truth could be arrived at, which of course it never can be in this world, this dream, or whatever you like to call it, is the faint recollection which still remains impressed on your memory of some of the incidents connected with the wreck of your ship. What was her name, by the by? The Lightning of London. Hmm, that's not a very difficult name to remember at all events. And the beautiful face of which you spoke, is your impression of it clear enough to enable you to describe it? Or, supposing it possible for you to see a picture of the original, do you think you would recognize it? Do you mind my asking these questions? No, that's all right. But if it is in the least painful to you, I will not put them. You see, Ledgerton, I have very little doubt that face was the face of your mother. And I confess I feel a trifle curious to know how far back a man can carry his remembrance of his mother. I cannot remember anything about mine previous to my fourth birthday. Well, answered Bob, I can scarcely remember the face clearly enough to describe it. All I can say about it is that it was very beautiful, with tender loving eyes and dark hair, which I am almost sure must have been worn in curls, but I think that if I ever saw a really good picture of it, I should recognize it directly. You would, eh? said Lance. Very well. Now go ahead, if you are not tired of talking, and tell me about the old fellow who found you, and the sort of life you led as a fisherman, and so on. It is all very interesting, I assure you, quite as much so as any of the novels in the saloon bookcase. Bob accordingly went ahead, his companion occasionally interrupting him with a question, and when the story was finished, Lance rose and stretched himself, saying as he turned to walk away, Thank you very much. Your story is so interesting that I think I shall make a few notes of it for the benefit of a literary friend of mine, so if you meet with it in print some day, you must not be very much surprised." And as Bob saw him shortly afterwards, notebook in hand, and as this story actually is in print, it is to be presumed that Mr. Lance Evelyn really carried out his expressed intention. On the day following this conversation, the wind, which had been blowing steadily from the westward for some time, suddenly dropped, and by four bells in the afternoon watch it had fallen to a dead calm, the ship rolling like a log on the heavy swell. Not the faintest trace of cloud could be discerned in the stupendous vault which sprang in delicate carnation and primrose tints from the encircling horizon, passing through a multitude of subtle gradations of color until it became at the zenith a broad expanse of clearest, purest, deepest blue. The atmosphere was transparent to an almost extraordinary degree, the slow-moving masses of swell rising sharply outlined to the very verge of the horizon, while the mastheads of a far distant ship stood out clear and well-defined, like two minute and delicately drawn thin lines on the pale primrose background of the sky. Suddenly, however, a curious phenomenon occurred. A subtle but distinct and instantaneous change of color took place, which made it seem as though the spectators were regarding the scene through tinted glass. All the brilliance and purity and beauty of the various hues had died out. The dazzling ultramarine of the zenith became indigo, the clear transparent hues of the horizon thickened and deepened to a leaden gray. The sun gleamed aloft pallid and rayless, like a ghost of its former self, and the ocean, black and turbid, heaved restlessly, writhing as if in torture. 
An intense and unnatural silence, too, seemed suddenly to have fallen upon nature, enwrapping the scene as with a mantle, a silence in which the flap of the canvas, the pattering of the reef points, the cheap of blocks, and the occasional clank of the rudder chains fell upon the ear with a sharpness which was positively painful. The occupants of the Galatea's deck glanced from one to another, dismayed. Violet Dudley's startled whisper to Rex Fortescue of, "'What dreadful thing is about to happen?' being but the utterance of the thought which flashed through every brain. Captain Staunton, turning to Mr. Bowles, who was standing beside him, in low tones requested that trusty officer to keep a lookout for a minute or two, and then hurried down to the saloon to consult his barometer. He returned to the deck in less than a minute, his face wearing a look of anxiety and concern, which was very rarely to be seen there. "'The glass has fallen a full inch within the last half hour,' he muttered, as he rejoined the mate. Then, in a louder tone of voice, he added, "'Call all hands, Mr. Bowles, if you please, and shorten sail at once. Stow everything except the lower fore and main topsails, and the fore topmast staysail. I think we are going to have a change of weather.' The seamen were as much startled as the occupants of the poop by the preternatural change in the aspect of the sky, and they sprang to their posts, with all the alacrity of men who anticipate a deadly struggle, and believe they have none too much time for preparation. The work of shortening sail proceeded rapidly, but methodically, and in an orderly manner. Captain Staunton had never before, in all his experience, witnessed anything quite like what was now passing around him, and was oppressed by an undefined foreboding of some terrible catastrophe. But he was too brave a man and too thorough a seaman to allow aught of this to appear in either countenance, voice, or manner. Nor would he allow the work to be hurried through with inconsiderate haste. He saw that the men were startled, and it rested with him to steady them, restore their confidence, and so prepare them for the coming struggle, whatever its nature might be. Meanwhile, the atmospheric phenomena were momentarily assuming a more and more portentous aspect. The sky deepened in tint from indigo to a purple-black, the sun lost its pallid sickly gleam, and hung in the sable heavens a lurid blood-red ball until it became obscured by heavy masses of dusky vapor which had gathered imperceptibly in the firmament, and now seemed to be settling slowly down upon the ship's mastheads, rolling and writhing like huge tortured serpents meanwhile. The silence, broken though it was by the sounds of preparation on board, grew even more oppressively intense and death-like than before. The darkness now came to add new terrors to the scene, not the wholesome solemn darkness of nightfall, but a weird, unearthly gloom which was neither night nor day, a gloom which descended and encompassed them stealthily and menacingly, contracting the horizon until nothing could be seen further than half a mile from the ship, and which still seemed to be saturated with a pale spectral shimmering light, in the which men looked in each other's eyes like reanimated corpses. The ocean presented an aspect no less appalling, at one moment black as the waters of the Styx, and indistinguishable beyond the distance of a cable's length, and anon gleaming into view to the very verge of the horizon, a palpitating sheet of greenish, ghastly, phosphorescent light. The canvas was stowed, down to the lower fore and main topsail, and the fore topmast staysail, and the men were about to hurry down from aloft when Captain Staunton stopped them. "'Clue up and stow the lower topsails as well,' he shouted adding in an undertone to Mr. Bowles. I don't know what to expect, but it threatens to be something terrible, and the less canvas we show to it the better. The staysail will be quite as much as we shall want, I expect. The topsails were stowed, and the men came down on deck again, evidently glad to find themselves there once more, and huddling together on the forecastle like frightened sheep. The passengers were clustered together on the poop, standing in a group, somewhat apart from the skipper and the mate, awaiting pale and silent the denouement. Bob, who had been aloft helping to stow the mizzen canvas, stepped up to them as he swung himself out of the rigging, and, addressing himself more particularly to Violet and Blanche, recommended them to go below at once. "'These warnings,' said he, "'are not for nothing. The precautions which Captain Staunton has taken show clearly enough that he expects something quite out of the common, and the change is likely enough to come upon us suddenly, bringing perhaps some of our top hamper about our ears.' So, if you ladies will be advised, I would recommend you to go below, where you will certainly be in much less danger. Blanche and Violet looked at each other inquiringly. I shall remain here, said Violet, unconsciously tightening her hold upon Rex Fortescue's arm as she spoke. 
Whatever happens, I would very much rather be here, where I can see the full extent of the danger, than pent up in a cabin picturing to myself I know not what horrors. Blanche expressed the same determination, but Mr. Dale hurried at once to the companion, loudly lamenting that he had ever entrusted his precious self to the beastly treacherous sea. His remarks attracted Captain Staunton's attentions to the party, and he at once stepped hurriedly toward them, exclaiming, "'Good heavens, ladies and gentlemen, let me beg you to go below at once. I had no idea you were here. The saloon is the safest place for you all at a time like this. You will be out of harm's way there, while here—' "'Look out!' shouted Mr. Bowles. "'Here it comes with a vengeance. Take care of yourselves, everybody!' The gloom had visibly deepened, until it became difficult for those grouped together on the poop to distinguish each other's features, and a low, deep, humming sound was now audible, which increased in volume with startling rapidity. "'Go below, all of you, I beg,' repeated Captain Staunton in anxious tones, "'and be as quick as you can about it, please. What is the matter, Mr. Dale?' as that individual stood a few steps down the staircase, grasping the handrail on each side, neither descending himself nor allowing anyone else to do so. "'My book!' exclaimed Dale. "'I left a book on one of the hen-coops, and—' His further remarks were drowned in the deafening din of the tempest, which at this moment swooped down upon the ship with indescribable fury, striking her full upon her starboard broadside, and hurling her over in an instant on her beam ends. The group gathered about the companionway made an instinctive effort to save themselves. Rex Fortescue, flinging his arm about Violet Dudley's waist, and dragging her with him to the mizzenmast, where he hung on desperately to a belaying pin. Brooke nimbly scrambled upon the upturned weather side of the companion. Evelyn, exasperated by Mr. Dale's ill-timed anxiety about his book, had stepped inside the companionway and down a stair or two to summarily remove the obstructor, and the two were flung together to the bottom of the staircase. Blanche, left thus without a protector, clung convulsively for a moment to one of the open doors of the companion, but her strength failing her, she let go and fell backwards with a shriek into the water, which foamed hungrily up over the lee rail. Bob, who had made a spring for the weather mizzen rigging, was just passing a turn or two of rope round his body when, happening to turn his head, he saw Blanche fall. To cast himself adrift and spring headlong after her was the work of an instant, and he succeeded in grasping her dress just in the nick of time, for in another instant the ship would have driven over her and Blanche's fate would have been sealed. As it was, they both had a very narrow escape, for Bob in his haste had omitted to take a rope's end with him, and had consequently no means of returning inboard, or rather, for the lee side of the deck was buried in the water, of regaining a place of safety. In this emergency, Brooke, who was a witness of the scene, acted in a very prompt and creditable manner. The rope, by which Bob had been in the act of securing himself, streamed out in the wind in such a way as to come within Brooke's reach, and by its aid he at once drew himself up to windward, and, climbing out on the weather side of the ship, dexterously dropped from thence a coiled-up rope's end, which he had taken off a belaying pin directly down upon Bob's head. Bob at once grasped the rope with his disengaged hand, and with a rapid twist threw two or three turns round his arm, whereupon Brooke, exerting all his strength, drew his prizes steadily up the steeply inclined deck, until they were able to scramble into the place he had vacated upon the companion. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of the Pirate Island: A Story of the South Pacific by Harry Collinwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dismasted. As the hurricane swooped down upon the ship, Captain Staunton and Mr. Bowles sprang with one accord aft to the helm. It was well that they did so, for when the vessel was thrown upon her beam's end, the wheel flew suddenly and violently round, taking unawares the unfortunate man who was stationed at it, and hurling him far over the lee quarter into the sea, where he immediately sank being probably disabled by a blow from the rapidly revolving spokes. The two officers saw in a moment that the poor fellow was irretrievably lost, so without wasting time in useless efforts to save him, they devoted themselves forthwith to the task of preserving the ship. The wheel was put hard up with the object of getting the craft before the wind, and then the two men stood anxiously watching and awaiting the result. Two or three minutes passed, and there still lay the ship prone on her side, with her lee topsail and lower yard arms dipping in the water. She would not pay off. Bowles, said Captain Staunton, lashing the wheel as he spoke, make your way forward, muster the carpenter, and one or two of the most reliable men you have, 
and bring them aft with axes to cut away the mizzenmast. We must get her before it somehow. Should it come any stronger, she will turn the turtle with us. Station your men, but do not cut until I hold up my hand. Mr. Bowles nodded his head, and then set out upon his difficult journey, climbing up to windward by the grating upon which the helmsman usually stood, and then working his way along the deck by grasping the bulwarks, which on the poop were only about a foot above the deck. On reaching the wake of the mizzenmast, he was compelled to pause in order to help Rex Fortescue and Violet out of their dangerous position, a position of course altogether untenable now that the order had been given to cut away the mast. This, with Brooke's assistance, he with some difficulty accomplished, landing them safely alongside Blanche and Bob upon the companion. The slight delay thus incurred threatened to have the most disastrous consequences, for when the chief mate was once more free to proceed upon his errand, he became aware that the ship's inclination had sensibly increased, to such an extent indeed that he momentarily expected to feel her rolling bottom up. Glancing aft once more, he caught the eye of Captain Staunton, who immediately raised his hand. This the mate took to mean in order to cut away the mast with all possible expedition, and whipping out his keen broad-bladed knife, he thrust it into Brooke's hand, and tapping the lanyards of the mizzen rigging, roared in his ear the one word, CUT. Then, without pausing another instant, he proceeded as rapidly as he could forward, much impeded by the continuous blinding shower of spindrift which swept across the vessel, and compelled to cling with all his strength to whatever he laid hold of in his progress, in order to escape being literally blown away. Meanwhile, Brooke, who now showed that he was made of far better stuff than anyone had hitherto suspected, began without a moment's delay to vigorously attack the rigid and tightly strained lanyards of the weather mizzen rigging being speedily joined by Bob, who turned Blanche over to Rex Fortescue's care the moment he saw that he could be of use. Steadily and rapidly they hacked and notched away at the hard rope, working literally for their lives, for it was now no longer possible to doubt that the Galatea was slowly but surely capsizing. The upturned side which supported them was becoming every moment more nearly horizontal. The lee yardarms were steadily burying themselves deeper and deeper in the water, and it became apparent that unless relieved, another minute would see the ship bottom up. Mr. Bowles, meanwhile, was out of sight forward, hidden by the gloom and the cloud of spindrift. At last one of the lanyards was severed by the keen blade in Brooke's hand. The others attached to the same shroud immediately began to render through the dead eye, throwing an extra strain upon the lanyards of the other shrouds, one of which immediately parted under Bob's knife. Then, twang, 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 one after the other they rapidly yielded, until, as the last lanyard parted, crash went the mizzenmast short off by the deck, and away to leeward, carrying away the saloon skylight as it went. A perceptible shock was felt as the mast went over the side, and everyone watched anxiously to see what the effect would be. The disappointment was extreme when it was seen that the relief was not sufficient to enable the ship to recover herself. She still lay down upon her side, and though she now no longer threatened momentarily to capsize, she neither righted nor paid off. The chief mate now reappeared upon the poop, having by this time mustered a gang of men whom he had left clinging to the main rigging, thinking it not unlikely the main mast would also have to go. By the time he reached Captain Staunton's side, the mind of the latter was made up. It is no good, Bowles, he said. She will do nothing. We must part with the main mast also. Cut it away at once, and let us get her upon an even keel again if we can. Mr. Bowles hurried forward, and as soon as he became visible to the men clustered about the main rigging, he made a sign to them to cut. The axes gleamed in the darkened air. A few rapid strokes were struck upon the lanyards of the rigging, and the main mast bowed, crashed off at about ten feet from the deck, and was carried by the wind clear of the lee rail into the sea. Another shock, almost as if the ship had struck something, accompanied the fall of the main mast, and then, laboriously at first, but finally with an almost sudden jerk, the Galatea swung upright, and paying off at the same time, began to draw through the water, her speed increasing to some seven knots when she got fairly away before the wind, and was relieved of the wreckage towing alongside. The well was sounded, and to everybody's intense relief some six inches only of water was found in the hold. The pumps were rigged, manned, and set to work, and the water was so speedily got rid of as to show that it had penetrated only through some portion of the upper works. The first mad fury of the hurricane was by this time over, but it still blew far too heavily to admit of any other course than running dead before it. 
The sea, which had hitherto been a level plain of fleecy white foam, now showed symptoms of rising, and the aspect of the sky was still such as to force upon the voyagers the conclusion that they were not yet by any means out of danger. What could be done, however, was done, and the entire crew were set to work, some to get up preventer backstays and secure the foremast, and others to convert the spare spars into jury masts. The passengers, meanwhile, had made their way down into the saloon directly the ship recovered herself, where they found Lance Evelyn pale, dazed, and barely conscious, bleeding from a very ugly wound in the temple caused by his having fallen heavily against the brass-bound edge of one of the saloon stairs. Mrs. Staunton was doing her best, single-handed, to staunch the blood and bind up the wound, with little May on her knees beside the patient, sobbing as though her tender child's heart would break, for Lance had taken greatly to the sweet little creature, and, grave and quiet though he was in general, was always ready to romp with her or tell her the most marvelous tales. Mr. Dale had retired to his cabin and shut himself in. The new arrivals very promptly afforded their assistance, and in a short time Lance was laid carefully in his berth and packed there with flags, shawls, and other yielding materials in such a way as to prevent the increasing motion of the ship from causing him any avoidable discomfort. Dinner that day was a very comfortless meal. By the time that it was served, the sea had risen so much as to render the fiddles necessary on the cabin table, and even with their aid it was difficult to prevent the viands from being scattered upon the floor. The ship, running before the wind, and with only the foremast to steady her, rolled like a hogshead, and the act of dining was therefore quite an acrobatic performance, demanding so much activity of eye and hand as to completely mar the enjoyment of the good things which, in spite of the weather, graced the board. The conversation at table turned naturally upon the disaster which had befallen the ship, the passengers being all curious to know how it would affect them. "'I suppose it means another beastly detention,' grumbled Dale. "'The ship can't sail all the way to England with only one mast, can she, Captain?' "'Well, scarcely,' replied Captain Staunton. "'The trip home might be made under jury masts, but it would be a longer and more tedious voyage than any of us would care for, I fancy. And at all events, I have no intention of attempting it. Our nearest port is Otago, but as we are pretty certain to get westerly winds again as soon as this breeze has piped itself out, and as the current would also be against us if we attempted to return to the westward, I shall endeavor to reach Valparaiso, where we may hope to restore the poor old barkey's clipped wings. Umph! I thought so, snarled Dale. And how long shall we be detained at that wretched hole? It will depend on circumstances, answered Captain Staunton, but I think you may reckon on being a month there. A month, ejaculated Dale, too much disgusted to say another word. A month, exclaimed Rex Fortescue. Jolly, I shall explore the Andes and do a little shooting. I dare say Evelyn will join me, or us, rather, for I suppose you will go as well, won't you, Brooke? Oh, yes, I'll go, certainly. Taint often as I has a holiday, so I may as well take one when I can get it. But what's them handies we're to explore, Mr. Fortescue? Mr. Dale will come with us, too, I'm sure. He's fond of sleeping in a tent, ain't you, sir? Don't be such a fool, Brooke, retorted that worthy. If ever we get to Valparaiso, which I think is very doubtful, I shall go home overland. I'm afraid that before you can do that, Mr. Dale, you or someone else will have to bridge the Atlantic, remarked Captain Staunton, as he leisurely sipped his wine. I am extremely sorry for the untoward event which has interrupted our voyage, but it was one of those occurrences which no skill or foresight could have prevented so I think the best thing you can do is to make as light of it as possible. Worse things than being dismasted have happened at sea before now, and I, for one, am sincerely thankful that we are still above water instead of beneath it, as seemed more than likely at one time. So saying, the skipper rose, and with a bow left the saloon for the deck. The sky still looked wild, but there were occasional momentary breaks in it, through which the lustrous stars of the southern heavens beamed gloriously down for an instant ere they were shut in again by the scurrying clouds, and the sea, which now ran high, afforded a magnificent spectacle as the huge billows raced after the ship, each with its foaming crest a cataract of liquid fire. And as the ship rolled, and the water washed impetuously across her decks, the dark planking gleamed with millions of tiny fairy-like stars, which waxed and waned with every oscillation of the vessel. The foremast had by this time been made secure, and it being too dark to work any longer to advantage, the men were busy relashing the spars, 
which had been cast adrift in the process of overhauling and selecting those with most suitable for jury masts. Mr. Bowles, who had hurried up from the saloon after swallowing the merest apology for a dinner, had charge of the deck, and Captain Staunton joining him, the pair began to discuss the future with its plans and probabilities. Two days later saw the Galatea making her way to the northward and eastward, under a very respectable jury bark rig, which enabled her to show her fore topmast staysail, reefed foresail, and double reefed fore topsail on the foremast, a main topsail with topgallant sail over it on the spar which did duty for a mainmast, and a reefed mizzen set upon the jib boom, which had been rigged in, passed aft, and set on end, properly stayed, with its heels stepped down through the hole in the poop from which the mizzenmast had erstwhile sprung. The gale had blown itself out. The sea was rapidly going down. The wind had hauled round from the westward once more, and the ship was slipping along at the rate of some five knots an hour. The minor damages had all been made good, excepting that done to the saloon skylight by the fall of the mizzenmast. And upon this job the carpenter, who was an ambitious man in his own way and not altogether devoid of taste, was taxing his skill to the utmost in an effort to make the new skylight both a stronger and a more handsome piece of work than its predecessor. The barometer was slowly but steadily rising, and everything seemed to point in the direction of fine weather. Lucky was it for our voyagers that such was the case. The passengers had by this time got over their recent alarm, and were settling back into their old ways. Even the impatient and discontented Dale seemed to have got over to a great extent his annoyance at the delay which the loss of the masts involved and catching the contagion of the good spirits which animated the rest of the party, was actually betrayed into an effort or two to make himself agreeable that evening at the dinner-table. So amiable was this generally irritable individual that he positively listened with equanimity to the plans which Fortescue and Evelyn, the latter with a broad patch of plaster across his brow, were discussing relative to a properly organized sporting excursion into the Cordilleras, or Andes, as they indifferently termed them, much to the perplexity of Brooke, nor did he allow himself to show any signs of annoyance when the last-named individual sought to ruffle his, Dale's, feathers, as he elegantly termed it, by urging him to join the expedition. On the contrary, to the secret but carefully concealed consternation of Rex and Lance, the prime movers in the matter, Mr. Dale seemed more than half disposed to yield to Brooks's jesting entreaties that he would make one of the party. It almost seemed as though this intensely selfish and egotistical individual were at last becoming ashamed of his own behavior, and had resolved upon an attempt to improve it. Dinner over, the ladies retired to the poop to witness the sunset, Rex and Lance accompanying them, while Dale and Brooke remained below, lingering over their wine. "'Oh, how refreshing this cool evening breeze is, after the closeness and heat of the saloon!' exclaimed Violet, as, leaning on Rex Fortescue's arm, she gazed astern where the sun was just sinking out of sight beneath the purple horizon." leaving behind him a cloudless sky which glowed in his track with purest gold and rose tints, merging insensibly into a clear ultramarine, deepening in tone as the eye traveled up to the zenith, and thence downward toward the eastern quarter where, almost before the upper rim of the sun's golden disk had sunk out of sight, a great star beamed out from the velvety background, glowing with that soft mellow effulgence which seems peculiar to southern skies. Yes, responded Rex, it is cool and decidedly pleasant. Do you not think it is almost too cool, however, to be braved without a shawl or wrap of some kind, after being cooped up for an hour in that roasting saloon? I cannot think why it should have been so warm this evening. To my mind, it was hotter even than when we were crossing the line on the outward voyage. Blanche and Lance, who were standing near enough to overhear these remarks, were also of the opinion that it had been quite uncomfortably warm below. And the two gentlemen, who by this time had arrived at that stage of intimacy with the ladies, which seemed to justify them in their own eyes for assuming an occasional dictatorial air toward their fair companions, forthwith insisted on returning below to seek for shawls or wraps of some kind. "'Phew! It is like walking into a Turkish bath to come in here,' exclaimed Rex, as he passed through the saloon doors. "'And what a peculiar smell!' "'Yes,' assented Lance. "'Smells like oil or grease of some kind.' I expect the steward has spilled some lamp oil down in the lazarette, and the heat is causing the odor to rise. I hope it will pass off before we turn in tonight, for it is decidedly objectionable. Do you know, Miss Lascelles? said Lance, as he settled himself comfortably in a chair by that young lady's side, 
after carefully enveloping her in a soft, fleecy wrap. "'I have an idea in connection with that touching story you told me the other night "'respecting your uncle's loss of his wife and infant son.' "'Have you indeed?' said Blanche. "'And pray, what is it, Mr. Evelyn?' "'Simply this,' replied Lance. "'I have an impression, almost a conviction, "'that your cousin is living, "'and that I can put my hand upon him when required.' "'Oh, Mr. Evelyn, what is this you say?' exclaimed Blanche eagerly. Have you indeed met anyone in the course of your wanderings whose history is such that you believe him to be my dear long-lost cousin Dick? I do not think you would speak heedlessly or without due consideration upon such a subject, and if your supposition should be correct, and you can furnish a clue to the discovery of my missing relatives, you will give new life to my uncle and lay us all under such an obligation as we shall never be able to repay." Do not place too much confidence in the idea that it would be quite impossible to repay even such an obligation as the one of which you speak, said Lance, in a low and meaning tone which somehow caused Blanche's cheek to flush and her heart to flutter a little. You are right in supposing, he continued, that I would not make such an assertion without due consideration. I have thought much upon the story you confided to me, and comparing it with another which I have also heard, I am of opinion that I have discovered a clue which is worth following up, if only for the satisfaction of ascertaining whether it be a true or a false one. If true, your poor aunt is without doubt long since dead, but your cousin is still alive, and there he stands, pointing to Bob, who was in the waist, leaning musingly over the lee rail. Where? asked Blanche, looking quite bewildered. There, replied Evelyn, again pointing to Bob. If my supposition is correct, that lad Bob is your cousin, Miss Lascelle. Impossible, exclaimed Blanche. Oh, Mr. Evelyn, tell me, what has led you to think so? I will, answered Lance, but I hope the idea is not very distressing to you. It is true that the lad's present position is, well, not perhaps exactly worthy of the cousin of— Oh, no, do not say that, Mr. Evelyn, I beg, interrupted Blanche. I was not thinking of that in the least. If Bob indeed proved to be my cousin, I shall certainly not be ashamed of him. Quite the contrary. But you took me so completely by surprise. I have ever pictured my lost cousin as a chubby little flaxen-haired baby boy, from always having heard him so spoken of, I suppose. And I had forgotten for the moment that, if alive, he must necessarily have grown into a young man. But let me hear why you have come to think that Robert may be my cousin. I am all curiosity and impatience, woman-like, you see, in the presence of a mystery. Well, said Lance, you doubtless remember that on one occasion I remarked upon the striking resemblance he bears to you, and, I might have added, the still more striking resemblance between him and your uncle, Sir Richard. My somewhat bungling remark, as I at the time considered it, led to your relating to me first the history of your friend Bob, and then that of your uncle's loss. As I listened to you, the idea dawned upon me that Bob and your lost cousin might possibly be one and the same individual. I got the lad to tell me his story which was naturally somewhat more full and circumstantial than your own sketch. And comparing dates and so on, I have been led to the conclusion that he may indeed prove to be Sir Richard's son. In the first place, his age, which of course can only be approximately guessed at, is about the same as your cousin's would be if alive. Next, there is the very extraordinary likeness, almost too striking, I think, to be merely accidental. And lastly, the clothes he wore when found, and which are still in existence, I understand, are marked with the initials R.L., which may stand for Richard Lascelles, the name, as I understood you, which your cousin bore. At this moment, Captain Staunton made his appearance at the head of the saloon staircase, and calling to the chief mate, said, Mr. Bowles, pass the word for the carpenter to come aft to the saloon at once, if you please. Let him look smart. The skipper then disappeared below again, but not before the passengers, who were all by this time on the poop, had had time to observe that his features wore a somewhat anxious expression. The word was passed, and Chips, who was on the forecastle smoking his pipe, at once came shambling aft. At the head of the companionway he encountered the steward, who went up to Mr. Bowles, said a word or two to him in a low tone of voice, and then returned below again. Mr. Bowles nodded, stepped quietly down to the main deck, and put his head inside the door of the deck house wherein Mr. Dashwood was lodged and in another moment the second mate came out, followed the chief up to the poop, and took charge of the deck, Mr. Bowles immediately proceeding below. No one but Lance appeared to take any particular notice of these movements, so quietly were they executed, and if he suspected that anything was wrong, 
he took care not to show it, but went on chatting with Blanche upon the same subject as before. It may be, however, that his thoughts wandered a little from the matter in hand, for once or twice he halted and hesitated somewhat in his speech, and seemed to forget what he was talking about. A quarter of an hour passed away, and then Captain Staunton, followed by the chief mate, came on deck. They walked as far as the break of the poop together, and then Mr. Bowles gave the word to pipe all hands aft. There is something amiss, thought Lance. In less than a minute the men were all mustered in the waist of the ship, waiting wonderingly to hear what the skipper had to say, for it was perfectly evident that Captain Staunton was about to address them. When the men were all assembled, the captain turned to the passengers on the poop and said, "'Ladies and gentlemen, have the goodness to come a little nearer me, if you please. What I have to say concerns all hands alike, those in the saloon as well as those in the forecastle." The passengers moved forward as requested, Lance taking Blanche's hand upon his arm and giving it a little reassuring squeeze as he did so. Captain Staunton then turned himself so that he could be heard by all and began, "'My friends,' I have called you round me in order to communicate to you all a piece of very momentous intelligence. It is of a somewhat trying nature, and therefore, before I go further, I must ask you to listen to me patiently, to obey orders implicitly, and above all, to preserve coolness and presence of mind. With these, I have not a doubt that we can successfully battle with the difficulty. Without them, it will be impossible for us to work effectively, and the consequences must necessarily be proportionately grave. He paused a moment, and then seeing that everyone appeared to be perfectly cool and steady, he added, I greatly regret to say, I have some cause for suspicion that fire has broken out somewhere below. Steady now. Steady, lads. Wait and hear all I have to say. I repeat, I have a suspicion that fire may have broken out on board. The temperature of the saloon is unaccountably hot, and there is a strange smell below which may or may not be caused by fire. It is necessary that the matter should be looked into at once, and I ask everyone here to lend me their best assistance. In case of my surmise proving correct, keep cool and work your hardest, every man of you, and then there is no reason whatever why we should not come easily out of the scrape. Mr. Bowles and Mr. Dashwood will each take charge of his own watch. Mr. Dashwood, get the fire engine rigged and underway. Mr. Bowles, rig the force pump, get the deck tubs filled, and arrange your watch in a line along the deck with all the buckets you can muster. Gentlemen, turning to the passengers, be so good as to keep out of the men's way and hold yourselves in readiness to assist in whatever manner may be required. Now, lads, go quietly to your posts and do your duty like Englishmen. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Pirate Island, A Story of the South Pacific by Harry Collinwood this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Fiery Ordeal The chief and second mates had, when named by Captain Staunton, gone down upon the main deck, and upon the conclusion of the skipper's address they at once marshaled their watches and led them to their proper stations. The third mate, bosun, sailmaker, cook, steward, and apprentices were embodied with the chief mate's gang, part of whom were told off to work the force pump which was to feed the tank of the fire engine, while the remainder were formed into line along the deck to pass buckets to the seat of the fire. The fire engine, which had luckily been frequently in use at fire drill, was in perfect order, and the men knowing exactly what to do, it was rigged and ready for action, with tank filled, the hose screwed on and laid along the deck in a remarkably short time. Captain Staunton, on seeing that the men were cool and thoroughly under control, had immediately gone below again to rejoin the carpenter, whom he had left busily engaged in seeking the locality of the fire, of the actual existence of which he had no manner of doubt. Indeed, one had need only to go to the companion and breathe the heated and pungent atmosphere which ascended thence to have resolved any doubt he might have entertained upon the subject. "'Oh, how dreadful!' exclaimed Blanche, turning with white quivering lips to Evelyn as the skipper disappeared below. "'Do you think there really is fire, Mr. Evelyn?' "'It is quite impossible to say,' answered Evelyn calmly, keeping to himself his own convictions. "'But if there is, it cannot have yet gained much hold, and I dare say a half an hour or so of vigorous work with the fire engine will effectually drown it out. And if it does not, if, looking at the matter in the, its worst possible light, 
The fire should, after all, get the upper hand and drive us out of the ship. The night is fine, and the water smooth enough to enable us easily and comfortably to take to the boats. Then the boats themselves are amply sufficient to take everybody without crowding. They are in perfect order, and the best equipped boats I have ever seen. So that let what will happen, I think we need not alarm ourselves in the least. I think, however, he added, the other passengers having gathered round him, that it could do no possible harm, and might be of advantage, supposing that the worst happens, if you ladies were to go to your berths and make up a package of your warmest clothing, together with any valuables you may have with you, so as to be in perfect readiness to leave the ship, if need be. But take matters quietly, I entreat you, for I sincerely hope it will prove that there is no necessity for any such decided step. The two girls turned away, and went together to the cabin which they jointly occupied. Mrs. Staunton had already followed her husband below, and Dale also hurried away, loudly bewailing his ill luck in ever having embarked on board such an unfortunate vessel. "'For heaven's sake, follow him, Fortescue, and stop his clamor!' exclaimed Lance. "'He is enough to demoralize an entire regiment, let alone a small ship's company like this.' Rex nodded and followed his partner, seizing him by the arm and leading him aft, instead of allowing him to go below, as he evidently intended. Just then the carpenter came on deck, and advancing to the break of the poop, shouted, "'Pass along the hose, boys, and start the engine. There is a spark or two of something smoldering down below, but we'll soon have it out.' The men stationed at the engine gave a ringing cheer, and one of them starting an inspiriting shanty, began at once to work away at the handles. "'Well, this here's a pretty go, ain't it?' observed Brooke, addressing himself to Evelyn as the two stood together at the break of the poop, watching the men at work. "'A most unfortunate circumstance,' replied Lance. "'Luckily there are no signs whatever of anything approaching to panic. "'And if all keep as cool as they are at present, "'we may hope to get out of this difficulty one way or the other without mishap. "'You seem tolerably collected, Mr. Brooke, "'so perhaps there may be no harm in telling you "'that I fear matters are much more serious than they at present appear to be. "'All day today the saloon has appeared to me to be extraordinarily hot, "'and the presence of fire in the ship now sufficiently accounts for it. And if it has been burning for some time, it may prove to have obtained so strong a hold as to defy mastery. In such a case, it behoves each one of us to set an example of quiet self-possession to all the rest. You behaved so nobly the other day, during the gale, that I think we may depend on you not to fail in that respect. Oh, I'm all right, returned Brooke. I don't believe in being put out about anything. I'm ready to help anywheres, and I'd begin at once if I knowed where I could do any good, and if the governor, referring presumably to Mr. Dale, makes any fuss, I shall roll him up in a blanket like a parcel and take care of him myself. A thin vapor of smoke was by this time rising from the companion, accompanied by a strong and quite unmistakable smell of fire, and in a minute or two more Captain Staunton, in his shirt sleeves, appeared on deck and called forward for more water. "'There is rather more of it than we had first thought, lads,' he said. "'But stick steadily to your work, and we'll conquer it yet.' The gang at the fire engine was rapidly relieved. A fresh shanty was struck up. The chain of men with buckets got to work, and the quickened clank-clank of the engine handles showed that the crew were still confident and determined. "'Now is our time,' exclaimed Lance to Brooke. "'Cut in here,' as a rather wide gap in the chain of bucket men revealed itself just at the head of the saloon staircase, and in another moment both were hard at work, with their coats off, passing buckets. Another twenty minutes might have elapsed when Captain Staunton and the carpenter staggered together up the saloon staircase to the deck, gasping for breath, their clothes and skin grimy with smoke, and the perspiration streaming down their faces. "'Send two fresh hands below, if you please, Mr. Bowles,' shouted the skipper. And you, lads, drop your buckets, and lend a hand here to cut some holes in the deck. The fire is spreading forward, and we must keep it to this end of the ship, if possible. Two of the most determined of the crew at once stepped forward and volunteered to go below. Captain Staunton nodded his permission, and led them to the scene of their labors. While the chain of men who had been passing buckets along the deck dropped them, and, under the carpenter's supervision, at once commenced the task of cutting through the deck. The smoke was by this time pouring in volumes up the companion and through the skylight. Lance had been too busy to take much notice of this whilst engaged in passing the buckets. But now that a respite came, 
he had time to look about him. He saw the great dun cloud of smoke surging out of the companion and streaming away to leeward, and he saw indistinctly through it at intervals a small group gathered together aft by the weather taffrail. He thought he would join this group for a moment, if only to ascertain whether the girls had succeeded in securing such things as they were most anxious to save, and he sauntered toward them in his usual easy and deliberate manner. As he drew near, Violet rose and said, "'Oh, Mr. Evelyn, I am so glad you are come. I was beginning to feel quite anxious about Blanche. But where is she? I do not see her with you.' "'She is not with me, Miss Dudley,' answered Lance. "'What led you to suppose she would be?' "'Not with you? Oh, Mr. Evelyn, where is she, then? "'If she is not with you, then she must still be in her cabin. "'I stayed there until the smoke was too thick to see or breathe any longer, "'and then I came on deck. "'I spoke to her, urging her to come also, and receiving no reply, "'thought she had left without my noticing it. "'But she is not here anywhere.' "'The latter part of this speech never reached Lance's ears, "'for, upon fully realizing that Blanche, his own sweet darling, as he had called her in his inmost thoughts a thousand times, was missing. He darted to the companionway and plunged down the stairs, three or four at a time, into the blinding, pungent, suffocating smoke, which rushed momentarily in more and more dense volumes up through the opening. On reaching the foot of the staircase, he found that several of the planks had been pulled up to allow the men tending the hose to get below the saloon floor and approach as near as possible to the seat of the fire. So dense was the smoke just here that it was only by the merest chance he escaped falling headlong into the abyss. Catching sight, however, of the aperture just in time to spring across it, he did so, and glancing back for an instant on reaching the other side, he saw a broad expanse of glowing white-hot bales of wool, and, dimly through the acrid smoke and steam, the forms of the men who were plying the engine hose. Groping his way into the saloon, which was by this time so full of smoke, that he could barely distinguish through it a feeble glimmer from the cabin lamp, he made his way in the direction of the stateroom appropriated to Blanche and Violet. The smoke got into his eyes and made them water, into his throat and made him cough violently, into his lungs producing an overpowering sense of suffocation and impressing unmistakably upon him the necessity for rapidity and decision of movement. Blind, giddy, breathless, he staggered onward, groping for the handle of the stateroom door. At length he found it, wrenched the door open, and rapidly felt with hands and feet about the floor and in each berth. No one there. Where then could Blanche be? She was not on deck, and it was hardly probable she could have fallen overboard. Then, as he hastily began the search anew, his foot kicked against something on the floor, which he at once picked up. It was a boot, a man's boot unmistakably from the, its size and weight. This at once satisfied him that in the obscurity he had groped his way into the wrong stateroom, and he must prosecute his search further. But he was suffocating. Already his brain began to reel. There was a loud humming in his ears. His eyes ached and felt as though they would burst out of their sockets, and he found his strength ebbing away like water. Should he at once prosecute his search further? That seemed physically impossible. But if Blanche were in that fatal atmosphere, she must soon die, if not dead already. And if he left the cabin to obtain a breath of fresh air, was he not likely to go astray again, and lose still more precious time? No, the search must be proceeded with at once. And, reeling like a drunken man, Lance felt for the stateroom door, staggered into the saloon, and felt along the bulkhead for the handle of the next door. Oh, heavens, what a search that was! His head felt as though it would burst. He gasped for breath and inhaled nothing but hot, pungent smoke. The saloon seemed to be miles instead of yards in length. Thank God, at last the handle is found and turned, and the door flung open. Lance, with the conviction that unless he can escape in a very few seconds he will die, gropes wildly round and into the berths. Ah, what is this? Something coiled up at the foot of the bottom berth. A human body, a woman. Lance grasps it tightly in his arms, stumbles out through the door with it, along the saloon through the passage. A roaring as of a thousand thunders is in his ears. Stars innumerable dance before his eyes. He sees as in a dream the yawning gulf in the floor. A broad glare of fierce white light reels madly to and fro before him. A confused sound of hoarse voices strikes upon his ear. He feels that the end is come, that he is dying. But with a last supreme effort he staggers up the saloon staircase to the deck, 
turns instinctively to windward out of the smoke, and with his precious burden still tightly clasped in his arms, falls prostrate and senseless to the deck. Rex Fortescue, who had been present when Violet spoke to Lance of Blanche's absence, and who had witnessed the hasty departure of his friend upon his perilous search, was at the head of the companion on his way below, having grown anxious at Lance's prolonged absence, when the latter reappeared on deck, and assistance having been hastily summoned, the pair who had so nearly met their deaths from suffocation were, with some little difficulty, at length restored to consciousness. Meanwhile, it had become apparent to Captain Staunton that the fire was of a much more serious character than he had anticipated, and that it was every minute assuming more formidable proportions. He therefore at length decided, as a precautionary measure, to get the boats into the water without further delay. He was anxious more particularly about the launch and pinnace, as these boats were stowed over the main hatch and would have to be hoisted out by means of yard tackles. This would be a long and difficult operation, the ship being under jury rig, and should the fire attack the heel of the main mast before these craft were in the water, the two largest and safest boats in the ship might be seriously damaged, if not destroyed, in the process of launching, or perhaps might defy the unaided efforts of the crew to launch them at all. There would be no difficulty about the other boats, as they could be lowered from the davits. The mates were busy superintending and directing the efforts of their respective gangs toward the extinguishing of the fire. Captain Staunton, therefore, after a moment or two of anxious deliberation, confided to Bob the important duty of provisioning and launching the boats, giving him as assistants the cook, steward, and two able seamen, and soliciting also the aid of the male passengers. Now it happened that the Galatea's boats were somewhat different in character from the boats usually to be found on board ship. Captain Staunton had, when quite a lad, been compelled with the rest of the ship's company, of which he was then a junior and very unimportant member, to abandon the ship and take to the boats in mid-ocean. And then he learnt a lesson which he never forgot, and formed ideas with respect to the fitting of boats, which his nautical friends had been wont to rather sneer at and stigmatize as queer. But when the Galatea was in process of fitting out, he had, with some difficulty, succeeded in persuading his owners to allow him to carry out these ideas, and the boats were fitted up almost under his own eye. The chief peculiarity of the boats lay in their keels. These were made a trifle stouter than usual, and of ordinary depth. But they were so shaped and finished that a false keel some eight or nine inches deep could be securely fastened on below in a very few minutes. This was managed by having the true keel bored in some half a dozen places along its length, and the holes bushed with copper. The copper bushes projected a quarter of an inch above the upper edge of the keel, and were so finished as to allow of copper caps screwing on over them, thus effectually preventing the flow of water up through the bolt holes into the interior of the boat. The false keel was made to accurately fit the true keel, and was provided with stout copper bolts coinciding in number and position with the bolt holes in the true keel. To fix the false keel, all that was necessary was to unscrew the caps from the top of the bushes, apply the false to the true keel, pushing the bolts up through their respective holes, and set them up tight by means of thumb screws. The whole operation could be performed in a couple of minutes, and the boats were then fit to beat to windward to any extent. As far as the gigs were concerned, with the exception of the whaleboat gig, which was an exquisitely modeled boat, fitted with air chambers so as to render her self-riding and unsinkable, beyond greater attention than usual to the model of the craft, this was the only difference which Captain Staunton had thought it necessary to make between the boats of the Galatea and those of other ships. But in the cases of the launch and pinnace, he had gone a step further, by fitting them with movable decks and sections, which covered in the boats forward and aft, and for about a foot wide right along each side. These decks were bolted down and secured with thumb screws to beams which fitted into sockets under the gunwale. And when the hole was once fixed, each section contributed to keep all immovably in place. The decking being but light, it was not difficult to fix, and in an hour after the order was given to launch the boats, the launch and pinnace were in the water alongside, and the gigs hanging at the davits ready to lower away at a moment's notice. Thanks also to Captain Staunton's never-ceasing care with regard to the boats, they were all in perfect condition, and not leaky as baskets, as are too many boats when required to be lowered upon an unexpected emergency. The gigs and the launch were regularly half-filled with water every morning before the decks were washed down, and emptied at the conclusion of that ceremony, while the pinnace, which was stowed bottom-up in the launch, 
was liberally soused with water at the same time. In addition to this, the proper complement of oars and rowlocks, the stretchers, boat hook, mop, baler, anchor, rudder, yoke, and tiller, together with the compass, masts, and sails, were always stowed in the boat to which they belonged, and were carefully overhauled once every week under the skipper's own eye. Thus, on the present occasion, there was none of that bewildered running about and searching high and low for the boat's gear. It was all at hand and ready for use whenever it might be wanted. There was nothing, therefore, to do but to make sure that each boat was amply provisioned. This, the launch and pinnace being safely in the water, was Bob's next task, to which he devoted himself coolly, but with all alacrity. The boat's water breakers, which were slung, ready filled between the fore and after gallows, under two of the gigs, each breaker bearing painted upon it the name of the boat to which it belonged, were cast adrift and passed into the proper boats as they were lowered, and then followed as large a quantity of provisions as could possibly be stowed away without too much encumbering the movements of the occupants. Meanwhile, the scuppers had all been carefully plugged up, the decks pierced, and all hands set to work with buckets, etc., to flood them, and still the fire increased in volume. It was 11.30 p.m. by the time that the boats were veered astern, fully equipped and ready to receive their human freight. And at midnight the main mast fell, flames at the same time bursting up through the saloon companion and skylight. Upon perceiving this, it became evident to Captain Staunton that it was quite hopeless to further prolong the fight. The crew had been for four hours exerting themselves to their utmost capacity, and the fire gaining steadily upon them the whole time. They were now completely exhausted, and the fire was blazing furiously almost throughout the devoted ship. He therefore considered he had done his full duty and was now quite justified in abandoning the unfortunate Galatea to her fiery doom. He accordingly gave orders for the crew to desist from their efforts, to collect their effects, and to muster again on the quarter-deck with all possible expedition. The men needed no second bidding. They saw that the moments of the good ship were numbered, and, throwing down whatever they happened to have in their hands, they made a rush for the forecastle, and there, in the midst of the already blinding and stifling smoke, proceeded hurriedly to gather together their few belongings. In less than five minutes, all hands were collected in the waist, waiting the order to pass over the side. The boats had meanwhile been hauled alongside, and the ladies, with little May, carefully handed into the launch. This, when the attempt came to be made, proved a task of no little difficulty, for the ship's sides were found to be so hot that it was impossible to touch them. However, by the exercise of great caution, it was accomplished without mishap. And then the male passengers were ordered down over the side, Rex and Lance going into the launch with the ladies, while Dale and Brooke were told off to the pinnace. The crew were then sent down, each man as he passed over the rail being told what boat he was to go into. Mr. Bowles was appointed to the command of the pinnace, and Mr. Dashwood was ordered to take charge of the whaleboat gig, with six hands as his crew. The passengers and crew of the Galatea were distributed thus. The launch, under the command of Captain Staunton, carried Mrs. Staunton, her little daughter May, Violet Dudley, Blanche Lascelles, the bosom friends Rex and Lance, Bob and his three fellow apprentices, and the steward, twelve in all. The pinnace, commanded by Mr. Bowles, had on board Mr. Forrester Dale, Brooke, the carpenter, the sailmaker, and two of the seamen, numbering seven all told. The whaleboat gig, the smartest boat of the fleet, was manned, as already stated, by Mr. Dashwood and six picked hands. She was to act as tender to the launch. The second gig, of which the boatswain was given charge, carried the remainder of the crew, five in number, or six, including the boatswain. Captain Staunton was, of course, the last man to leave the ship, and it was not until the moment had actually arrived for him to do so that the full force of the calamity appeared to burst upon him. Up to that moment he had been working harder than any other man on board, and whilst his body had been actively engaged, his mind was no less busy devising expedients for the preservation of the noble ship with the lives and cargo which she carried, and for the safety of all of which he was responsible. But now all that was done with. The ship and cargo were hopelessly lost, and the time had come when they must be abandoned to their fate. It was true that many precious lives were still, as it were, held in his hands, that upon his skill and courage depended to a very large extent their preservation. But that was a matter for the future, the immediate future, no doubt. But at that supreme moment, Captain Staunton seemed unable to think of anything but the present. 
that terrible present in which he must abandon to the devouring flames the beautiful fabric which had borne them all so gallantly over so many thousand leagues of the pathless ocean, through light and darkness, through sunshine and tempest, battling successfully with the wind and the wave in their most unbridled fury, to succumb helplessly at last under the insidious attack of that terrible enemy, fire. The last of the crew had passed down over the side and had been received into the boat to which he was appointed. The boats had all, excepting the launch, shoved off from the ship's side and retired to a distance at which the fierce heat of the victorious flames were no longer a discomfort. And it was now high time that the skipper himself should also leave. The flames were roaring and leaping below, above, and around him. The scorching air was surging about him. Torrents of sparks were whirling around him, yet he seemed unable to tear himself away. There he stood in the gangway, his head bare, with his cap in his hand, and his eyes roving lingeringly and lovingly fore and aft, and then aloft to the blazing spars and sails. At length the foremast was seen to tremble and totter. It wavered for a moment, and then with a crash and in a cloud of fiery sparks plunged hissing over the side, the opposite side, fortunately, to that on which the launch lay. This aroused Captain Staunton. He gazed about him a single moment longer in a dazed, bewildered way, and then, as the ship rolled and the launch rose upon the sea, sprang lightly down into the boat, and in a voice stern with emotion, gave the order to shove off. "'Oh, Papa!' cried little May. "'I's so glad you's come. I sought you weren't coming.' And the sweet little creature threw her arms lovingly about her father's neck. Do not deem him unmanly that he hid his eyes for a moment on his child's shoulder. Perchance to pray for her safety in the trials, the troubles, and the dangers which now lay before them. Then handing the little one back to her mother, he hailed in a cheery voice the rest of the boats to close round the launch as soon as she had withdrawn to a safe distance. In a few minutes the little fleet lay on their oars close together, at a distance of about a hundred yards from the blazing ship. Captain Staunton then in a few well-chosen words first thanked all hands for the strenuous efforts they had made to save the ship, and then explained to them his plans for the future. He proposed in the first place, he said, to remain near the Galatea as long as she floated, because if any other craft happened to be in their neighborhood, her crew would be certain to notice the light of the fire and bear down to see what it meant, in which case they would be spared the necessity of a long voyage in the boats. But if no friendly sail appeared within an hour or two of the destruction of their own ship, it was his intention to continue in the boats the course to Valparaiso, which they had been steering when the fire broke out. By his reckoning, they were a trifle over 1,800 miles from this port, a long distance, no doubt, but he reminded them that they were in the Pacific and might reasonably hope for moderately fine weather. Their boats were all in perfect order, well supplied, and in good sailing trim. Instead of being loaded down to the gunwale, as was too often the case when a crew were compelled to abandon their ship, and he believed that, unless some unforeseen circumstance occurred to delay them, they could make the passage in a fortnight. And finally he expressed a hope that all hands would maintain strict discipline and cheerfully obey the orders of their officers, as upon this would to a very great extent depend their ultimate safety. His address was responded to with a ringing cheer after which the occupants of the various boats subsided into silence and sat watching the burning ship. The Galatea was by this time a mass of flame fore and aft. Her masts were gone, her decks had fallen in, and her hull above water was in several places red hot, while as she rolled heavily on the long swell, burying her heated sides gunnel deep in the water, great clouds of steam rose up like the smoke of a broadside and hid her momentarily from view. The fire continued to blaze more and more fiercely as it spread among the cargo, until about a couple of hours after the boats had left the ship, when the intense and long-continued heat appeared to cause some rivets to give way, or to destroy some of the iron plates, for a great gap suddenly appeared in the Galatea's side, a long strip of plating curling up and shriveling away like a sheet of paper, and momentarily revealing the white-hot contents of the glowing hold. Then the water poured in through the orifice, there was a sudden upbursting of a vast cloud of steam accompanied by a mighty hissing sound. The hull appeared to writhe like a living thing in mortal agony, and then darkness upon the face of the waters. The scorched and distorted shell of iron, which had once been as gallant a ship as ever rode the foam, was gone from sight forever. End of chapter 7
Chapter 8 of The Pirate Island, A Story of the South Pacific by Harry Collinwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8, At the Mercy of Wind and Wave. The silence which followed the disappearance of the Galatea was broken by a plaintive wail from little May, who sobbed out that she was, Oh, so sorry that poor Papa's beautiful ship was all burned up. Her sorrows, however, were speedily charmed away by the representation made to her by her mother that if the ship had not been burnt, they would probably never have thought of going for a delightful sail in the boats, as they now were. And soon afterwards the poor overtired child fell into a deep dreamless sleep in her mother's arms. As everything had been made ready in the launch before she left the ship's side, the ladies had now nothing to do but make themselves thoroughly comfortable for the night on and among the blankets and skin rugs which had been arranged for them in the stern sheets. A cozy enough little cabin, of necessarily very limited dimensions, was also arranged in the bows of the boat for the gentlemen, and to this, upon Captain Staunton's assurance that their services would certainly not be needed for at least some hours, Rex and Lance betook themselves, accompanied by Bob and young Neville, the former of whom was to keep watch alternately with the skipper. The night now being so far advanced, Captain Staunton announced to the occupants of the other boats his intention to wait for daylight before making sail and the tired crews at once composing themselves to slumber, silence soon fell upon the little fleet of boats, which lay there riding lightly over the majestic, slowly heaving swell of the Pacific under the solemn starlight. The hours of night passed peacefully away, and the watchers on board the several boats at length saw the velvety darkness in the eastern quarter paling before the approaching day. The stars, which but a short time before had risen into view over the dark rim of the horizon, dwindled into lusterless insignificance and finally disappeared. The sky grew momentarily paler and bluer in tint, the light sweeping imperceptibly higher and wider over the ethereal vault. Then suddenly above the eastern horizon appeared a faint, delicate, rosy flush, followed by a brilliant golden penciling of the lower edges of a few flecks of cloud invisible before. Long shafts of golden light sprang radiating upward from a point below the horizon, and in another moment the upper edge of a great golden disk rose into view, flooding the laughing waves with shimmering radiance, and transforming in a moment the hitherto silent and somber scene into one of joyousness and life. Seabirds hovered screaming high in the air, on the lookout for breakfast. Flying fish sparkled like glittering gems out of the bosom of the heaving deep. Dolphins leaped and darted here and there. A school of porpoises rotated lazily past, heading to the westward, and away upon the very verge of the horizon a large school of whales appeared spouting and playing. It was day again. Bob at once, in accordance with his instructions, called Captain Staunton, who had lain down an hour or two before to snatch a little rest. The skipper, who had turned in all standing, that is to say, without undressing, soon made his appearance, and, first glancing keenly all round the horizon in the vain hope of discovering a sail, at once hailed the other boats, ordering them to make sail and to proceed upon a northeasterly course, extending themselves in line to the right and left, and to maintain as great a distance apart during the day as would be compatible with an easy interchange of communication by signal, to keep a sharp lookout all day, and to close in again upon the launch at nightfall. The order was promptly obeyed, and in five minutes afterwards the little fleet were dancing gaily along over the low liquid hills of the Pacific Swell, tossing tiny showers of spray out on each side from their bows, and leaving a long glistening wake of miniature whirlpools behind them. The slight bustle of making sail on the boats, combined with the novelty of their situation, was sufficient to rouse all hands, and a few minutes after the boats were fairly under way, the ladies and little May emerged from their quarters in the stern sheets of the launch. The excitement of the previous night had been completely overcome by the fatigue of preparation to desert the ship, and the lateness of the hour of retirement had secured for these, our heroines, a few hours of sound repose, so that when they made their appearance aft, refreshed by sleep and exhilarated by the pure bracing morning breeze, they looked and felt as little like castaways as one can well imagine. Indeed, they appeared more disposed to regard the adventure as a pleasantly exciting escapade than anything else, a state of feeling which the gentlemen of the party were careful to foster and encourage by every means in their power, 
judging it highly probable that there would be enough and more than enough to damp their high spirits before this singular boat voyage, just commenced, should be over. On board the launch, the fortunes of which we propose to follow for the present, all was pleasant activity. Even the skipper, whose reflections must necessarily have been of a somewhat somber character, glad to observe such a prevalence of good spirits among his fellow voyagers, resolutely put all disagreeable thoughts behind him, and chimed in with the others, feeling the importance of prolonging to its utmost extent so favorable and pleasant a state of affairs. Lance, whose experiences in the Australian bush had evidently made him fertile of resource, now rummaged out from among his baggage a diminutive but effective cooking apparatus, the fuel for which was supplied from a goodly jar of spirit stowed away in the eyes of the boat, and initiating the steward into the peculiarities of its management and explaining to him its capabilities, an appetizing breakfast of coffee and fried chops, cut from the carcass of a sheep hastily slaughtered the previous night, was soon served out to the occupants of the boat. Fishing lines were afterwards produced, and if the sport was meager and the amount of fish captured but small, the expedient had at least the good effect of providing occupation and amusement for the ladies during the greater part of the day. As the weather continued fine and there was absolutely nothing to do but steer the boat upon a given course and keep a bright lookout, Captain Staunton seized the opportunity to take a good long spell of sleep, not only to make up for that lost on the previous night, but also to lay in a stock, as it were, against the time when probably many long and weary hours would have to be passed without it. Lance and Rex took the helm in turns throughout the day, while the ladies tended the fishing lines, chatted with their male companions, or played with little May, as the humor took them. About an hour before sunset, a small red flag was hoisted on board the launch as a signal for the other boats to close, the signal being repeated by each boat as soon as it was observed, and kept flying until the most distant craft had answered it by bearing up or hauling to the wind, as the case might be. And by the time that the stars were fairly out, the little fleet was once more sailing along in a close and compact body. So ended the first day in the boats. This pleasant and satisfactory state of affairs lasted for five days, and then came a change. On the afternoon of the fifth day, light, fleecy vapors began to gather in the sky, growing thicker as the afternoon waned, until by sunset the entire canopy of heaven was veiled by huge masses of dense, slate-colored cloud, which swept heavily across the firmament from the eastward. The aneroid, which Captain Staunton had ordered to be put on board the launch, indicated a considerable decrease in, of atmospheric pressure, which, coupled with the appearance of the sky, led the skipper to believe that bad weather was at hand. Accordingly, when the other boats closed in upon the launch at sundown, word was passed along the line to keep a sharp lookout and to be prepared for any change which might occur. About 9 p.m., the wind died almost completely away, and shortly afterwards a few heavy drops of rain fell, speedily followed by a drenching shower. This killed the remaining light air of wind, and the boats lay idly upon the water, their saturated canvas flapping heavily against the masts. But not for long. The sails were speedily lowered down and spread across from gunwale to gunwale to catch the precious moisture, and so heavy was the downpour that in the quarter of an hour during which the shower lasted, the voyagers were enabled to almost entirely refill their breakers, the contents of which had by this time very materially diminished. The rain ceased suddenly, and a few minutes afterwards a puff of wind, hot as the breath of a furnace, swept over the boats from the northeast and passed away, leaving a breathless calm as before. This was repeated twice or thrice, and then with a heavier puff than before a stiff breeze set in from the northeast, breaking off the boats from their course, and necessitating their hauling close upon a wind on the port tack. By midnight the wind had increased so much that it became necessary to reef, the launch and pinnace double reefing their canvas in order that they might not run away from the other boats. The sea now began to rise rapidly, and when day at length broke it revealed a dismal picture of dark tempestuous sky, leaden gray ocean, its surface broken up into high, racing, foam-capped seas, and the little fleet of boats tossing wildly upon the angry surges. The launch leading, the pinnace next, and the others so far astern that it took Captain Staunton quite ten minutes to satisfy himself that they were all still in sight. It was by this time blowing a moderate gale, and appearances seemed to indicate that downright bad weather was not far off. The captain decided, therefore, to heave to at once, 
as it would be quite impossible in any other way to keep the little fleet together. The canvas on board the launch was accordingly still further reduced, the jib sheet hauled over to windward, and the boat left to fight it out as best she could. The pinnace soon afterwards joined company and followed suit, the remainder of the boats doing the same as they came up. As the day wore on, the gale increased in strength, the sea rising proportionally and flinging the boats about like corks upon its angry surface. So violent was the motion that it was only with the utmost difficulty the steward succeeded in preparing a hot meal at midday, and when evening came our adventurers were obliged to content themselves with what Lance laughingly called a cold collation. The day was indeed a wretched one. There was no temptation whatever to leave such slight shelter as the tiny cabins afforded, for the launch, and indeed all the other boats as well, were constantly enveloped in spray blown from the caps of the seas by the wind, while cooped up below it was unpleasantly warm, and the motion of the boat was so violent that her occupants were compelled to wedge themselves firmly in one position to avoid being dashed against their companions. If the day was one of discomfort, the night which followed was infinitely worse. The gale continued steadily to increase. The sea rose to a tremendous height, breaking heavily. The spray flew continuously over the launch in drenching showers. The little craft, under the merest shred of canvas, was careened gunwale to by the force of the wind every time she rose upon the crest of a sea, and the most watchful care of the skipper, who had stationed himself at the helm, was sometimes insufficient to prevent a more than ordinarily heavy sea from breaking on board. The increasing frequency of these occurrences at length necessitated the maintenance of one hand continually at the baler in order to keep the boat free of water. And in spite of all, the ladies were unable to escape a thorough wetting. Nor was this the worst mishap. The water rose so high in the interior of the boat on one or two occasions that it got at the provisions, so seriously damaging some of them that there was little hope of their being rendered again fit for consumption. It was a most fortunate circumstance for those in the launch that, thanks to the captain's foresight, she had been fitted with a partial deck. Otherwise, she must inevitably have been swamped. How it fared with the other boats it was impossible to say. The darkness was too profound to permit of their being seen, if they still remained afloat. But the manner in which the launch suffered caused the skipper to entertain the gravest apprehensions for the rest of the fleet, and he almost dreaded the return of daylight, lest it should reveal to him the realization of his worst fears. It seemed to the occupants of the launch as though that miserable night would never end. The tardy dawn, however, made its appearance at last, reluctantly, as it seemed to those drenched and weary watchers, and the moment that there was light enough to enable him to see distinctly Captain Staunton staggered to his feet, and steadying himself by grasping the boat's mainmast, took a long, anxious look all round the horizon. At first he could distinguish nothing save the wildly rushing foam-capped seas, and the scurrying shreds of cloud which swept rapidly athwart the black and stormy sky. But after some minutes of painfully anxious scrutiny, he descried, about three miles away to leeward, a tiny dark object, appearing at intervals against the leaden gray of the horizon, which his seaman's eye told him was the pinnace. The remainder of the fleet had disappeared. It was no more than a realization of his forebodings, but Captain Staunton possessed far too feeling a heart not to be powerfully affected by the loss of the two boats and the thirteen brave fellows who manned them. He ran over their names mentally, and recalled that no less than nine of the thirteen had arranged for half their pay to be handed over to their families at home, and he pictured to himself the bitter grief and distress there would be in those nine families when it came to be known that the husband, the father, the breadwinner was gone. Overwhelmed and swallowed up by the remorseless ocean which knows no pity, not even for the wife and the helpless children. With a powerful effort, the captain dismissed these painful reflections from his mind and turned his attention to matters nearer home. He had already searchingly scrutinized the aspect of the weather with most unsatisfactory results. As far as his experience went, there was every prospect of a continuance, nay, more, an increase of the gale. The sky to windward looked wilder and more threatening than ever, while that the sea was still rising was a fact about which there could be no mistake. He dived into the little cabin or shelter aft, and took a long look at the aneroid, to find that it still manifested a downward tendency. It was evidently hopeless to expect a favorable change in the weather for some hours at least, and to attempt any longer to maintain the boat's position 
in the face of an increasing gale, was to expose her and those in her to imminent risk of destruction. He therefore decided to watch his opportunity and seize the first favorable moment for bearing up and running before it. Bob and his fellow apprentices, together with Lance and Rex, were soon summoned, and preparations made for bearing up. It was an anxious moment, for should the boat be caught broadside on by a breaking sea, she would to a dead certainty be turned bottom up, when nothing could save her occupants. Captain Staunton stood at the tiller, intently watching the onward rush of the mountainous seas as they came swooping down with upreared threatening crests upon the launch. Presently, as the boat fell off a trifle from the wind and the mainsail filled, he gave the order to let draw the jib sheet. The weather sheet was let go, and the lee one hauled in like lightning, and the boat began to forge ahead. A sea came swooping down upon the little craft, but it was not a dangerous one. The skipper sent the boat manfully at it, and with a wild bound she rose over the crest and plunged into the liquid valley beyond. The next sea was a much more formidable one, but by luffing the boat just in the nick of time she went through and over it with no worse consequences than the shipping of a dozen or so buckets of water, a mishap to which they were by this time growing quite accustomed, and then there occurred a very decided smooth. "'Brail up the mainsail, boys,' shouted the skipper cheerily and in a second it was done. The helm was put up, the boat's head fell off, and away she went with a rush, broadside on to the sea. With a sickening heave, she rose into the air as the next sea lifted her, and this time, too, a little water came on board, but nothing to speak of. And by the time the next wave caught her, her quarter was fairly turned to it, and she was rushing away before the wind. The foresail was then set, and the mainsail stowed, and everybody sat down to watch the result. The change was certainly for the better, for though a sea still occasionally broke on board, it did so with less violence than before. And most of it now flowed off the deck and overboard again, instead of falling into the body of the boat as before. As soon as the foresail was set, Captain Staunton steered for the pinnace, with the intention of ordering her also to bear up, as well as to inquire whether they had seen either of the other boats. Suddenly, Bob, who was watching the little speck in the distance which showed against the horizon when both launch and pinnace happened to be on the summit of a wave together, caught sight for a single instant of what appeared to him to be an attempt at a signal made on board the ladder. Hello, he exclaimed. What's wrong with the pinnace? They're waving to us, sir. Indeed, said the skipper in a tone of concern. Are you sure, Bob? Here, take the tiller for a moment and let me have a look. Keep her dead before it. "'Aye, aye, sir,' responded Bob, as he changed places with his superior, the latter going forward and steadying himself by the foremast as he watched for the reappearance of the pinnace. Presently he caught sight of her, and caught sight, too, most unmistakably, of a flag, or something doing duty, therefore, being very energetically waved on board. "'You are right, Bob,' he sharply exclaimed. "'They are signaling us. I fervently hope there is nothing wrong with them. Starboard a little,' There, steady so. Keep her at that as long as you can, and only run her off when it is absolutely necessary in order to avoid a breaking sea. In about twenty minutes the launch had reached the pinnace. As the two boats closed, it was seen that all hands on board her were busy bailing, and she appeared to be low in the water. When the launch was near enough for a hail to be heard, Mr. Bowles stood up and, placing his two hands together at his mouth, so as to form an impromptu speaking trumpet, shouted, "'Can you make room for us on board the launch, Captain Staunton? "'We are stove and sinking.' "'Aye, aye,' responded the skipper. "'We will round two and come alongside.' "'He then sprang aft to the tiller, which he seized, "'shouting at the same time. "'To your stations, lads. "'In with the foresail smartly now.' "'The sail was speedily taken in. "'The close-reefed mainsail was set. "'And the moment that the sheet was hauled aft, "'the helm was jammed hard down, "'and the boat brought to the wind.' without wasting a moment to watch for a favorable opportunity. The launch was flying swiftly away from the pinnace, and the latter was sinking. There was therefore no time for watching for opportunities. By the frantic way in which Mr. Bowles resumed his task of bailing the instant that he had communicated his momentous tidings, Captain Staunton saw that the danger on board the pinnace was imminent, and the boat was at once rounded to, shipping in the operation a sea which half filled her. "'Man the buckets, every man of you!' shouted the skipper as the launch, now close-hauled, began slowly to forge ahead in the direction of the devoted pinnace. 
The seas broke heavily against the bows of the boat as they swept furiously down upon her, but Bob and his comrades bailed like madmen, while the skipper handled the little craft like the consummate seaman he was. And between them all they managed to keep her above water. "'Drop your bucket, Bob, and stand by to heave them a line,' presently shouted the captain. Bob sprang forward and seized the end of the long painter which was neatly coiled up and stopped with a rope yarn or two. Whipping open his knife, he quickly severed the stops, and was just arranging the coil in his hand when Captain Staunton cried sharply, "'Heave with a will, Bob! There she goes!' Bob glanced at the pinnace, now some twenty feet distant, just in time to see a heavy sea break fairly on board the waterlogged boat and literally bury her. There was a wild cry from her occupants as they felt the boat sinking under them, and in another instant they were left struggling for their lives in the furious sea. Bob hove the line with all his strength, and with unerring aim into the midst of the little crowd of drowning human beings, and then called for assistance. Some of them he saw had seized it, and he at once began to haul in. The other apprentices with Lance and Rex sprang to his aid, and presently hauled on board Brook and one of the seamen. By this time the launch had crept up to the spot where the pinnace had disappeared, and by reaching out their hands, those on board were able to seize and drag inboard three more of the drowning men. Mr. Bowles's body, however, was seen floating face downwards some five and twenty feet away, and close to it, Mr. Forrester Dale, struggling desperately and uttering wild screams which were every moment changed to choking sobs as the pitiless sea broke relentlessly over his head. It was Bob who first caught sight of these two, and without an instant's pause or hesitation, he sprang headlong from the launch's gunwale, and with a few powerful strokes, reached the struggler. Mr. Dale promptly flung both arms and legs round his would-be deliverer, clasping Bob like a vice, and pinioning him so completely that he was unable to move hand or foot. The result was that both instantly sank beneath the surface. Poor Bob thought for a second or two that his last hour was come, and there, in the depths of that wildly raging sea, he lifted up his whole heart to God in a momentary but earnest prayer for mercy and forgiveness. Doubtless that swift prayer was heard, for as it flashed from his heart, he felt his companion's grip relaxing, and in another instant he had wrenched himself free and was striking strongly upward, with one hand firmly grasping Mr. Forrester Dale by the collar of his coat. Bob rose to the surface within a few feet of Mr. Bowles's still-floating body, and with a violent effort he soon succeeded in reaching it, knowing that, encumbered as he was, he would have to trust the launch to come to him. He could never reach her. As he seized his staunch friend and superior officer by the hair and twisted him over on his back, he heard a wild cheer, instantly followed by a cheery shout of, Look out for the line, Bob! As the shout reached him, the rope came flying over him, striking him sharply in the face. He seized it with his teeth, and then heard the skipper's voice say, Haul in handsomely now, and take care he don't jerk. He has gripped it with his teeth. A very few seconds afterwards, which, however, appeared an age to Bob, and he found himself floating alongside the launch, where he was speedily relieved of his two inanimate charges, and finally dragged on board himself. Half drowned, with about ten feet of water in his hold, as he expressed it, but full of pluck as ever. The first business claiming attention was, of course, that of endeavoring to restore consciousness to the inanimate bodies of Mr. Dale and the chief mate, and this was at length achieved. Mr. Dale was the first to come round, and as soon as he was so far recovered as to be able to speak, he was stowed away in the men's sleeping berth forward, and made as comfortable as circumstances would permit. He lay there, warmly wrapped up, bemoaning for the, a time his hard fate in ever having come to sea, but at length the spirits which had been liberally poured down his throat took effect, and he dropped off to sleep. Mr. Bowles's case was somewhat more serious, he having received a violent blow on the head from some of the floating wreckage, just after the foundering of the pinnace. The blow had inflicted a long scalp wound from which the blood flowed freely, and when he at length revived he seemed quite dazed and light-headed, so that it was impossible to get a coherent reply to any of the questions put to him. He too was at last stowed away forward, and Bob, who was somewhat exhausted by his exertions in the water, and scarcely fit for other work, was detailed to watch by and attend to the two invalids. The launch had, in the meantime, been once more got before the wind, and was again flying to leeward under jib and foresail, the mountain seas pursuing her and necessitating the utmost watchfulness on the part of the helmsman, 
to prevent her from being broached to. As soon as the two invalids had been satisfactorily disposed of, the order for breakfast was given, and after a vast amount of trouble, the meal, consisting of biscuits, fried rashers of bacon, and hot coffee, was served. The company were indebted to the efforts of Rex and Lance for the cooking, they having taken counsel together and come to the conclusion that after a night of such great discomfort, it was absolutely necessary that the females, at least, should be served with a good substantial hot meal, and they had accordingly joined forces in the preparation of the same. Lance seating himself coolly in the bottom of the boat, with the water washing all round him, and balancing the cooking apparatus carefully on his knees, while Rex knelt before him, enacting the part of chief cook. This meal, unromantic as it may sound to say so, was inexpressibly comforting to those weak women and poor little May, all of them having passed a wretched sleepless night, cooped up in the close confined covered in space in the stern of the launch, which, for want of a more appropriate name, has been termed a cabin, with the water in the bottom of the boat surging up round them and wetting them to the skin as the boat tossed on the angry surges, while the continuous breaking of the seas on board filled their souls with dread that the boat could not possibly outlive the gale much longer. When all hands were fairly settled down to the discussion of breakfast, Captain Staunton turned to the carpenter, who had established himself close behind the skipper, and said, Now, Chips, let us hear how the mishap came about whereby you lost the pinnace this morning, but... Before you answer me that question, tell me, do you know anything about the other boats? Well, sir, responded Chips, I can't say as I do rightly, but when day broke this morning and we first missed him, Mr. Bowles, he jumped up and took a good look round, and the first thing he made out were the launch away to windward, hove to. Then he had another good look all round, and presently I see him put his hand up to his eyes and stand looking away down to leeward. Do you see anything, sir? says I. And he says, still with his hand up shading his eyes. I don't know, Chips, says he, but I'm most certain, says he, that one of them boats is there away, pointing with his finger away down to leeward. It's too dark and thick down there to see where he distinctly, he says, but every now and then I keep fancying I can see a small dark spot like a boat's sail showing up in the middle of the haze, says he. And I don't doubt, sir, continued Chips, but what he did see one of them boats, Mr. Bowles has an eye, as we all know, sir, what ain't very often deceived. In which case, remarks the skipper, thinking aloud rather than addressing the carpenter, there can be no doubt that the officer in charge, finding it impossible to face the gale any longer in safety, bore up like ourselves, only a little earlier, and if one of the boats did so, why not the other? And why should they not both be safely scudding before it at this moment, some ten miles or so ahead of us? "'Very true, sir. I don't doubt, but it's just as you say, sir,' responded the carpenter, who was in some uncertainty as to whether he was expected to reply to the skipper's remark or not. "'We will hope so at all events, Chips,' cheerily returned the skipper. "'And now tell me how you managed to get the pinnace stove?' "'Well, sir, the fact is, it were just the doing of that miserable creature, Mr. Dale. Our water were getting low, and yesterday Mr. Bowles ups and puts his on allowance, a pint a day for each man.' Well, I suppose it weren't enough for this here Mr. Dale. He got thirsty during the night and made his way to the water breakers to get a drink on the quiet. And he, he was that sly over it that nobody noticed him. Howsever, like the lubber he is, axing your pardon humbly, sir, for speaking disrespectable of one of your passengers, sir, he lets the dipper slip in between the breakers, and in trying to get it out again he managed to cast off the lashings, two of the breakers struck adrift, and before we could do anything with them, they had started three of the planks, making the boat leak that bad that, as you saw yourself, sir, it were all we could do to keep her above water until you reached us. Captain Staunton made no comment upon this communication, though it is probable that he thought all the more. The loss of the pinnace was, particularly this juncture, a most serious misfortune. For at the very time when, in consequence of the bad weather with which she had to contend, it was of the utmost importance that the launch should be in the best possible trim. She was suddenly encumbered with the additional weight of seven extra men, which, with the twelve persons previously on board, raised her complement to nineteen, and caused her to be inconveniently crowded. Then these additional seven men had to be fed out of the rapidly diminishing stores belonging to the launch, for not an ounce of anything had been saved from the pinnace. 
this rendered it imperatively necessary that all hands should at once be put upon a very short allowance of food and water, a hardship trying enough to the men of the party, but doubly so to the women and poor little May. However, no one murmured or offered the slightest objection to the arrangement, when at midday Captain Staunton explained the state of affairs, and laid before the party his proposal. Except Mr. Dale. That individual, on hearing the proposition, promptly crawled out of his snug shelter, and hastened to remind the skipper that he, the speaker, was an invalid, that his health, already undermined by the privations and exposure which he had been lately called upon to suffer, had been completely broken up, and his nervous system shattered by his recent immersion, that what might be perfectly right and proper treatment for people in a state of robust health, as everybody in the boat, excepting himself, appeared to be, would be followed by the most disastrous consequences if applied to himself, and that finally he begged to remind Captain Staunton that he had duly paid his passage money and, ill or well, should expect to be fully supplied with everything necessary for his comfort. Captain Staunton looked at the objector for some moments in dead silence, being positively stricken dumb with amazement. Then, in accents of the bitterest scorn, he burst out with, "'You despicable wretch! Is it actually possible, sir, that you have no sense whatever of shame? That you are so full of selfishness that there is no room in you for any other feeling? Are you forgetful of the fact, Mr. Dale, that it is to your greed and clumsiness we are indebted for the greatly increased hardships of our situation?' But for you, sir, the pinnace would probably have been still afloat. Yet you are the one who presumes to murmur at the privations of which you are the direct cause. I wish to heaven I had never seen your face. You positively make me feel ashamed of my sex and of my species. That's all very well, sneeringly retorted this contemptible creature. But I didn't come to sea to be bullied by you, so I shall withdraw from your exceedingly objectionable neighborhood. And if ever we reach England, I'll make you smart for your barbarous treatment of me, my good fellow. Saying which, he slunk away back in no very dignified fashion to the most comfortable spot he could find in the bows of the boat, and rolled himself snugly up once more in the shawls and blankets which the women had eagerly given up for his benefit when he was first fished out of the water. End of chapter 8「Chapter 9 of the Pirate Island, a story of the South Pacific by Harry Collinwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9. The Albatross All that day the launch continued to scud before the gale, getting pooped so often that it was the work of two men to keep her free of water. Toward evening Mr. Bowles came aft, reporting himself all a tanto once more, and ready to resume duty. He still looked pale and haggard, but was as keen and determined as ever, and he demurred so vehemently to Captain Staunton's suggestion that he would be all the better for a whole night between the blankets, that the skipper was at last compelled to give in, which he did with, it must be confessed, a feeling of the greatest relief that he now had so trusty a coadjutor to share the watches with him, for since the springing up of the gale the poor fellow had scarcely closed his eyes. The night shut down as dark as a wolf's mouth, to use the skipper's own metaphor, and the chief mate took the first watch, with Bob on the lookout. It must have been somewhere about six bells, or eleven p.m., when the latter was startled by seeing the crest of the sea ahead of him breaking in a cloud of phosphoric foam over some object directly in line with the launch's bow. "'Keep her away, sir!' he yelled. "'Starboard for your life! Starboard hard!' Up went the boat's helm in an instant, and as she dragged heavily on the steep incline of the wave, which had just swept under her, Bob saw floating close past a large mass of tangled wreckage, consisting of a ship's lower mast with the heel of the top mast still in its place, and yards, stays, shrouds, braces, etc. attached. Dark as was the night, there was no difficulty whatever in identifying the character of the wreckage, for it floated in a regular swirl of lambent greenish phosphorescent light. "'Stand by with the boat hook there forward,' shouted Mr. Bowles, "'and see if you can get hold of a rope's end.' If you can, we will anchor to the wreck, and we shall ride the leeward of it, as snug as if we were in the London dock, almost. As he spoke, he skillfully luffed the boat up under the lee of the mass, and Bob, with a vigorous sweep or two of the boat hook, managed to fish up the standing part of the main brace with the block still attached. Through this block he rove the end of the launch's painter, and belayed it on board, thus causing her to ride to the wreckage by a sort of slip line. The other apprentices meanwhile lost no time in taking in and stowing the canvas. 
and in a few minutes the launch was riding at her floating anchor in perfect safety and in comparative comfort, still tossing wildly, it is true, but no longer shipping a drop of water excepting the spray which blew over her from the seas as they broke on the wreckage. Toward noon on the following day the gale broke, and by sunset it had moderated to a strong breeze. On that evening they were blessed with a glimpse of the sun once more, for just before the moment of his setting, the canopy of cloud which had hung overhead for so long broke up, leaving great gaps through which the blue sky could be seen, and revealing the glorious luminary upon the verge of the western horizon, surrounded by a magnificent framework of jagged and tattered clouds, the larger masses of which were of a dull purplish hue, with blotches of crimson here and there, and with edges of the purest gold, while the smaller fragments streamed athwart the sky, lavishly painted with the richest tints of the rainbow. They hung on to the wreckage all that night, the wind being still against them, and the next morning Lance, suspecting that there might be a few fish congregated about the mass of broken spars, as is frequently the case, roused out the lines and managed to hook over a dozen gaudily marked and curiously shaped fish of decent size, the whole of which were devoured with the greatest gusto that day at dinner, notwithstanding the rather repulsive aspect which some of them presented. That night the wind, which had dwindled away to a gentle breeze, changed, and blew once more from the westward, and the sea having also gone down to a great extent, our adventurers cast off from the wreckage which had so opportunely provided them with a shelter from the fury of the gale, and with whole canvas and flowing sheets stood away once more on a north-easterly course. In addition to the delay which the gale had occasioned them, Captain Staunton estimated that they had been driven fully five hundred miles directly out of their course. After a very careful inspection, therefore, of their stock of provisions, the skipper was reluctantly compelled to order a further reduction in the daily allowance of food and water served out. And now the sufferings of those on board the launch commenced in grim earnest. The women, especially, as might be expected, soon began to feel their privations acutely, Buffeted as they had been by the gale, they were completely exhausted, and needed rest and an abundance of nourishing food, rather than to be placed on short commons. They bore their privations, however, with a quiet fortitude which ought to have silenced in shame the querulous complaints and murmurings of Mr. Dale, though it did not. The most distressing part of it all was to hear poor little May Staunton piteously crying for water, "'Cause I'm so very thirsty, Mama," as the dear child explained. She was not old enough to understand the possibility of a state of things wherein food and drink were scarcities, and her reproachful looks at her father when he was obliged to refuse her request almost broke his heart. Not, it must be understood, that she was limited to the same quantity of water as the others. The men, always excepting Mr. Dale, preferred to suffer in a heightened degree the fiery torture of thirst themselves, rather than to see the child suffer and they quietly arranged among themselves to contribute each as much as he felt he could possibly spare of the now precious liquid, as it was daily served out to them, and to store it up in a bottle which was to be May's exclusive property, and the same in the matter of food. It was wholly in vain that the child's father protested against this sacrifice. They were one and all firm and as adamant upon this point, and he, poor man, notwithstanding his anxiety that all should be treated with equal fairness, could not contest their determination with any great strength of will. Was she not his own and only child, for whom he would cheerfully have laid down his life? And how could he urge with any strength a point which would have resulted in a dreadful deprivation and a terrible increase of suffering to the winning and helpless little creature? Therefore he at last contented himself with pouring the whole of his daily allowance of water into May's bottle, and cheerfully submitted for the, her innocent sake, to endure the tortures of the damned. Reader, have you ever experienced the torment of thirst while exposed in an open boat to the blazing rays of the pitiless sun? You have not? Then thank God for it, and earnestly pray that you never may, for none can realize or even faintly imagine the intensity of the suffering but those who have borne it. The women, from whom it was of course impossible to conceal the circumstance that May was receiving more than her own share of food and water, were anxious to follow the example of their male companions by also setting apart a portion of their own allowance for the use of the child. But this was at once decidedly vetoed, yet they were not so easily to be deterred from their generous disposition, and many a sip and many a morsel which could ill be spared did the poor little child receive from their sympathetic and loving hands. After the storm comes the calm, says the proverb, 
and its truth was fully borne out in the present instance. On the fourth day after casting off from the wreckage, the wind began to drop, and by sunset it had fallen so light that the launch had barely steerage way. This was still another misfortune, for if the calm continued, it would seriously delay their progress, and thereby protract their sufferings. Next to a gale of wind, indeed, a calm and its consequent delay was what they had most to dread, for they were in a part of the ocean little frequented by craft of any description, except a stray whaler now and then, and their only reasonable hope of salvation rested upon the possibility of their being able to reach land before starvation and thirst overcame them. Mr. Bowles had the first watch, and Bob was posted at the now all but useless helm. The wind had subsided until it was faint as the breath of a sleeping infant, and the boat's sails flapped gently against the masts as she rode with a scarcely perceptible swinging motion over the long, stately, slow-moving swell which followed her. The vast blue-black dome of the heavens above was devoid of the faintest trace of cloud, and the countless stars which spangled the immeasurable vault beamed down upon the tiny waif with a soft and mellow splendor which was repeated in the dark bosom of the scarcely ruffled ocean, where the reflected starbeams mingled, far down in its mysterious depths, with occasional faint gleams and flashes of pale greenish phosphorescent light. The thin golden crescent of the young moon hung low down in the velvety darkness of the western sky, and a long thin thread of amber radiance streamed from the horizon beneath her toward the boat, becoming more and more wavering and broken up as it neared her, until within some twenty fathoms of the launch it dwindled away to a mere occasional fluttering gleam. A great and solemn silence prevailed, upon which such slight sounds as the flap of the sails, the pattering of the reef points, the creak of the rudder, or the stir of some uneasy sleeper broke with almost painful distinctness. Mr. Bowles drew out his watch, and holding it close to his face, discovered that it was a few minutes past midnight. For the previous half hour he had been sitting on the deck near Bob, with his legs dangling into the little cockpit abaft the stern sheets, and staring in an abstracted fashion astern. As he replaced the watch in his pocket, he glanced once more in that direction, but now his look suddenly grew intense and eager. For a full minute he remained thus. Then he withdrew from its beckets beneath the seat, a long and powerful telescope, which he adjusted and leveled. For another full minute he gazed anxiously through the tube, and then, handing it to Bob to hold, he crept silently forward so as not to disturb the sleeping women, and quietly called the relief watch. "'Well, Mr. Bowles,' said the captain as he rose to his feet, "'what weather have you had? Is there any wind at all?' "'Very little, sir,' answered the chief mate, replying to the last question first. "'Just a cat's paw from the westward bow, and then—but nothing worth speaking about. "'And it's been the same all through the watch. "'I want you to take a squint through the glass before I turn in, sir, "'and to tell me whether I've been dreaming with my eyes open or no.' "'Why, what is it, Bowles? Do you think you've seen anything?' "'Well, yes, I do, sir,' answered the mate. "'But it's so very indistinct in this starlight "'that I don't care to trust my own eyes alone.' "'Without another word, the pair moved aft, "'and when they were fairly settled in the cockpit, "'Mr. Bowles took the glass from Bob "'and put it into the skipper's hand. "'He then looked intently astern for perhaps half a minute "'when he laid his hand on the skipper's arm and said, "'Do you see them two stars, sir, "'about a couple of hands' breadths to the southward of the moon? "'They're about six degrees above the horizon,' and the lower one is the southernmost of the two. It has a reddish gleam, almost like a ship's port light. Yes, replied the skipper, I see them. You mean those, do you not? Pointing to them. Aye, aye, sir, them's the two. Now look at the horizon, just halfway between them, and tell me if you can see anything. The skipper looked long and steadfastly in the desired direction, and at length raised the telescope to his eye. By Jove, Bowles, I believe you are right, he at length exclaimed eagerly. There certainly is a something away there on the horizon, but it is so small and indistinct that I cannot clearly make it out. Do you think it is either of the boats? No, sir, I don't, answered Bowles. If it's anything, it's a ship's royals. If t'was one of the boats, she'd be within some five miles of us for us to be able to see her at all, and at that distance her sail would show out sharp and distinct through the glass. This shows, as you say, so indistinctly that it must be much more than that distance away, and therefore I say that if it's anything, it's a ship's royals. The skipper took another long, steady look through the telescope, and then closing it sharply said, There is undoubtedly something astern of us, Bowles, 
and under the circumstances I think we shall be fully justified in hauling our wind for an hour or two in order to satisfy ourselves as to what it really is. Mr. Bowles fully concurred in this opinion, and the boat was accordingly at once brought to the wind, what little there was of it, on the starboard tack, which brought the object about two points on her weather bow. "'If it is indeed a ship, Bowles,' observed Captain Staunton, when the boat's course had been changed, and the mate was preparing to go below, as he phrased it, "'we have dropped in for a rare piece of luck, for, to tell you the plain truth, I had no hope whatever of falling in with a craft of any description about here. She will be a whaler, of course, but she is a long way north of the usual fishing grounds, isn't she? Well, returned Bowles meditatively, you can never tell where you may fall in with one of them chaps. They follows the fish, you see, sometimes here, sometimes there, just where they think they'll have the best chance. Then I have heard say that sometimes, if they happen to hit upon a particularly likely spot, such as a small uninhabited island, where there's a chance of good sport. They'll put a boat's crew ashore there with boat, harpoons, lines, a stock of provisions, and two or three hundred empty barrels, just to try their luck, like, for a month or so, and go away on a cruise, coming back for them in due time, and often finding them with every barrel full. Perhaps yon craft is up to something of that sort. It may be so, returned Captain Staunton. Indeed, in all probability it is so, if our eyes have not deceived us. At all events, whatever she is, we are pretty sure of a hearty welcome, and even a not over-clean whaler will be a welcome change for all hands, and especially for the ladies, from this boat, particularly now that the provisions are getting low. And I have no doubt I shall be able to make arrangements with the captain to carry us to Valparaiso with as little delay as possible. Aye, aye, returned Bowles. I don't expect there'll be much trouble about that. I only hope we shall be able to get alongside her. I wouldn't stand on too long on this tack if I was you, sir. My opinion is that she's coming this way, and if so, we ought to tack in good time so as not to let her slip past us to windward or across our bows. Good night, sir. The night being so fine and with so little wind, Captain Staunton took the tiller himself and ordered the rest of the watch to lie down again. There was nothing to do, he said, and if he required their assistance, he would call them. Accordingly, in a very short time, he was the only waking individual in the launch, the others were only too glad of the opportunity to forget, as far as possible, their miseries in sleep. It is, of course, scarcely necessary to say that the skipper, as he sat there keeping his lonely watch, fixed his gaze, with scarcely a moment's intermission, on that part of the horizon where the mysterious object had been seen. He allowed a full hour to pass, and then drawing out the glass, applied it to his eye, sweeping the horizon carefully from dead ahead, round to windward. He had not to seek far, for when the tube of the telescope pointed to within about three points of the starboard bow, a small dark blot swept into the field of view. Yes, there it was, quite unmistakably this time, and a single moment's observation of it satisfied the anxious watcher that he saw before him the royals and topgallant sails of a vessel apparently of no very great size. The fact that the stranger's topgallant sails had risen above the horizon within the hour since he had last looked at her was conclusive proof to his mind that the craft was standing toward them, that, in fact, they were approaching each other, though at a very low rate of speed, in consequence of the exceedingly light air of wind that was blowing. Fully satisfied upon this point, he at once put the boat's helm down, and she came slowly and heavily about, the captain easily working the sheets himself. By four bells, Captain Staunton was able to discern, with the naked eye, the shadowy patch of darkness which the stranger's canvas made on the dusky line of the horizon, and when he called Mr. Bowles at eight bells, or four o'clock in the morning, the patch had become darker, larger, and more clearly defined, and it lay about one point before the weather beam of the launch. The telescope was once more called into requisition, and it now showed not only the royals and topgallant sails, but also the topsails of the stranger fairly above the horizon. "'Thank God for that welcome sight!' exclaimed the chief mate, laying down the telescope and reverently lifting his hat from his head. He remained silent a minute or two, and then raising his eyes, allowed his glance to travel all round the horizon and overhead until he had swept the entire expanse of the star-spangled heavens. Then, with a sigh of intense relief, he said, "'We're all right, I do verily believe, sir. There's the craft, plain as mud in a wine-glass, bearing right down upon us, or very nearly so. We've only to stand on as we're going, and we shall cross her track. There's very little wind, it's true, but the trifle that there is is drawing us together.' 
we're nearing each other every minute. And there's no sign of any change of weather, unless it may happen to be that the present light air will die away altogether with sunrise. I fancy I know what you're thinking of, sir. You're half inclined to say, out oars and let's get alongside her as soon as possible. And that's just what I should say, if there was any sign of a breeze springing up. But there ain't. She can't run away from us. And therefore what I say is this. The launch is a heavy boat, and we're all hands of us as weak as cats. She's about six miles off now, and it would knock us all up to pull even that short distance. Whereas if we go on as we are, we shall drop alongside without any trouble by eight bells, or maybe a trifle earlier. And if the wind should die away altogether, it'll be time enough then to see what we can do with the oars. That's exactly the way I have been arguing with myself ever since you called me, Bowles, returned the skipper. It is true that we are all suffering horribly from thirst, and in that way every moment is of value to us. But on the other hand, everybody except our two selves is now asleep and oblivious for the time being of their sufferings. Let them sleep on, say I. The toil of tugging at heavy oars and the excitement of knowing that a sail is at hand would only increase tenfold their sufferings without helping us forward a very great deal. So I think, with you, that we had better let things remain as they are for another hour or two. We can rouse all hands at any moment, should it seem desirable to do so. Now, if you will take the tiller, I will just stretch myself out on the planks here, close at hand. I could not sleep now if the whole world were offered me to do so. Saying which, the skipper suited the action to the word, he and the mate continuing their chat, but carefully pitching their voices in so low a tone that the ladies close at hand should not be disturbed in their slumbers. By and by the sky began to pale in the eastern quarter. The stars quietly twinkled out, one by one. A bright rosy flush appeared, and then uprolled the glorious sun above the horizon. The wind, light all night, had been imperceptibly dying away, and when the sun rose his bright beams flashed upon a sea whose surface was smooth as oil. The launch lost way altogether, and refused any longer to answer her helm. As for the stranger, there she was, just hull down, her snowy canvas gleaming in the brilliant morning sunshine, and so clearly defined that every rippling fold in the sails was distinctly visible as they flapped against the mast to the lazy roll of the vessel over the long, sleepy swell. Now, said Captain Staunton, we'll rouse the steward, make him prepare and serve out a first-rate breakfast to all hands, and then hey for a pull to the ship. This was accordingly done. The breakfast was prepared. No great matter of a meal was it, after all, though the last scrap of provisions and the last drop of water went in its composition. And when it was ready, the cramped and hungry voyagers were roused with the good news that a sail was in sight and the meal placed before them. Frugal as it was, it was a sumptuous banquet compared to their late fare, and the poor famished creatures devoured it ravenously, feeling, when it was finished, that they could have disposed of thrice as much. Perhaps it was just as well that there was no more, in their condition, a moderately full meal even would have proved injurious to them if administered without great caution. But while there was not sufficient to provoke hurtful results, there was just enough to put new life into them, and to temporarily endow them with vigor and strength enough for an hour or two's toil at the oars. The meal over, the oars were eagerly manned, and the men dividing themselves into two gangs, and working in short spells of a quarter of an hour each, the launch was headed straight for the stranger, which having now lost steerage way had swung broadside on and showed herself to be a small brig. I tell you what it is, Bowles, said the captain as he sat at the tiller steering during one of his spells of rest from the oars. We are a great deal further to the westward than I imagined we were. We must be not very far from the outlying islands of that vast archipelago which spreads itself over so many hundreds of leagues of the South Pacific. That fellow is no whaler. Look at his canvas. No smoke stains from the tri-works there. He is a sandalwood trader, or is after beche de mer. I am very glad it is so. It will be much more pleasant for the ladies. And if she is a Yankee, as a good many of these little traders are, the skipper will probably be glad enough to earn a few dollars by running us all across to the mainland. To my mind, remarked Bowles, the craft looks rather too trim and neat aloft for a trader. And look at the hoist of her topsails. Don't you think there is a man of warish appearance about the cut and set of them sails, sir? She certainly does look rather taunt in her spars for a merchantman, returned Captain Staunton. We shall soon see what she really is, however, for she will be hull up in another five minutes, and in another half hour we shall be on board her. Ah, they have made us out. 
There go her colors. Take the glass and see what you can make of them, Bowles. The chief mate took the telescope and leveled it at the brig, taking a long and steady look at her. A ten-gun brig by the look of her, he presently remarked, with the telescope still at his eye. Anyhow, her bulwarks are pierced, and I can see the muzzles of five bulldogs grinning through her starboard portholes. That's the stars and stripes hanging at her peak, as far as I can make out, but it's drooping so dead that I can see nothing but a mingling of red and white, with a small patch of blue next to the halyard block. She's a pretty-looking little thing enough, and her skipper's a thorough seaman, whoever he is. Ay, she's a man-o'-war, sure enough. Up go the courses and down comes the jib, all at once, man-o'-war fashion. And there's clue up royals and t'gallant sails to prevent em from beating themselves to pieces against the spars and rigging. That is, for all the canvas she could set wouldn't give her steerage way, much less cause her to run away from us. She hasn't a pennant aloft, though. Wonder how that is. And the hands on board seem to be a rum-looking lot of chaps, as ever I set eyes on. No more like man o' war's men than we are. Not a single jersey or man o' war collar among em, nor nothing like a uniform aft there. I suppose they're economical, and want to save their regular rig for harbor service. Well, thank God for his mercy in directing us to her, exclaimed the skipper fervently, as he lifted his cap from his head. Our troubles are all over now, ladies, he continued, turning to the women, who were now eagerly watching the brig. The craft is small, but she is plenty big enough to carry us all to Valparaiso, and once there, I think we shall have very little difficulty in getting a passage home. Half an hour more of toilsome tugging at the oars, and the heavy launch ranged up alongside the brig. "'Look out for a rope!' shouted one of the crew, as he sprang upon the rail with a coil of line in his hand. "'Heave!' shouted Bob. The rope was dexterously thrown and caught. The heavy oars were laid in, and as the boat touched the brig's side, a man dressed in a suit of white nankeen, his head sheltered by a broad-brimmed Panama hat, and his rather handsome sun-brown face, half hidden by a thick black beard and mustache, sauntered to the gangway from the position he had occupied abaft the main rigging, and leaning over the bulwarks remarked, "'Morning, strangers. I guess you found it hot work pulling down to us in that heavy boat. Looks to me as though you had had rather bad times lately.' "'Yes,' answered the skipper. "'We were burned out of our ship, the Galatea of London. We have been in the boat a fortnight today, and for the last five days, until this morning, when we consumed the last of our provisions, some of us have never tasted water. "'Well, stranger, that's bad news to tell, but I calculate we can soon put you all right. Here,' he continued, addressing himself to the men, who were peering curiously over the bulwarks at the occupants of the boat. "'Jump down, some of you, and help him up over the side.' There was a hearty laugh at this order, to the intense surprise of our adventurers, but the skipper of the brig was evidently a man who was not to be trifled with. With two strides he was among the jeering crowd of men with a revolver in each hand. "'Now get!' he exclaimed, leveling the pistols, and the men waited for no second bidding. In an instant some half a dozen of them sprang into the boat. The brig's gangway was opened, and the boat's crew were somewhat sullenly assisted up the side of the brig and onto her deck. The black-bearded man met them as they came up the side, and held out his hand to Captain Staunton. "'Morning, stranger,' he repeated. "'I'm powerful glad to see you all.' "'Thank you,' returned the skipper. "'I can assure you we are all at least equally glad to see you, "'and to find ourselves once more with a deck beneath our feet. "'What ship is this, may I ask, "'and by what name shall we call the gentleman "'who has given us so kind a reception?' "'The brig's called the Albatross, "'and my name is Johnson, at your service.' "'You are an American cruiser, I presume?' "'continued Captain Staunton looking first at the beautifully kept decks, and then more doubtfully at the gang of desperadoes who crowded round. Sorter, briefly replied the man who had called himself Johnson, and the reply seemed for some reason to mightily tickle his crew, most of whom burst into a hearty guffaw. Captain Staunton glanced round upon them with such stern surprise that the fellows fell back a pace or two, and the skipper of the brig, first darting a furious glance upon his followers, led the way aft to the cabin, saying, I sort of waited breakfast when I made out through the glass that you were a shipwrecked crew, calculating that probably you'd be glad to find yourselves in front of a good square meal. Your crew will have to make themselves at home in the forecastle, and if my lads don't treat them properly, why they must just knock them down. My people are a trifle arker to deal with at first, but I guess they'll all pull together first rate arter a while. End of chapter 9
Chapter 10 of The Pirate Island, A Story of the South Pacific by Harry Collinwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Captain Johnson explains himself. The cabin of the Albatross was a much larger apartment than one would have expected to find in a craft of her size. It was about 20 feet long and 18 feet broad, occupying the entire width of the ship. The staterooms, of which there were only two, being outside the cabin, at the foot of the companion staircase. The apartment was well lighted and very airy, light and air being admitted not only through the skylight, but also through the stern ports and deadlights fitted into the sides of the ship. The fittings were extremely rich, though somewhat out of harmony with each other, conveying to Captain Staunton's educated eye the idea that they had been collected at odd times from a number of other ships. The rudder case, for example, was enclosed in a piece of elaborate carved and gilded work representing the trunk and branches of a palm tree, but it had apparently been found too large, and the sections had accordingly been cut down to make them fit, the result being that the carving did not match at the junctions. The trunk of the tree had also been cut off rather clumsily at the base, and fitted badly to the cabin floor, while the branches had been cut through in places where the beams crossed the ceiling, and had been nailed on again in such a way as to make them look as though they had been grown through the beams, then again, the cushions to the lockers were of different sizes, colors, and materials, some being of velvet and others of horsehair, and every one of them from one to three sizes too large. The sides of the cabin were divided into panels by carved and gilded pilasters, which exhibited in a very marked degree the same incongruity, the eight pilasters in the cabin exhibiting no less than three different patterns. Some half a dozen pictures, one or two of which were really valuable paintings, were securely hung in the panels, and the stern windows were fitted with handsome lace curtains, much too large for the position which they occupied. Two very handsome swinging lamps, of different designs, were suspended from the beams. A tell-tale compass and a ship's barometer occupied respectively the fore and after ends of the skylight, and the bulkhead which formed the fore end of the cabin was fitted above the sideboard with racks in which reposed six repeating rifles, the panels which were unoccupied by pictures being filled in with trophies of stars and other fanciful devices formed with pistols, daggers, and cutlasses. Such was the apartment to which our adventurers found themselves welcomed. But if the truth must be told, their eyes, notwithstanding their recent meal on board the launch, were chiefly attracted to the cabin table whereon was spread, on a not over-clean tablecloth, an abundant display of plate and a substantial yet appetizing meal to which their host urged them to do full justice, himself setting a good example. For a short time, and while host and guests were taking the keen edge off their appetites, very little was said. At length, however, Captain Johnson looked up, and addressing Captain Staunton, said, "'Well, stranger, as I said before, I'm real glad to see you all. Yours are the first friendly faces I've looked upon for many a long day.' but I guess I'm considerable troubled what to do with you all. You see, our accommodation is sorter limited. There's plenty of room for your men in the foxhole, but here's no less than ten of you, reckoning the pickaninny, bless your dear purty little face. I wish she'd give me a kiss. Four years ago I left just such another on the wharf at New York, kissing her hand to me and waving me goodbye as we cast off our moorings, and I guess I'll never see her sweet face again. At her mother's suggestion, little May slid down off the locker on which she was perched, and somewhat reluctantly went to the man's chair and held up her little mouth for a kiss. Johnson at once bent down, and taking her on his knee, gazed long and eagerly into the bright young face uplifted to his own in childish curiosity. Then he kissed her eagerly three or four times, stroked her curly head tenderly with his great brown hand, and finally burst out, "'See here, my purty little dearie!' If e'er a one of them great rough men on deck there says a bad word to you, or dares to as much as look unkind at you, you tell me, and curse me if— I beg your pardon, strangers. I guess I didn't know just then what I was talking about. Run along, little un, and get your breakfast. The child at once slid down from his knee, and with some little haste returned to her former place by her mother's side, Johnson's gaze following her abstractedly. "'You were speaking about the inconvenience to which our appearance seems likely to put you,' at length suggested Captain Staunton. 
"'I guess not, stranger,' he retorted, pulling himself together as it were with a jerk. "'I was simply pintin' out that our accommodation for passengers is kinder limited, "'and I'm puzzled to know where I can stow you all away. "'The inconvenience will be yourn, stranger, not mine. "'There's reasons, you see, why I should keep possession of my own cabin, "'and there's reasons, too, why the mate should keep possession of his'n. "'I reckon the best plan will be to clear away a place for you down in the afterhold, "'where you must try and make yourselves as comfortable as you can "'for the few days you'll be on board. "'And as for you ladies, I'd sorter advise you to stay below all you can. "'If you must go on deck at all, let it be at night-time, "'when there ain't so much chance of your being seen.' "'Where are you bound, Captain?' inquired the skipper. "'Wall, we are bound now to an island which, as it's not shown on the chart, "'I've christened Albatross Island, arter the brig. "'We're going there to refit,' was the reply." "'Then I presume you have established a sort of depot there?' interrogated Captain Staunton. "'That's just it. You've hit it exactly, stranger,' answered the Yankee. "'And how long will it take you to refit?' was the next question. "'Maybe a week, maybe a month. It just depends upon whether the hands are in a working humor or no.' Captain Staunton raised his eyebrows somewhat at this singular answer. After a moment or two of silence, he said, I presume you would find no difficulty in running us across to, say, Valparaiso, if you were well paid for the service? Cash down? Captain Staunton was about to say yes, having saved from the burning ship a bag of species sufficient in amount to convey the entire party home in perfect comfort. But an idea struck him that it would perhaps be better to promise payment after rather than before the performance of the service, so he said, Well, no, I could not promise that but I would draw on my owners for the amount of our passage money and pay you immediately on our arrival at Valparaiso. Well, I guess I'll have to think it over, remarked Johnson. I must go on deck now, but you can remain here as long as you like. In fact, I reckon you'd better stay here altogether until I can get a place arranged for you below. Saying which, he abruptly rose from the table and went on deck. Rather an unique specimen of the genus Yankee, observed Rex as soon as their host had fairly disappeared. I hope, Captain, you will succeed in persuading him to take us over to the mainland. The skipper was apparently plunged deep in thought, for he made no reply. Does it not strike you, Bowles, that there is something rather peculiar about the craft and her crew? remarked Lance. These Yankees are generally a queer lot, answered the mate nonchalantly, but immediately afterwards he made a sudden and stealthy movement of his fingers to his lips, while the ladies were looking in another direction throwing at the same time an expression of so much caution and mystery into his glance that Lance made no attempt to continue the conversation. Shortly afterwards, Captain Staunton rose from his seat at the table and, touching his chief mate lightly on the shoulder, said, "'Come, Bowles, let us go on deck and see if we can make terms with this Captain Johnson. The rest of you had perhaps better follow that gentleman's advice in the meantime and remain here, since he evidently has some motive for expressing the wish.' As the two were ascending the companion ladder, the skipper turned and whispered hurriedly to his mate, "'What is your opinion of things in general, Bowles?' "'Can't say yet,' answered that individual. "'Looks mighty queer, though. She ain't a man of war, that's certain.' On reaching the deck, they found the after-hatch off, and their host in somewhat hot discussion with the ship's carpenter. "'That is quite sufficient,' they heard him say, without a trace of the Yankee twang in his speech. "'You have your orders, and see that they are executed forthwith.' In this matter I intend to have my own way. The man muttered something in a sullen undertone, and then turned to go forward, saying he would get his tools and set about the job at once. Johnson turned impatiently away from him with an ugly frown upon his brow, which, however, vanished in an instant upon his finding our two friends at his elbow. "'See here, stranger,' he said, passing his arm within that of Captain Staunton, and drawing him toward the hatchway. "'I want to show you what I'm going to do.' See them beams? Well, I'm going to send some hands down below to trim a few of them bales you see there up level with the tops of the beams. Then we'll lay a couple of thicknesses of planking over all, which will make a tolerable floor. And then I'm going to have a sail nailed fore and aft to the deck beams, dividing the space into two, one for the women folks and one for the men. And another sail set athwart ships will make all sorter of snug and private. And I guess you'll have to make yourselves as comfortable as you can down there. You see, the brig's small, and your party's a large one, and I guess that's the best I can do for you. Thank you, said Captain Staunton. 
As far as we men are concerned, we can manage perfectly well down there. But I'm afraid it will be rather a comfortless berth for the ladies, and yet I do not see very well what else can be done, unless indeed we could come to some arrangement by which you and your chief mate could be induced to surrender the cabin altogether for their use. Which we can't, Johnson broke in sharply. I tell you, stranger, it ain't to be done. I reckon I was a fool to let you come aboard here at all. It was seeing that girl of yours that did it, he added, his voice at once softening again. But I guess there's going to be trouble about it yet before all's done. Oh, no, I hope not, returned the skipper. Why should there be trouble? Or with whom? Certainly not with us. Well, I hope not, said Johnson. But I reckon you'll have to do just exactly as I say, strangers, or I tell you I'll not answer for the consequences. Assuredly we will, observed Captain Staunton. And as for the inconvenience, we must put up with it as best we can, and I only hope we shall not be compelled to intrude upon your hospitality for any great length of time. Indeed, you might rid yourself of our presence in a fortnight by running us across to Valparaiso, and I think I could make it worth your while to do so. Johnson turned away and walked thoughtfully fore and aft, with his chin sunk upon his breast, evidently in painful thought, for some ten minutes. Then he rejoined the pair he had left standing at the hatchway and said, See here, strangers. I reckon it's no use to mince matters and go beating about the bush. The thing's got to come out sooner or later, so you may as well know the worst at once. You must give up all notion of going to Valparaiso, because the thing ain't to be done. We're a crew of free traders, rovers, pirates, if that term will make matters more clear to you. And although we've only been cruising in these waters about six months, I guess we've made things too hot here for us to venture into any port but the one we're bound to. There you'll be put ashore, and I calculate you'll have to make yourselves useful at the depot. There's plenty of work to be done there, and not too many to do it, so you'll be valuable there. I won't keep you on board here, because I can see you'd never work with me, or be anything else but an anxiety to me. But there you can't do me any harm. And take my advice, stranger. Don't cut up rough. Go slow and sing small when you get there because my chief mate, who is a Greek and is in charge there, is a powerful short-tempered man and apt to make things downright uncomfortable for them that don't please him. Captain Staunton and Bowles looked each other in the face for a full minute, too much overcome by consternation and dismay to utter a single word. Then the skipper, recovering himself, turned to Johnson, who stood by intently watching them, and said, I thank you, sir, for having come to the point and put our position thus explicitly before us with so little waste of time. Happily, the evil is not yet irreparable. We can never be anything but a source of anxiety and disquietude to you, as you have already admitted. Therefore, I trust you will allow us to return to our boat as we came, by which act we shall relieve you of a very great embarrassment, and at the same time give ourselves a chance, a very slight one, it is true, of arriving at the place we are so anxious to reach." "'Too late, stranger,' replied Johnson. "'Here you are, and here you must now stay. "'Look over the side, and you will see that your boat is no longer there. "'She was stove and cast adrift half an hour ago. "'And even if she had still been alongside, "'do you think my men would let you go now that you have been aboard us and seen our strength? "'I tell you, stranger, that before you could get ten yards from the brig, "'they would bring her broadside to bear upon you "'and send you all to the bottom, riddled with grape, and I couldn't stop them. No, you're here, and I reckon you'll have to stay and make the best of it. You'll find your traps down below there. The lads wanted to overhaul them, but I guess I shamed them out of that. Drawing half out of his pockets a pair of revolvers as he spoke. Are we to consider ourselves as prisoners, then, and to look upon the hold there as our jail? inquired Captain Staunton. That's as you please, retorted Johnson. So long as you keep quiet and don't attempt any tricks, you can come on deck as often as you like. Only don't let the women folks show themselves, or they'll get into trouble. And I, nor you, won't be able to help them. Tell them to stay in the cabin until it's dark tonight, and then when all's quiet, the watch below in their hammocks, and the watch on deck caulking between the guns, just you muffle them up and get them down there as quick as ever you can. And what about the rest of my people, those of them who were sent forward to the forecastle? inquired Captain Staunton. Wall, well, replied Johnson, I felt myself sorter of obliged to clap em in irons down in the forehold. You see, you muster a pretty strong party, and though you could never take the brig from us, I didn't know what you might be tempted to try, when you found out the truth. 
And so, just to prevent accidents, I had the iron slipped onto them. They'll be well treated, though, and if any of them likes to join us, so much the better. We are uncommon short-handed one way and another. If they don't like to join, they'll just be put ashore with you to work at the depot. And see here, stranger, don't you go for to try on any tricks, either here or ashore, or it'll be awful bad for you. This is a friendly warning, mind. I'd like to make friends with you folks, for, to tell you the solid petrified truth, I ain't got one single friend among all hands. The mate hates me and would be glad to put me out of the way uh, and step into my shoes, and he's made the men distrust me. Why not retire from them altogether, then, inquired Captain Staunton. Because I can't, answered Johnson. I'm an outlaw and dare not show my face anywhere in the whole civilized world for fear of being recognized and hanged as a pirate. A decidedly unpleasant position to be in, remarked the skipper. However, if there is any way in which we can lawfully help you, we will do so, in return for which we shall of course expect to be treated well by you. Now, Bowles, he continued, turning to his chief mate, let us talk this matter over and discuss the manner in which this bad news can best be broken to the others. Saying which, with a somewhat cold and formal bow to the pirate, Captain Staunton linked his arm in that of his chief mate and walked away. The two promenaded the deck for nearly an hour, overhauling the concern in all its bearings, as Bowles afterwards described it, and they finally came to the conclusion that it would be only fair to let their companions in misfortune know the worst at once. Then all could take counsel together, and as in a multitude of counselors there is wisdom, some one might possibly hit upon a happy idea whereby they might be enabled to escape from this new strait. They accordingly descended to the cabin, where their reappearance had been anxiously looked for. "'Well, Captain,' exclaimed Dale upon their entrance, "'what news have you for us? Have you made arrangements for our conveyance to Valparaiso? I hope we are not going to be kept cooped up very long in this wretched little vessel.' "'We are to leave her sooner than I anticipated,' replied Captain Staunton. "'but I regret to say that I have been quite unable "'to make any arrangements of a satisfactory character. "'And as to news, I must ask you to prepare yourselves for the worst, "'or almost the worst, that you could possibly hear. "'We are on board a pirate, "'and in the hands of as unscrupulous a set of rascals "'as one could well encounter.' "'The skipper then proceeded to describe in extenso "'his interview with the pirate captain,' throwing out such ideas as presented themselves to him in the course of his narrative, and winding up by pointing out to them that though the situation was serious enough, it was not altogether desperate, the pirate leader being evidently anxious to escape from his present position, and as evidently disposed to look with friendly eyes upon all who might seem to have it in their power to assist him, either directly or indirectly, in the attainment of his purpose. Our first endeavor, he said in conclusion, must be to impress upon this man that, though we are his prisoners, we are still a power, by reason of our numbers as well as of our superior intelligence and knowledge of the world, and that we can certainly help him if we have the opportunity. And this idea, once firmly established in his mind, he will listen to and very possibly fall in with some of our suggestions, all of which, I suppose I need hardly say, must be made with a single eye to our own ultimate escape." Our future is beset by difficulties, very few of which we can even anticipate as yet, but I think if each one will only take a hopeful view of the situation, it will be singular indeed if one or another of us does not hit upon a means of escape. By the time that he had finished speaking, the brains of his hearers were literally teeming with ideas, all that is to say except Mr. Dale, who with elbows on the table, his head buried in his hands, and his hair all rumpled, abandoned himself to despair and to loud bewailings of the unfortunate combination of circumstances which led to his venturing upon the treacherous ocean. The others, however, knew him thoroughly by this time, and none troubled themselves to take the slightest notice of him except Rex Fortescue, who exclaimed, "'Do shut up, Dale, and cease making a fool of yourself. I wonder that you are not ashamed to behave in this unmanly way, especially before ladies, too.' If you can't keep quiet, you know, we shall have to put you on deck, where I fancy you would get something worth howling about. This threat had the desired effect. Mr. Dale subsided into silence, and the rest of the party at once, in low, cautious tones, began an interchange of ideas which lasted a long time, but brought forth no satisfactory result. 
the council finding itself at the close of the discussion pretty much where it was at the commencement. At one o'clock a thoroughly substantial dinner was served to them, followed by tea at six in the evening, at both of which meals the pirate captain did the honors with a manifest desire to evince a friendly disposition toward his guests, and about nine p.m. a quiet and unobtrusive removal from the cabin to their new quarters in the afterhold was effected, after which most of the party disposed themselves comfortably upon the bedding which they found had been provided for them, and enjoyed a night of thoroughly sound repose, such as they had been strangers to ever since the destruction of the Galatea. When our friends awoke on the following morning, they became aware, by the motion of the ship and the sound of the water gurgling along her sides, that a breeze had sprung up. Most of the gentlemen, all of them in fact except Dale, went on deck, and finding the watch busy washing decks, borrowed of them a few buckets with which they gave each other a most hearty and refreshing salt water douche, much to the amusement of the crew. As soon as breakfast was over, Lance, with that cool insouciance characteristic of the man who has so often found himself environed by perils that he ceases to think of them, went again on deck, with the intention of mingling freely with the pirate crew, and, if possible, placing himself upon such easy terms with them as would give him an opportunity of acquiring whatever information it might be in their power to give. The first individual he saw on emerging from the hatchway was Johnson, the pirate captain, who was leaning moodily over the lee rail abaft the main rigging, smoking a well-seasoned pipe. "'Good morning, Captain,' exclaimed Lance genially, as he sauntered up to the man. "'What a delightful morning, and how good your tobacco smells. I have not enjoyed the luxury of a pipe for the last fortnight. Have you any tobacco to spare?' "'Help yourself, stranger,' answered Johnson rather surlily, as he tendered his tobacco pouch. "'Thanks,' said Lance, returning the pouch after he had filled and lighted his pipe. "'Ah, how good this is!' as he took the first whiff or two. "'You have a fine breeze after yesterday's calm, and the brig seems quite a traveller in her small way.' "'In her small way!' exclaimed Johnson indignantly. "'Why, she's a flyer, stranger. That's what she is. I reckon you don't know much about ships, or you wouldn't talk like that. I guess you ain't a sailor, are you?' "'I am a soldier by profession,' answered Lance. But for all that, I am not exactly an unmitigated landlubber. On the contrary, I am quite an enthusiastic yachtsman, and I flatter myself that I know a good model when I see one. And yet you don't take much account of the brig, stranger? She seems a good enough little craft of her kind, admitted Lance, and as a mere trader, I have no doubt she would answer well enough. But it strikes me that, to gentlemen of your profession, a really fast and powerful vessel is an absolute necessity if you would ensure your own safety. In weather like this, I dare say you would manage tolerably well, but if a frigate were by any chance to fall in with you in a fresh breeze, or, worse still, in heavy weather, I fear you would find yourselves in a tight place. She would have you under her guns in less than an hour. That's so, stranger, yes, I reckon that's so, conceded Johnson with evident reluctance. There are ships as can outsail us. I know, for we've fallen in with some half a dozen clippers, and we couldn't do nothing with them. They just walked away from us. And though I don't calculate that there's ever a frigate afloat as could get alongside them tea ships if the tea ships didn't want them to, yet I guess there's frigates as could overhaul us in heavy weather. And so you're a yachtsman, eh? Then I reckon you know something about quick sailing? How fast now do you calculate a yacht would sail in this breeze? That depends entirely upon the build and model of the craft. If she were a racing schooner of, say, the tonnage of this brig, I dare say her speed under such circumstances as these would be thirteen or perhaps fourteen knots. If, however, she were merely a cruising yacht, such as my own, I do not imagine she would average more than eleven. Eleven knots! Josh, I say! Stranger, how many knots do you reckon we are making just now? exclaimed Johnson. Lance looked over the side for a moment, marked a piece of weed floating past, and then answered, about eight, I should think. Certainly not more. I guess you're wrong, stranger, returned the pirate skipper with animation. She's going ten if she's going an inch. You can easily test it by heaving the log, suggested Lance. Aft here, two of you, and heave the log, shouted Johnson. Two men came sauntering aft at the call. The line and glass were prepared, and Johnson himself made ready to test the speed of the brig. Turn, he cried to the man who held the glass. 
as the last of the stray passed out over the taffrail. The glass was smartly turned, the reel spun rapidly round, the marks flew through Johnson's fingers, and his countenance brightened with exultation. Stop! The sand had all run out, and Johnson grasped the line just before the eighth knot reached his hand. Tarnation! You're right, stranger, he angrily exclaimed. Well, I swan I made sure she was going ten at the very least. You skippers very often make that kind of mistake, remarked Lance. Or rather, it is not so much a mistake as a self-deception. You would like your ship to have a speed of ten knots in such weather as this, and the wish is father to the thought. Besides which, having formed an attachment for your ship, you are naturally anxious to give strangers also a favorable impression of her. That's so, stranger. Sure as you're standing there, you've exactly hit it. I knew the craft want doing over eight at the outside, but the way you talked about that yacht of yours sort of put my back up, and I allowed I weren't going to let you have all the big talk to yourself. About this yacht of yours, Colonel, where is she now? Where I left her, no doubt, answered Lance with a smile, safe and sound on the mud of Hassler Creek inside Portsmouth Harbor. I suppose, as she's such a flyer, that one of the crack English builders put her together, inquired Johnson. No, indeed, said Lance. She was built at Weymouth by an ordinary shipbuilder who, for aught I know, had never in his life built a yacht before. I was stationed there at the time, and I designed her myself, and of course superintended her construction. You don't say. Well, I knew that the soldiers did most everything, but I didn't allow that they designed yachts, exclaimed Johnson. Neither do we professionally, admitted Lance, but some of us, of whom I happen to be one, take up the study of naval architecture as an amusement. And those who, like myself, belong to the engineer corps, are to some extent qualified by our technical education to achieve excellence in the art. I can assure you that some of the officers in my corps have turned out exceedingly creditable craft. Well, now, that beats ah, exclaimed Johnson. So you're an engineer and can design yachts into the bargain. Stranger, laying his hand impressively on Lance's arm, I'm real glad I took you all aboard. About this schooner of yours, she is a schooner, I reckon. Lance nodded in affirmative. Well, about this schooner of yours, is she a pretty sea boat? She is as comfortable a vessel as I would ever wish to have under my feet, answered Lance, with just a slight touch of enthusiasm. She will face any weather a frigate would dare to look at, and in a gale of wind, such as once caught us in the Bay of Biscay, is a great deal drier and more comfortable than many frigates would be. Well, now, I call this real interesting, exclaimed Johnson with sparkling eyes, and I suppose she was tolerable weatherly? About the same as other vessels of her class. All yachts, you know, if they are the least worthy to name, go to windward well. It is one of their strong points. Do you think now, Colonel, you could recollect enough to design another yacht, just like your own schooner? asked Johnson eagerly. Well, said Lance slowly, as he first began to perceive the direction in which Johnson's thoughts were tending. I am by no means sure that I could. However, as a brilliant idea dawned upon him, I am certain that, with the experience I have gained since I designed the fleet wing, I could build one which should excel her in all respects. Well, now, this is what I call a real pleasant conversation, exclaimed Johnson with enthusiasm. Now, see here, Colonel, I guess I'll get you to draw out that design right away. I am sure I shall be very pleased, said Lance, but why do you wish for such a thing? You will surely not venture, after what you have already told us, to visit a civilized port and order a vessel to be built? I guess not, stranger. I've three prizes lying in harbor not far off, which I kept, thinking they might come in useful some day, and we'll break them up to build this new craft. You shall superintend the work, and as you're an engineer, I reckon I'll get you to fortify the harbor also, so as to make things secure in case one of them frigates you was talking about should come along and take a fancy to look inside. Very well, said Lance. I will do what I can, both in the matter of fortifying the harbor and building the new craft. Upon the express condition, however, you must understand that we are all treated well as long as we remain with you, and that you will make an early opportunity to free us as soon as the work is done. Don't you be afraid, stranger, returned Johnson. 
You do the best you can for me, and I guess I'll do the right thing by you. That's a bargain. There is just one point which occurs to me, remarked Lance. It is this. To do what you propose, we shall require a great deal of assistance. Now, where are we to find it? If it's men you mean, I reckon you'll find plenty of them at Albatross Island. Men ain't always to be picked up at sea just when they're wanted, said Johnson. So I've took to keeping my prisoners alive and landing them there, so's I can draw upon them when I want to. And I've found that if they won't cut in and take a hand with us exactly to once, they generally will a little later on, just to escape being worked to death ashore. And what about materials, persisted Lance? To construct a battery, and to make it serviceable, you know, stone, lime, iron, and wood in considerable quantities are required, to say nothing of guns, powder, and shot with which to arm the battery when it is finished. We've got it all, exclaimed Johnson. All, that is, except in iron. And that we're very short of. There's stone in the island, and I guess you can make lime from the coral, can't you? And as to the guns and ammunition, why, it's only three months ago that we helped ourselves to a whole battery full belonging to the Spaniards away there on the mainland. Well, said Lance, I cannot, of course, decide exactly how to use your resources to the best advantage until I have seen them and the place. As far, however, as the design of the new ship is concerned, I can set about it at once. I must ask you, however, to release the carpenter and Bob, the apprentice, and to allow them to join us aft. The carpenter is a practical man whose advice and assistance will be most valuable to me. And as for Bob, he has been brought up in a district famous for yacht building and will be sure to prove helpful to us. Very well, Colonel. I reckon you can have him, said Johnson. Only don't you be persuaded to try any tricks on account of having two extra hands, because if you do, I calculate you'll find us always ready. All right, laughed Lance. I'll keep your warning and advice in mind. By the by, before I go below, let me suggest that as a few of us are, like myself, smokers, a pound or so of tobacco now and then would be regarded as a delicate attention on your part. Right you are, Colonel, answered Johnson cordially. You shall have the tobacco and some cigars, too, if you like them. I guess we've got plenty of both on board. So saying, Johnson turned upon his heel and dived below for his sextant. End of chapter 10. Chapter 11 of The Pirate Island, A Story of the South Pacific by Harry Collinwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Johnson hoodwinks a frigate. Left to himself, Lance sauntered aft, glanced first at the binnacle, then at the sails, and finally essayed a conversation with the helmsman. The man proved at first to be exceedingly surly, suspicious, and taciturn, but Lance Evelyn was a man of consummate tact, and his manner was at once so refined and so genial that there were very few who could for any length of time withstand its fascinating influence. In less than half an hour, he had so won upon the man, who was by no means all bad, that everything approaching to reserve had completely vanished, and when Johnson came on deck after working out his sights, he found the strangely assorted pair conversing as freely together as though they had been old shipmates. Lance was very careful to confine his conversation to generalities, and religiously abstained from asking any questions whatever. He quite realized that the party to which he belonged were in a position of great difficulty and danger, their escape from which, if indeed they should ever escape at all, would certainly be a work of time, demanding the utmost caution and patience, and his first endeavor, therefore, was to create a favorable impression rather than to risk suspicion by a too early attempt to acquire information. When Johnson saw the two in conversation, he at once edged his way aft with the evident intention of ascertaining what they were talking about. But although Lance at once noted the movement and made a mental memorandum to the effect that the pirate skipper was clearly a man of suspicious temperament, he gave no outward sign of having observed any such thing, but simply continued the conversation as unrestrainedly as though Johnson had not been there. Lance remained on deck until dinner time, which was 1 p.m. on board the Albatross, when he rejoined his friends below. Well, said he, as he seated himself at the rough deal table, which had been knocked together for their accommodation, I have spent a very pleasant, and I hope, a very profitable morning on deck. Have you? remarked Captain Staunton. I am glad to hear that. We were beginning to wonder what had become of you. What have you been doing? 
merely ingratiating myself with the skipper and the man whose trick it happened to be at the wheel, answered Lance, and I flatter myself that, for a first attempt, I have managed pretty well. I have been obliged to blow my own trumpet a little, it is true, but by a judicious performance upon that instrument, I have succeeded in showing our friend Johnson very clearly that it is in our power to be of the greatest possible service to him, and I have secured an order to build a new ship for him, and to fortify the harbor in which she is to be built. "'To build a new ship for him!' exclaimed Captain Staunton. "'To fortify his harbor!' ejaculated Rex and Brooke together. "'Precisely that, gentlemen,' continued Lance. "'I happened accidentally to touch upon rather a sore point with him "'by disparaging the speed of the brig, "'which he evidently wished to persuade himself was almost matchless. "'Then I gently insinuated to him "'that he would be very awkwardly situated "'if he happened to find himself in the presence of a frigate in heavy weather. "'And finally I mentioned to him in a casual way "'the fact that I had designed and built a yacht of my own "'which could sail round his brig in any weather.' and also that I happen to be, by profession, a military engineer. The results of which are as I have already stated. There is one other result, by the by. I have secured the release of our friend Robert, and also the carpenter. I dare say they will be allowed to join us some time today. Well, remarked Captain Staunton, that is an advantage, certainly. Every man we can secure makes us so much the stronger, and perhaps... If we could get one or two more, something might be done in the second night watch. We might possibly be able to... Take the brig, interrupted Lance with a laugh. Not to be thought of for a single moment, my dear sir. Our friend Johnson is far too suspicious a man, and has too much at stake to give us any such opportunity, if watchfulness on his part can prevent it. Why, he has already anticipated the possibility of such an attempt on our part, and was good enough to caution me that we should always find him ready." Hmm, ejaculated the skipper, meditatively. That is bad news. We have evidently a difficult man to deal with. I have heard it said more than once that the man who can circumvent a Yankee can circumvent the father of mischief himself. But about this shipbuilding and fortification business, do I understand that you regard Johnson's plans in that respect as favorable to us? Because if so, I should be very glad if you would explain." I must admit that at present I can scarcely see how we are likely to derive any advantage from it. Well, remarked Lance, you must understand that at present my plans are of the crudest description. They will require a great deal of maturing before they can be put into successful operation, and in this I anticipate that you will all be able to afford me the greatest assistance. Roughly, however, my idea is this. We must choose, if possible, for the shipbuilding yard a spot which is not only suitable for the purpose, but which will also admit of being effectually defended by the battery which is to be built. We must secure as assistance as many as possible of our own men, and when the ship is built and launched, we must contrive somehow to seize and make our escape in her. This plan will, I admit, involve many months' detention here, but it is the only feasible way of escape which has, so far, presented itself to my mind." and my conversation with Johnson this morning has convinced me that we have nothing to hope for from him. He is glad to have us, and will possibly be civil to us because of our ability to be of service to him, but I can see that he is an unscrupulous rascal who will freely make promises in order to secure our aid and cooperation, and unhesitatingly break them the moment that his ends are served. They were all busily engaged in the discussion of Lance's projects when a hail was heard from aloft. They did not quite catch the words, but the gruff voice of the brig's chief mate, ordering the crew to make sail, caused them to surmise that a ship had just been sighted. The first impulse of the males in the party was to rush on deck, but Captain Staunton immediately resumed his seat again, and requested the others to do so likewise, pointing out that too eager a curiosity on their parts respecting the movements of the brig would possibly only provoke suspicion and resentment against them in the breasts of the pirates and that there would be ample opportunity later on for them to see how matters stood. They accordingly resumed the discussion upon which they had been engaged, but were shortly afterwards interrupted by the appearance of Johnson's steward, who descended the hatchway ladder bearing a couple of boxes of cigars and a dozen sticks of excellent tobacco, with a captain's compliments. This afforded them an excellent opportunity for going on deck in a thoroughly natural way. Those who smoked accordingly cut up a quantity of the tobacco and, filling their pipes, adjourned to the deck in a body for the purpose of enjoying their postprandial smoke, 
Johnson was standing aft near the man at the wheel, with one eye aloft and the other in the binnacle. He looked fierce and excited. He took no notice whatever of the party who had just made their appearance on deck, and his features wore so forbidding an expression that it was at once patent to everybody that the best plan just then would be to leave him entirely alone. The first thing which they noticed was that the brig had been kept away off her former course, and was now running to leeward, with the wind on her quarter. The canvas had been rapidly packed upon her, and she was now slipping very fast through the water, with topgallant, topmast, and lower studding sails set to windward, and all the rest of her canvas fore and aft, as well as square, tugging at her like cart horses. This, as it afterwards appeared, was her favorite point of sailing. That a sail was in sight was perfectly evident, but nothing could be seen of her from the deck, though the horizon was perfectly clear all round. It was therefore rather difficult at first to ascertain her whereabouts. But it did not long remain so, for in about five minutes the mate came on deck with his sextant in his hand, and suspending the instrument very carefully from his neck by a piece of stout marlin, he at once made his way up the main rigging, and finally settled himself comfortably in the cross-trees, facing aft, and bringing the telescope of the sextant at once to bear upon an object which seemed to lie about a couple of points on the lee quarter. The craft in sight must therefore be astern of the brig, and the mate's movements clearly indicated that she was in chase, and that he was very anxious to ascertain which ship gained upon the other. The instrument, apparently after being carefully adjusted, was removed from the mate's eye and suspended from the cross-trees, in such a manner that it should not strike against the mast or any of the rigging with the roll of the ship. And then the observer drew forth a pipe, which he filled and proceeded to smoke with the greatest apparent calmness and contentment. The pipe was at length finished, and then the smoker, with the same deliberation which had characterized his former movements, once more applied the sextant to his eye. "'Well,' shouted Johnson, "'what news of the stranger aloft there?' "'Gaining on us, hand over fist,' was the reply." "'That'll do, then. You may as well come down,' snarled the pirate skipper. "'Your stain perched up there like an owl in an ivy bush won't help us any. "'Come down and make yourself useful, do you hear?' "'Aye, aye,' answered the mate. "'I'm coming, boss.' And he forthwith proceeded to descend the rigging in a careless, nonchalant manner, which evidently drove his superior almost to the verge of frenzy. Half an hour passed, and then there appeared far away on the horizon, on the brig's lee quarter, a tiny white speck which steadily, though imperceptibly, increased in size until the snowy royals of a large ship stood fully revealed. This was about half-past three in the afternoon, at which time the wind showed signs of failing. By half-past four o'clock the stranger had risen her topgallant sails above the horizon, and it could clearly be seen, even with the unaided eye, that she had royal as well as topgallant studding sails set, and there could not be a shadow of doubt that she was after the brig." The spirits of our friends rose to such a high pitch of exultation at this agreeable sight that they found it difficult to conceal their delight when Johnson, abandoning his post near the helmsman, joined them. "'Well, strangers,' he remarked with a grim smile, "'there's a chance for you yet, you see. That's one of them cursed frigates you was talking about this morning, Colonel. But she's a tarnation sight smarter than I gave any of them credit for being. I tell you, Captain,' If this had been the forenoon watch instead of the first dog watch, it would have been all up with this brig. But now I don't feel quite so sort of anxious as I did. I reckon that unless the breeze freshens, which it ain't going to do, it will take that craft till midnight to get alongside of us. And if she can do it then, why she's welcome to the brig and all aboard of her. Curse me if she ain't. See them clouds gathering away there to the nord? That's a thunderstorm working up, but it won't break for some hours yet, I calculate and them clouds is going to do me a good turn before that. I reckon you'll have to make up your minds to go to Albatross Island yet, strangers. And he dived below to his cabin, evidently in an easier state of mind than he had enjoyed an hour before. By six o'clock the frigate's topsails had risen more than half their height above the horizon, and when Lance, Captain Staunton, and Bowles returned to the deck after the evening meal, the waning light just enabled them to see the stranger's lower yards fairly clear of the water. Before they lost sight of her altogether, half her courses had ridden into view. The night closed down very dark, there being no moon, and the sky was entirely overspread with heavy, black, murky-looking thunderclouds, 
which completely hid the stars. The wind, too, had dropped to such an extent that an occasional ominous flap was heard from the canvas aloft, though the brig still slid through the water at the rate of about four knots in the hour. Johnson was in high spirits again. He sat aft near the taffrail, attentively watching the frigate through his night glass long after she had disappeared from the naked eye and when it at last became difficult to make her out even with the aid of the glass, he would lay it down, rub his eyes, take half a dozen turns along the deck, then pick up the glass again and have another spell at it. Finally he turned to the mate, who was standing near him, and tendering the glass, said, There, take a look, Ben, and tell me if you can pick her out. The mate peered long and attentively through the telescope, moving it very slowly about that part of the horizon, where he knew the frigate to be, but without success. "'It's no go, boss,' he said. "'My eyes are pretty good, but they're not good enough to see through such darkness as this.' Johnson chuckled. "'Do you think,' said he, "'it looks any lighter ahead? "'What our sails show against that cloud bank in the wake of the foremast?' "'Not they,' answered the mate confidently. "'Why, it's darker, if anything, ahead than it is astern.' "'That's so,' agreed Johnson with another chuckle. "'Now what,' he continued, what do you think was the last thing the skipper of that frigate did before the darkness closed down? Well, said the mate, if he knew his business, I should say he would take our bearings. And you may take your oath that's exactly what he did, returned Johnson. Now, take a look round and tell me what you think of the weather. The weather? repeated the mate. Why, a child almost could tell what the weather's going to be. We're going to have thunder, which will bring a northerly breeze along with it while it lasts. "'Capital!' exclaimed Johnson. "'Do you think now that the captain of that man-o'-war astern "'is of the same opinion as you and I are about the weather?' "'He's certain to be if he's a seaman,' was the reply. "'Now, once more,' proceeded Johnson. "'Supposing you thought of giving the frigate the slip, "'as we might very easily do in this dark night, "'what course would you steer?' "'I should steer to the nord,' answered the mate, "'so as to be windward of the change when it comes.' I knew it, exclaimed Johnson delightedly. I was dead certain of it. Now we're going to give that frigate the slip by steering to the southard, because her skipper will argue as you do. And when he finds he's lost the run of us, he'll haul up to the nord directly. Now, just pass the word for the carpenter to bring along that water cask I ordered him to rig up this afternoon. The word was passed, and in a minute or two, three men came aft bearing what appeared to be a water cask with a pole passed down through the bunghole and right out through the other side, about six feet of the pole projecting on each side of the cask. To one end of this pole was lashed a short, light batten, and to the other end the men now proceeded to secure a small pig of iron ballast. This done, the hole was launched overboard from the taffrail, the cask floating bung up, with half the pole and the light batten standing perpendicularly above it like a mast. To the upper end of this batten was lashed an old horn lantern, with a lighted candle in it, after which the whole apparatus was suffered to go adrift. Now, in stunsels, and brace sharp up on the port tack, ordered Johnson. This was soon done, and the brig, now feeling the full strength of what little wind there was, seemed to slip along through the water quite as fast as before. Johnson looked away out over the weather quarter to where the beacon lantern glimmered in the intense darkness. There, said he, that'll perhaps help to mislead him a bit. They'll take it for our binnacle light, and they'll keep straight on till they run over it. Then, finding we've played them a trick, they'll haul straight up to the Nord, thinking we've gone that way too, and we shall soon be out of sight of one another. Johnson kept his gaze intently fixed upon the tiny light as long as it remained visible to the naked eye, and when it could no longer be seen in that fashion, he deliberately set himself to watch it through his night glass. More than an hour had elapsed since the cask had been sent adrift, before he manifested any signs of emotion, but at length he began to chuckle audibly. "'Now they're nearing it,' he murmured, with his eye glued to the tube. "'I can see the craft clearly now. They've cast loose the guns and opened the ports. I can see the light of the lantern shining through them. She's creeping up to it pretty fast. But I guess we've walked away from it quite a considerable distance, too. There, now they've run aboard of that tarnation old water barrel. They know what tis by this time.' and I reckon the skipper of that frigate is ripping and tearing and cussing and going on till the air smells of brimstone for a quarter of a mile all round. Ah, just as I expected. They've hauled up to the Nord. Her stern's toward us, 
for I can see the light shining out of her cabin windows. And now every minute will take us further apart. Wall, I'm glad I thought of laying for them with that old lantern. It'll sort of tell them that we're having a good laugh at them, won't it, Colonel? Turning to our friends and addressing Lance in high good humor. Doubtless you have succeeded in greatly provoking them, if that was your object, replied Lance. But if I were in your place, I don't think I should feel quite easy in my mind yet. If that thunderstorm which has been brewing for so long were to break, as it may do at any moment, the flash of the lightning would be certain to reveal your whereabouts to them. I reckon we'll have to take our chance of that, remarked Johnson in a more sober tone. But let it keep dark half an hour longer, and I don't care how much it lightens after that. Ah, tarnation, look at that! This last ejaculation was provoked by the sudden illumination of the northern heavens by a brilliant flash of sheet lightning, which revealed not only every detail of the vast bank of murky clouds which lay heaped up, as it were, upon the horizon, but also distinctly showed the frigate on its very verge, still holding steadily northward, her hull and sails standing out sharply like a block of ebony against the faint bluish gleam of the electric light. Another flash soon followed, then another and another, the flashes following each other with increasing rapidity, to Johnson's manifest discomfiture. But, though he was evidently unaware of it, the brig was so far perfectly safe from discovery, for the lightning continued to flash up only in the northern quarter, leaving the remainder of the horizon veiled in impenetrable darkness, so that, though the frigate was distinctly revealed to the brig, the brig was completely hidden from the frigate. The lightning, however, though it had not yet shown the brig's whereabouts, had enabled those on board the frigate to ascertain that she was not ahead of them, as they had supposed. For when the next flash came, the man of war was seen nearly broadside on to the brig, and heading about southwest, her captain having evidently come to the conclusion that the albatross, after setting her lure, had doubled back like a hare upon her former course. Johnson waited until another flash came, revealing the frigate still upon the same course, and then he gave orders for his vessel to be kept away, steering this time to the southward and eastward, or about at right angles to the course of the frigate. Ten minutes later, the latter was hull down. "'Now we're safe,' ejaculated the pirate skipper delightedly. "'Clue up and furl everything, lads, and be smart about it. For in another five minutes, we'll have the lightning flashing all round us. But under bare poles, I guess it'll take sharp eyes to pick us out.' "'Well, Colonel,' he remarked to Lance shortly afterwards, I reckon that was a narrow squeak for us, that was. If I'd been fool enough to go to the Nord, they'd have had us for sure. That's a right smart frigate, that is, and I guess she's a Yankee. You Britishers don't build such smart boats as that. After this, I'm bound more than ever to have that schooner you promised to build for me, for I don't mind owning up that I began to feel scared a bit when I saw how we was being catched up. Do you think now, Colonel, you could build a schooner that would have walked away from that frigate? "'Oh, dear, yes,' answered Lance. "'I am quite sure I could. "'Only, remember, I must not be interfered with in any way. "'I cannot have people troubling me with suggestions, "'or, worse still, insisting upon my grafting their ideas onto my own. "'The ship must be exclusively my own design. "'And then I can promise you we will turn out a craft capable, if need be, "'of running away from the fastest frigate that ever was launched.' "'All right, Colonel. Don't you trouble about that,' was the reply. "'Only say what you want.' and it shall be done. And if anybody tries to interfere with you, just point him out to me, that's all. Very well, returned Lance. Then I shall consider that a bargain. And now I will wish you good night, as I think there will be rain shortly, and I have no particular fancy for a drenching unless it comes in the way of duty. The following morning dawned bright and fair. The thunderstorm of the preceding night, having broken and raged furiously for a couple of hours soon after our friends left the deck, and then cleared completely away. When Captain Staunton went on deck, he found a fine breeze blowing once more from the westward, and the brig dashing along at a slashing pace under topgallant sails, with her nose pointing to the northward. The air was clear and transparent. Not a cloud flecked the deep blue of the sky overhead, and a man who had shinned aloft at Johnson's orders as far as the main truck was just in the act of reporting that there was nothing anywhere in sight so that any lingering hopes which Captain Staunton may have entertained as to the possibility of the frigate rediscovering them were speedily dashed to the ground. The fine weather lasted, and three days afterwards, about two o'clock in the afternoon, 
the lookout aloft reported, Land ho! Right ahead! What is it like? hailed Johnson from his seat on the skylight. It's lookout peak, sir. I can make out the shape of it quite well. That's all right, returned Johnson. Stay where you are and let me know if you see anything like a signal. In a couple of hours more, the land was distinctly visible from the deck, the peak spoken of as Lookout Peak, appearing first, and then the land on each side of it, rising gradually above the ocean's brim until it lay stretched along the horizon for a length of some half a dozen miles. As they drew in towards the island, our friends, all of whom excepting the ladies, were on deck, half expected to be sent below in order that they might not become acquainted with the navigation of the harbor entrance. But this idea did not appear to have presented itself to Johnson, who, on the contrary, joined the group and began chatting with them in what was evidently meant to be understood as an affable manner. When they had approached within a mile of the place, the pirate skipper turned to Lance and asked him what he thought of the harbor and whether he believed he could make it tolerably safe with a dozen guns or so. Harbor, answered Lance, I see no harbor, no sign even of one on that part of the coast which we are now approaching. I can distinguish nothing but a rocky shore, against which the surf is breaking heavily enough to dash to pieces the strongest ship that was ever built. Perhaps the harbor lies somewhere beyond that low rocky point which forms the western extremity of the island? But if so, why not steer directly for it? The entrance to the harbor is exactly in line with our jib boom end just now, explained Johnson in high good humor but I guess you would never know it unless you was told, would you, Colonel? That indeed I should not, answered Lance, and even now I scarcely know how to believe you. Lance might well say so, for the whole coastline in front of them presented an apparently unbroken face of rocky cliffs of various heights, from about thirty to two hundred feet, backed by grassy slopes thickly dotted with dense clumps of trees of various kinds, many of which glowed with the most brilliant tints from the flowers with which they were loaded. Immediately ahead, where Johnson had said the entrance to the harbor lay, a great irregular mass of low jagged rocks projected slightly beyond the general face line of the cliffs, and behind it was a gap which had the appearance of being caused by the projecting mass of rock having at some remote period broken away and slipped into the sea. The brig, however, continued to stand on boldly, and when she had arrived within about three cables' lengths of the shore, it became apparent that the large mass of rock ahead, or rather on the lee bow by this time, the brig having luffed a trifle, was entirely detached from the island, leaving a narrow channel of water between it and the cliffs behind it. But it was not until the brig had actually borne away to enter this channel that the entrance to the harbor revealed itself. Then, indeed, it was seen that the cliff behind, instead of preserving an unbroken face, curved inwards in the form of a cove, the eastern and western arms of which consisted of two projecting reefs, jutting out toward the mass of rock in front of them, which in its turn now revealed its true shape, which was that of a crescent, the horns of which overlapped the two projecting reefs, forming the eastern and western sides of the harbor entrance, and acted as a perfect natural breakwater, effectually protecting the harbor itself in all weathers. Winding her way through the short, narrow channel between the rock and the cliffs, the brig hauled sharply round the western point and shot into the cove or harbor itself, which consisted of an irregularly shaped expanse of water some 200 acres in extent. At the entrance, the rocks on both sides sloped steeply down into the deep blue water, but further in, they were fringed along their bases by a beautiful white sandy beach, which widened as it approached the bottom of the bay. The land on each side sloping more gradually down to the water, and finally spreading out, where the water ceased, into a broad and lovely valley which stretched inland some three miles, rising gradually as it receded until it became lost among a group of hills which formed the background of the picture. At anchor in the bay were three hulks, no doubt the three prizes spoken of by Johnson as destined to be broken up for the building of the new craft, and on the grassy plateau at the bottom of the bay and close to the beach stood two large buildings, and some half a dozen smaller ones, all constructed of wood. Behind these, a plot of ground, some two acres in extent, was fenced in to form a garden, and a very fruitful one it proved too, if one might judge by the luxuriant growth apparent in its various products. Corn of two or three kinds waved on the eastern slopes. Half a dozen head of cattle, and perhaps a couple of dozen sheep, grazed on the opposite side of the valley. 
Coconuts reared their tall, slender stems and waved their feathery branches by hundreds. And behind them again, as the ground sloped gently upward, it became more and more densely covered with palm, banana, and plantain groves, thickly interspersed with various trees, some of considerable size and dense foliage, among which brilliant orchids and gaudy parasites of the gayest hues entwined themselves to the very summits. A light gig shot alongside the brig as her anchor was let go, and a tall, swarthy man with the unmistakable classic features of a Greek stepped on board. He would have been a strikingly handsome man, but for the expression of cunning and cruelty which glittered in his keen black eyes. "'Well, Capitan,' said he to Johnson, as he joined this pirate skipper, "'so you have returned once more, and with a full hold, I hope. The people began to think you were gone for good. You have been away so long time.' "'Yes,' returned Johnson. "'Back again, Alec, like a bad penny. And we've not brought so very much with us, either.' but the little we have will be useful, I dare say. The brig don't seem to sail so well as she used to, and we fell in with over half a dozen fine craft that we couldn't get near. They just walked away from us like we was at anchor. We've come in now to give the old hooker an overhaul. She wants it badly enough, and then I think I shall try my luck further to the eastward, away on to other side of the Cape altogether. But if we haven't brought a whole shipload of plunder, I guess we've brought what's most as good." We picked up a boatload of shipwrecked people, and among them there's one, that tall soldier-looking chap over there on the larboard side of the skylight, who says he can fortify the place for us and build us out of these old hulks, a craft that'll beat anything we're likely to meet, excepting perhaps steamers. Says, ejaculated the Greek contemptuously. Aye, and he can do it too, remarked Johnson. He's one of them English soldiers who does all the battery building and fortifying business and he has a yacht which he designed himself, and which sails so fast that he didn't think the brig's sailing amounted to shucks. I tell you, Alec, the way he talked about that yacht just set me along and it did. Sure as you're there. Now, I'm going to leave him here with you when I sail next time. They'll fortify the harbor so's it'll be safe if any of them sneaking men of war comes prying about. And we was as near took by one of them a few nights ago, as near as near, and they'll build us a regular flyer of a schooner on condition that they're properly treated. So as long as the work's bout, I want you to act amiable to them. And after we've got all the help out of them that we want, I don't care what comes to them. They've got some women with them, worse luck, and they seem mighty particular about them, so I hope you'll see that the gals don't come to any harm. You see, Alec, my boy, we must be civil to them if we want them to do their best for us. But after they've done their work, you can have your own way with the whole lot. The Greek, whose name, by the way, was Alessandro Raleigh, listened to his chief in sullen silence, and when Johnson had finished speaking, beckoned him to follow him down into the cabin. These worthies had been standing during this short conversation just at the foot of the main mast, and seemed to be either oblivious of or indifferent to the fact that a seaman was just over their heads stowing the driver, and near enough to hear every word that passed. The individual referred to had been taking his time, a good deal of it, too, over his task, but no sooner were the skipper and the Greek fairly out of sight down the companion than, with a few dexterous movements, he rapidly passed the last turns of the lashing and slid down on deck. It was our old friend Bob. End of chapter 11《Chapter Twelve of the Pirate Island: A Story of the South Pacific by Harry Collinwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.》On Albatross Island. On the following morning, all hands on board the brig were stirring early, and, assisted by a strong party from the shore, first moved the vessel down to the bottom of the bay until she took the ground on a beautiful level sandy bottom, and then began to discharge her. Her cargo comprised a most extraordinary collection of heterogeneous articles, including three pianofortes, two of which were in packing cases, whilst the other had evidently been taken from a ship's cabin, several cases of arms, a large quantity of powder and lead, bales of silk, a few kegs of Spanish dollars, fifty ingots of gold and as many of silver, several cases of machinery, a large boiler in sections, an immense quantity of provisions of various kinds, ten brass nine-pounder guns taken out of a Spanish ship, several boxes of clothing, and a large quantity of new rope, bolts of canvas, sails, 
which from their size had evidently never been made for the brig, cases of furniture, etc., etc. These articles were all landed in boats, and conveyed with more or less difficulty up to one of the large buildings before mentioned, and there housed. There was great jubilation among the men at the sight of so rich a cargo. Raleigh, the Greek, quite laying aside his former moroseness of manner and exhibiting an almost childish delight at the sight of the bullion and the kegs of dollars. The men worked hard all day, and by sunset more than half the brig's cargo was on shore. It was not difficult, however, to detect that among these men there were a few, perhaps a dozen, who took no interest in their labor, manifesting very little curiosity as to the nature of the articles which they were handling, and working solely because they had no other choice. These our friends rightly conjectured to be prisoners who had not chosen to cast in their lot with the pirates. Early in the day that portion of the party from the Galatea, in which we are more immediately interested, had been conveyed on shore under Johnson's own protection, and taken up to one of the smaller buildings which stood on the beach, with the intimation that they were at liberty to occupy it. It was a small two-story building constructed of wood, the upper floor being reached through a trap door which was led up to by a wooden stepladder. This floor, like the one below, consisted of a single room and was lighted by two windows, one at each end, the two longer walls of the room being fitted with three tiers of bunks similar to those found on board ship. The ground floor was fitted up with a fireplace, shelves all round the room, a rough deal table, and two long benches, and had evidently been used as a general living room. The place was wretchedly dirty, and on being inducted into it, the first act of the men was to procure an abundance of soap and water, and set vigorously to work to give it a thorough cleansing. This occupied them all the morning. At noon a bell rang, which was the signal for all hands to knock off work and get their dinner. The messman of each gang going to the galley, a small building near the store, and drawing from the cook a sufficient quantity of food for the party to which he belonged. Bob, who with the carpenter had been duly liberated according to promise, cheerfully took upon himself the duties of messman for the party to which he belonged, and presenting himself with the others, he obtained without difficulty the wherewithal to set before our friends a very respectable meal. While they were at dinner, Lance tore a leaf out of his pocket book and jotted down the various articles, such as bedding, crockery, and utensils of various kinds which they required, and on the completion of the list he hurried away with it to Johnson, who at once wrote at its foot an order to the storekeeper for the issue of the articles named. These were soon conveyed to the hut, and by sunset they had the place in very tolerable order. Now that they were on shore, however, they felt that the time had arrived when a little more privacy could be enjoyed by the ladies of the party. So a few boards were obtained, and with them a partition knocked up, dividing the upper room into two equal parts, the half which was approached through the trap-door being devoted to the ladies, while the men obtained access to their sleeping apartment by means of a ladder and the open window, the ladder being drawn up into the room at night. At six o'clock the bell rang again, upon which all hands knocked off work for the day, and after half an hour devoted to cleaning up, etc., tea, or supper as most of the men termed it, was served. On this particular evening, however, there was a slight deviation from the usual order of procedure, the messmen being detained at the galley until all were present, instead of being served and dispatched in the order of their arrival. When Johnson made his appearance on the scene and announced that the kegs of dollars landed that day from the brig would be distributed in the capstan house that evening at eight o'clock, and that any of the prisoners not yet belonging to the Brotherhood, who choose to present themselves there at that hour, and would sign the bond of brotherhood, would be entitled to an equal share of the spoil. Bob duly mentioned this item of information on his arrival with the viands, and it was at once decided that, as all the pirates would thus be engaged for some time, advantage should be taken of so favorable an opportunity to give the ladies a little fresh air and exercise. They waited until all the pirates appeared to have betaken themselves to the capstan house, and then sallied out in a body upon an exploring expedition up the valley. It was a lovely night, as light as day, the full moon riding high overhead in an unclouded sky, and so flooding the heavens with her silvery light that only a few stars of the first magnitude were visible. There was very little wind, and a heavy dew was falling, but that, after the hardship of exposure in an open boat, 
was a trifle so insignificant that it attracted no one's attention. The walk was a most enjoyable one to all, but it was especially delightful to three couples who early paired off together, and in a quiet, unostentatious fashion dropped into the rear. Captain and Mrs. Staunton had naturally much to say to each other upon matters interesting only to themselves, while as for Violet and Rex, Blanche and Lance, this was their first opportunity for an exchange of these sweet nothings in which lovers delight since the eventful evening on which they had been driven out by the flames from the unfortunate Galatea. Tempted by the beauty of the night, they strayed a long distance, and when at length they returned to the hut, weary with the unaccustomed exercise, but happier than they had been for a long time, the settlement was wrapped in the silence of repose. On the following morning, immediately after breakfast, Johnson presented himself with the request that Lance, Captain Staunton, and the carpenter would accompany him on a visit to the prizes, for the purpose of deciding which of them should be broken up to build the new schooner. Two of these vessels were barks, and one a full-rigged ship. The ship was teak-built, and an unmistakable East Indiaman. While of the barks, one was oak-built and copper-fastened, and the other a soft wood vessel put together with iron. The oak-built ship was nearly new. The copper which covered her bottom up to the bends had not a wrinkle on its entire surface, and her deck planking showed no signs of wear, but she was modeled for carrying rather than for speed. It was therefore decided without much hesitation that she should be the one to be broken up. The next point to be settled was the position of the building yard. Lance had given this matter a great deal of quiet consideration, and had come to the conclusion that for many reasons it would be better to have the yard as far away as possible from the rest of the settlement. One consideration which greatly weighed with him being the possibility that their best chance of escape might be in launching the schooner on the quiet during the night and taking her from the stocks direct to sea. Johnson had already made up his mind that the best site for the stocks would be on the sandy beach immediately in front of the capstan house, and there was a great deal to be said in favor of this, a carpenter shop being already in existence close to the spot, and all the cordage and tackle of every description being stored in the capstan house. But this did not at all chime in with Lance's plans, so he merely remarked that it would do well enough if no better place could be found but that the flatness of the ground and the consequent shoal water at that spot would prove serious difficulties in the way of launching, and that it would be advisable before deciding to give the entire shore of the bay a very careful examination. Some hours were accordingly spent in this work, and a site was at last fixed upon in a locality thoroughly favorable to Lance's secret wishes. This was a small indentation in the harbor face of the breakwater rock which marked the entrance to the bay. This indentation was about an acre and a half in extent, with a smooth rocky floor sloping down into the water at an inclination of just the right gradient for the launching ways. It is true it was a long way away from the settlement, but Lance's arguments in favor of adopting it were so convincing that Johnson was fain to give way, which he at last did with a very good grace. This matter settled, Lance intimated that he should like to devote a little more time to the examination of the rock, as it appeared to him that here was the proper place to construct the battery which was to defend the harbor. They accordingly climbed with great difficulty to the highest point of the rock, which was immediately behind or to seaward of the future shipyard, and which had an elevation of nearly a hundred feet above the sea level. The top of the rock was very irregular in shape, but Lance soon saw that a few charges of powder judiciously placed would give them a nearly circular platform of about sixty feet diameter, which would be ample space for such a battery as he proposed to construct. His first idea had been to evade the construction of this battery altogether if possible, but a little reflection had shown him that a time might come when its existence would be of the utmost importance to themselves, and he therefore decided to go on with the work. He accordingly pointed out to Johnson the strength of the position they occupied, the complete command over the harbor entrance which a battery would have at that point and the effective defense it would constitute to the new shipyard, and the pirate was speedily convinced of the soundness of Lance's views. These points settled, the party returned to the bottom of the bay, and Johnson then invited Lance to present himself at eight o'clock that evening in the capstan house, there to submit his plans for the new schooner to a committee of the pirates for approval. The drawings were in fact scarcely ready, 
but by working hard for the remainder of the day, not only were they completed, but the carpenter had also prepared a half-model of the hull by the hour at which the committee was to meet, and, armed with these, Lance, Captain Staunton, and the carpenter duly presented themselves at the capstan house at eight o'clock. They were met at the door by Johnson, who conducted them up a step-ladder into an apartment in the first floor of the building. It was a room about sixty feet long by forty feet broad, and was apparently used as a sort of general assembly room, being fitted up with rows of benches from the door right up to a platform at the further end. On this platform there stood, upon the present occasion, a large table lighted by a pair of handsome lamps, and surrounded by a dozen chairs, some of which were already occupied when Lance and his companions entered. Our friends quietly seated themselves, Lance on one side of Johnson, Captain Staunton on the other, with the trusty carpenter next to him. Johnson then ordered the bell to be rung to summon the laggards, and in a few minutes afterwards the entire committee, some eight men in all, had assembled. Johnson then rose to address the party. He remarked that they were already aware of the purpose for which they had been summoned, namely to inspect the plans of a new schooner which he proposed to have built, but he had been led to understand that doubts had been expressed in certain quarters. Here he glanced at Raleigh. As to the necessity for such a proceeding, and he had therefore invited them there to meet him in order that he may lay before them his views upon the matter and answer such questions as any of them might wish to put to him. He then cited several unsuccessful chases in which he had engaged, as well as his recent narrow escape from the frigate, as evidence in support of his assertion that not only their profit but their actual safety depended upon their becoming possessed of a much faster vessel than the albatross as speedily as might be, winding up his speech by requesting that each man present would give the committee the benefit of his views on the matter in hand. A somewhat excited debate then ensued, Raleigh making himself especially conspicuous by his opposition to Johnson. But in the end the latter succeeded in carrying his point, and the construction of the vessel was definitely decided upon. Lance was then called upon to submit his drawings for inspection, which he forthwith did, explaining at the same time the peculiarities of the design. The vessel he proposed to build was to have a broad, shallow hull, with a very deep keel, and her water lines were simply faultless. There was a considerable difference of opinion as to the desirability of having a vessel of that type, but Lance, who was anxious above all things to build a craft which would carry his party safely, comfortably, and speedily home, provided they should be so fortunate as to obtain possession of her, ably combated all adverse criticism, in which he was ably seconded by Johnson, who seemed greatly taken with the design, and in the end they had their own way. This important point being settled, the meeting broke up, and on the following morning the first step was taken toward carrying the work into execution. The vessel which had been selected for breaking up was unmoored and brought close in to the shore abreast the capstan house, where she was anchored. A strong party was then told off for the purpose of loading her, under the joint superintendence of Lance, Johnson, Captain Staunton, and the carpenter of the Galatea, who went by the name of Kit, short for Christopher. Lance requisitioned the stores of the pirates with the utmost freedom, taking everything he thought likely to be in the least degree useful, and in this way three days were consumed. On the fourth day the hulk was once more unmoored, and with three boats ahead, towed to the rock at the mouth of the harbor and grounded upon it. The work of landing the stores and materials then commenced, and when these had all been conveyed safely ashore, the erection of workshops, etc., was begun. And it was at this period that Johnson began to realize for the first time how valuable an acquisition to his band he had gained in the persons of Lance, Rex, Brooke, and Kit. The three first were quite in their element when it came to the designing and erecting of the various buildings and of the battery, which was at the same time commenced. Whilst Kit displayed an amount of intelligence in the carrying out of their instructions, which was beyond all praise. Johnson chuckled with inward satisfaction and made certain secret resolves, but he said nothing. Meanwhile, the albatross had been careened, her copper stripped off where necessary, and replaced after caulking the planking underneath. The copper had been scoured all over, down to the very keel, until it shone like gold. The top sides had been caulked, then the deck, the hull repainted inside and out, 
and when the buildings at the new dockyard were about being begun, the spars, sails, and rigging of the brig were in process of undergoing a thorough overhaul. It looked very much as though the albatross would be ready for sea in another fortnight at the outside, while Lance estimated that, with the strength then at his command, it would be at least a month before the keel of the schooner could possibly be laid. Now Johnson had set his heart upon seeing this done before he sailed. When therefore he found that it would be quite impossible unless he strongly augmented Lance's working party, he took half the men working upon the brig and turned them over to the dockyard gang, with the result that the work on the brig was retarded while that at the shipyard was expedited so greatly as to ensure the gratification of his wish. So eager was he to hasten on the building of the schooner that he even proposed the abandonment of the old settlement at the bottom of the bay, and the establishment of a new one on the rock itself. This, however, by no means suited Lance's views. It would be manifestly impossible to launch and make off with the schooner if they were to be environed by a gang of men, every one of whom would be sure to regard the newcomers with more or less of suspicion and distrust. So Lance threw out a few mysterious hints about secret passages and hidden chambers beneath the battery and in the heart of the rocks, which for Johnson's own individual sake it would be wise to keep from the knowledge of all but those actually engaged in constructing them. And by this means he managed to avert the threatened transfer. The thought occurred to him that possibly the Galatea party might be more safe if quartered upon the rock, and thus entirely separated from the pirates. But on reconsidering the question and talking it over with the others, the conclusion arrived at was that the rock was an exposed and sterile spot for a habitation, in addition to which it possessed other disadvantages, and that perhaps, for the present, it would be better not to propose it. At length the eventful day arrived on which the ceremony of laying the keel of the new schooner was to be performed. The pieces of timber of which it was to be composed, some of which had already formed part of the keel of the old ship, had all been shaped, the blocks laid in position, and every other preparation fully made, and nothing remained but to lay down the keel pieces on the blocks placed ready for their reception, and to bolt them together. In the fullness of his delight, Johnson resolved that the day should be a regular fete day, and accordingly on the morning in question the shipyard was gaily dressed with flags, of more than one nationality, which were hoisted upon poles hastily set up for the purpose, and all hands, clean-shaven and dressed in their best, prepared to assist in the ceremony. The proceedings were inaugurated by Johnson, who, attired in the full uniform of a captain of the American Navy, took up a position on one of the keel blocks, and from thence made an animated address to his followers, in which he rapidly sketched the history of the band from the day on which they had entered upon their present career by taking from their officers the Amazon tea clipper, in which they had sailed from China for England, down to the present time. He reminded them of the difficulties and misfortunes with which they had been obliged to contend, how they had unfortunately lost the Amazon upon an island some hundreds of miles to the westward of their present position, how they had been compelled to leave the island in open boats, of the sufferings which they subsequently endured, and how by a lucky accident they were finally enabled to obtain possession of the albatross. He next dwelt upon the good fortune which had since attended them, the many valuable prizes they had taken, the rich store of booty they had accumulated, and the steady augmentation of the numbers of the Brotherhood. Then, giving free rein to his fancy, he enlarged upon his plans for the future. What had already been done was, he said, nothing, a simple preliminary effort, a mere trial of strength, compared with what he would do. He would never be satisfied, he informed them, until he could finally lead them all out of that harbor, on board a fleet of at least ten well-armed, swift, and fully manned ships, in which it would be possible for them to ravage the entire coast of Spanish South America, despoiling the rich towns and laughing at all opposition. In this way, he promised them, he would place them in possession of such an unheard-of amount of treasure that every man among them should be worth his millions. After which, by following a plan which he would unfold to them at the proper time, they could quietly disband and settle down for the remainder of their lives, each man on that particular spot of earth which pleased him best, in the peaceful enjoyment of his well-earned gold. And they were assembled there that day, he added in conclusion, 
to lay the keel of the first of the ten clippers by which this glorious result was to be accomplished. It was an eloquent and masterly speech. Johnson was most accurately acquainted with the characters of those who surrounded him. He was making a great bid for the recovery of that popularity which in some unexplained way, but largely through the machinations of Alec Raleigh, he shrewdly suspected, had been steadily slipping away from him. And he believed that the making of such dazzling promises as he had just indulged in was the surest way of winning it back. And if vociferous and tumultuous cheering was to be taken as an indication of success, the pirate chief had every cause to be gratified. The enthusiasm was intense. Cheer after cheer rent the air. The men shook hands all round and then pressed forward, hustling each other, eager to perform the same ceremony with Johnson, vowing as they did so the blindest and most unswerving fidelity to him, and calling down the most frightful imprecations upon all traitors. Raleigh stood at some little distance in the background, his arms folded across his chest, and a cynical smile wreathing his lips. All right, he muttered. Go on and shout yourselves hoarse, you swine. Yell, cheer, and swear fidelity until you are out of breath, if it pleases you so to do. I like to see and hear it, for what is it, after all, but froth? You are all in a ferment just now, and it is best that this noisy gas should have its vent. You will soon sober down again, and then we shall see. As for you, he continued with a furtive scowl at Johnson, whose face beamed with gratification. You have had your day, and, blind bad as you are, you are beginning to see it just for a moment. But this fine speech of yours has thrown you off your guard again. You doubtless think that, with a few empty boastful words, you have recovered your lost position. But you are mistaken, my good friend, as you will find out when you return from your next cruise, if indeed you ever return at all. Well, enjoy your own opinion while you can. Rejoice in the ease with which you have re-established yourself. I shall not attempt to undeceive you, at least just now. So I will go and add my plaudits to those of the herd. Pah! And he spat contemptuously on the ground as he moved forward to shake Johnson cordially by the hand. Order being at length restored, the ceremony of laying the keel was proceeded with. The several pieces were already on the ground, properly shaped, with bolt holes bored, the bolts fitted, and in short every preparation made for fastening them together. And now, at a word from Johnson, a hundred eager hands seized the heavy timbers, and, under Lance's superintendence, placed them upon the blocks. The joints were next brought closely together, the bolts inserted, the perfect straightness of the entire length of keel accurately tested, and finally the bolts were all simultaneously driven home and the keel laid, amidst the deafening cheers of the pirates and the roar of a battery of guns which had been placed temporarily in position to do due honor to the ceremony. The men were then served with an extra allowance of grog, after which they were dismissed to amuse themselves in any way they pleased for the remainder of the day. Johnson saw fit to leave the shipyard in the boat, which conveyed Lance, Captain Staunton, and the rest of the Galatea party back to the settlement at the bottom of the bay. And it was evident during the passage that he was most anxious to make himself agreeable, and to leave behind him a favorable impression. At last, when the boat was nearing the beach at which the party intended to land, he said to Lance, "'Look here, Colonel,' I've been thinking about them women folk of yourn. They must find it mighty lonesome here with nothing much to do. Do you think it'd please em if I was to send one of them pianers to your diggings? Cause if you do, they shall have one. The cussed things ain't no use to us, and I don't hardly know what I fetched em along for. Thank you very much, said Lance. I have no doubt a little music now and then would prove a solace to them. Indeed, it would make the evenings much more pleasant for us all. And if you feel disposed to spare us an instrument, we shall remember you all the more gratefully. Then you may consider it done, Johnson replied, as the boat's keel grated on the beach and the party stepped ashore. Come up to the capstan house with me, and you can choose which you will have, and I will send it along at once. Lance accordingly proceeded to the capstan house with Johnson, while the remainder of the party wended their way straight to the hut well pleased at what they considered a mark of great consideration on the part of the pirate chief. When Lance found himself alone with his companion, he thought it would be a favorable opportunity to prefer a request which had been in his mind for several days, 
but which he had had no previous chance of mentioning. "'I am glad,' he said, "'to have this opportunity of thanking you, Captain, "'in the name of our party, "'for all you have done for our comfort, "'under circumstances which I could not fail to perceive "'have been somewhat trying to you. "'I now want to ask you to add one favor more, "'and that is, to supply us with a sufficiency of arms and ammunition "'to enable us to defend ourselves, if need be, in your absence. "'Whilst you are on the island, we feel ourselves to be safe, "'but I confess I am not altogether without doubts "'as to the treatment which we may receive "'at the hands of your Greek friend Raleigh after your departure. "'And it would add very greatly to our feeling of security in your absence "'if we were provided with the means of resisting any attempt "'at unfair dealing on his part.' I presume it is unnecessary for me to say that we should only use the weapons in a case of absolute necessity? Well, now, Colonel, said Johnson, what you ask is fair enough, and for my own part, I'd be willing enough to let you have all you want, but I vow I don't just see exactly how I'm to do it. The key of the arm chest is in the armorer's pocket, and I can't issue anything out of that chest without his knowledge. Now, I know that cuss. He's no friend of mine and he'd just go straight away and tell Raleigh what I'd done. And that had set the Greek dead again, you all, for a certainty, and make things just as uncomfortable for you as could be. Besides which, Raleigh'd just take them all away from you again as soon as my back was turned, and then you'd be worse off than ever. No, that won't do. We'll have to go some other way about it, but you leave it to me, General. You may bet your pile I'll find out a way to do it before I sail." Now, which of these boxes of music will you have? They had arrived by this time at the capstan house and were standing near the pianofortes, all of which had been placed together on the floor of the sail loft, the packing crates having been ripped off and probably used for firewood. Lance ran his fingers over the keyboard of each instrument in turn, striking a few chords and harmonies to test the quality of the tone and touch, and finally selected a superb grand by Broadwood. All right, General, I'll have the darn thing taken down to your quarters to once it. But do you mean to say that you know how to thump music out of them things as well as how to build batteries and ships and so forth? ejaculated Johnson. Well, yes, said Lance laughingly. I believe I must plead guilty to being somewhat of a musician, though I have not touched an instrument for many a day until now. Then sit right down there, Colonel, and play me something good, said Johnson, rolling the nail keg as a seat up to one of the instruments. Lance, thoroughly amused at the comical incongruity of the situation, sat down and rattled off Yankee Doodle, an air which he judged would be likely to find appreciation with his queer companion. Johnson stood for a moment spellbound as the well-remembered strains fell upon his ear. Then a broad grin of delight overspread his features, and finally he began to caper about the sail loft in the most extraordinary manner, and to utter certain unearthly sounds which Lance fancied was Johnson's idea of singing. "'Something else! Give me some more!' the pirate captain exclaimed rapturously when his entertainer at length raised his fingers from the keyboard. Whereupon Lance began to play and sing, Hail Columbia. Johnson stood still and silent as a statue now, the stirring strange touched an altogether different chord of his memory, and for an instant something suspiciously like a tear glistened in his eye. "'Thank you,' he said very quietly when Lance had finished. "'That will do now. I would rather not hear any more at present. Let me keep the sound of that song in my mind as long as I can. My little maid at home used to sing that to me. But look here,' he added, as Lance closed the instrument. "'If you wish to be on good terms with the men after I am gone,' Have them all up in the meeting room sometimes of an evening, and treat them to a little music. They will appreciate that, and you could do nothing more likely to win their regard. Why shouldn't you give them, give us all, a concert tonight, today being a holiday? Lance hesitated for a moment before making answer to this strange and unexpected proposal. To tell you the truth, he said at last, I am afraid your people will be hardly in a mood tonight to appreciate such music as I could give them. The grog will have got into their heads, and they will be more inclined to sing among themselves than to sit quietly to listen to me. Not at all, answered Johnson, who, now that a serious mood was upon him, had entirely dropped his Americanism of speech. Not at all. I have taken care to give orders that they shall not have sufficient to make them noisy. 
you will find them perfectly quiet and orderly, and I confess I should like to see the effect of a little genuine good music upon them. Very well, answered Lance nonchalantly. I am sure I have no objection, and, now that you have mentioned it, I confess I feel curious to see the result of so novel an experiment. Then it is settled, said Johnson, and he forthwith summoned a party of men, to some of whom he gave orders to remove to the hut the pianoforte Lance had chosen, while to others was deputed the task of taking one of the other instruments into the large room used for purposes of general assembly, and placing the room in proper order for the evening's entertainment, which was fixed to commence at the orthodox hour of eight o'clock. When Lance Evelyn sauntered into the hut, he was assailed by a general chorus of questions. "'What ridiculous story is this which my husband has been telling us, Mr. Evelyn?' inquired Mrs. Staunton. "'About the piano, you know,' added Violet. "'Is it actually true, Lance, that that absurd creature is really going to let us have one?' chimed in Blanche. "'It would be a good deal more sensible of him if he would provide us with more comfortable quarters,' grumbled Dale." "'I agree with you there, Dale. It certainly would,' said Rex Fortescue. "'Of course, I am speaking now of the matter as it affects the ladies. "'For ourselves we can rough it well enough, "'but I certainly wish they could be made more comfortable. "'However, the fellow seems to have done his best for us. "'I have seen no better building than this in the whole settlement, "'so I suppose we must endeavor to be content "'as long as we are obliged to remain here. "'And as for the piano, "'why it will enable the ladies to beguile an hour or two but it is a queer present to make under the circumstances, and the man who made it is certainly a bit of an eccentric. "'You are right,' replied Evelyn, "'and this gift is by no means his only eccentricity. "'Guess what is his latest request, or command, "'I scarcely know which to call it.' "'They all decided that it would be utterly impossible for them to guess. "'There was no saying what absurd whim might seize upon such a man. "'They would be surprised at nothing which he might ask, and so on.' "'Well, then, I will tell you,' said Lance. "'He wishes me to give the men a concert tonight "'at eight o'clock in the assembly room.' "'Oh, Lance, what an extraordinary request!' exclaimed Blanche. "'You will, of course, refuse. "'You will never trust yourself alone among all those men.' "'Certainly I shall,' answered her lover. "'Why not? "'There will not be the slightest danger. "'The men are not in an excited state by any means.' and I have an idea that a little music now and then may increase our popularity among them, and place us on a more secure footing, if indeed it does not enable us to reach and awaken whatever of good may still exist in their breasts. Besides, he added with a gay laugh, I feel curious to see what effect I can produce upon them. If you go, Lance, I shall go with you, said Rex. Violet Dudley glanced quickly and somewhat appealingly at the last speaker, but she had too much spirit to say a word which would keep her lover away from the side of his friend when there was a possibility that that friend might stand in need of help. "'I think I may as well go also,' remarked Captain Staunton. "'It seems hardly fair to leave you all the work to do, Evelyn, when any of the rest of us can help you. I can sing a fairly good song, I flatter myself, if I am not much of a hand at the piano, and so when you feel tired, I'll give you a spell.' "'All right,' said Lance. "'The more the merrier.' We shall at least show them that we are no churls. Are there any more volunteers? Certainly, said Bob. I'm one, Mr. Evelyn, if you will have me. I am something like Captain Staunton. I'm no hand at a piano, but I can sing, and I know a recitation or two which I think may serve to raise a good-humored laugh. I'm no singer, said Brooke, but I know a few rather taking conjuring tricks, and I should like to go with you. But perhaps it would be hardly prudent to leave the ladies without any protection, would it? Therefore, I think I'll remain tonight and go some other evening if there's going to be any repetition of this sort of thing. Mr. Dale said nothing. He simply sat moodily plucking at his beard and muttering to himself. By the look of his countenance, he was utterly disgusted with the whole proceeding. Thus, then, it was finally arranged, and at a few minutes before eight o'clock, Lance and his party issued from the hut on their way to the assembly room, which they could see was already brilliantly lighted up. End of chapter 12. Chapter 13 of The Pirate Island, A Story of the South Pacific by Harry Collingwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Raleigh explains himself, so does Lance. On entering the assembly room, our friends found that it was not only, as they had seen from the outside, well lighted, 
but that a very successful attempt had been made to decorate it by the draping of flags all round the walls, and the arrangement of an elaborate and well-designed flag trophy on the wall at the back of the elevated platform, or stage, as it may be called. The long table, with its accompaniment of chairs, had been pushed back against the wall, and the pianoforte stood in the center of the platform. The room was quite full, and the men appeared, for the most part, disposed to behave quietly and decorously. There were only some half a dozen young fellows who seemed at all inclined to be noisy or boisterous, and they occupied seats in the center of the room. Johnson occupied a chair on one side of the platform, and Raleigh balanced him on the opposite side. Johnson appeared rather surprised to see four of the Galatea party put in an appearance instead of one only, but he made no remark, merely waving them to accommodate themselves with chairs from those placed against the wall. "'I am rather better than my word, you see,' observed Lance to him, as the four friends stepped upon the platform. "'I promised to do what I could in the way of furnishing your people with a little entertainment tonight, and I have brought three volunteers with me, which will enable us to infuse into the proceedings a little more variety than I could hope to impart to them alone.' "'So much the better, Colonel,' returned Johnson. "'It's real kind of you, I call it, and if the lads don't appreciate it, they ought to. That's all I can say.' I've told him what you're going to do for him and all that, so as soon as you're ready, I guess you can fire away. Lance turned and opened the piano, looking quietly over the audience as he did so. His eye fell upon the half-dozen who seemed disposed to interrupt the proceedings, and stepping forward to the edge of the platform, he waved his hand for silence and said, Your captain informs me that he has already explained to you the reason for his invitation to you to be present here this evening. Today has been a somewhat notable day in the annals of the settlement. You have this morning laid the keel of a new ship, and commenced an undertaking which will tax your utmost skill, energy, and resource to carry through to a successful issue, and Captain Johnson has thought it an event of sufficient importance to be specially marked. Hence he has made it a holiday for all hands, and, finding that I possessed some little skill as a musician, he invited me to help in the celebration of the day by closing it with a musical performance. This I willingly consented to do in the belief that it might afford you a little pleasure and recreation, and I may as well take advantage of the present opportunity to tell you all that my friends and myself will always be found ready to do everything in our power to promote your comfort and welfare. But I must remind you that we are here tonight for your pleasure rather than our own. We will do our best to amuse you, and I hope that you, in your turn, will individually do what you can to maintain quiet and order. We may not perhaps succeed in pleasing you all. If such should be the case, let those who are dissatisfied rise and quietly leave, and not disturb others, or interfere with their enjoyment by giving noisy expression to their dissatisfaction. I notice one or two who seem inclined to be a little unruly, but I hope they have sense enough to see that such conduct on their part would be in the worst possible taste, and that they will think better of it. Loud exclamations of approval greeted this speech, mingled with shouts of, If they don't behave themselves, we'll turn them out, governor, and such like. There was a good deal of noise and confusion for about five minutes, during which Lance calmly seated himself and waited patiently for silence, and when this was at length restored, he went to the piano and sang to his own accompaniment Didbin's Tom Bolin. Lance possessed a full, deep, rich bass voice of exceptionally fine quality, and as the words of the song pealed through the room, a breathless silence was maintained by his strange audience, the silence of surprise and delight. Many of the men knew the song, had sung it or heard it sung hundreds of times on a ship's forecastle during the dog watch, but not one of them had probably ever heard it sung before by a man of refined feeling, capable of expressing the full sentiment of the words, and it now came upon them almost like a revelation. Sailors as a class are proverbially fond of music, but very few of them ever have, or perhaps, it would be more true to say, give themselves, the opportunity to hear anything of better quality than the trash sung in music halls, and most, if not all, of Lance's audience, now therefore experienced for the first time the refining power of really good music. Their enthusiastic applause at the conclusion of the song was perfectly deafening. Captain Staunton then stepped forward and sang in true seaman-like style the Bay of Biscay, the chorus of which was given with great unction and enjoyment by the whole audience. Rex Fortescue followed with The Death of Nelson, and then Bob gave in excellent style a laughable recitation which convulsed his audience, even to the tickling of the sullen rally into a grim smile. 
Then Lance sang again, and so the entertainment proceeded for a couple of hours, to the unbounded gratification of all hands, when the pirates dispersed in a perfectly quiet and orderly manner after giving, at Johnson's call, three cheers for their entertainers. "'Thank you, Colonel. Thank you heartily, all of you,' said that individual as our friends parted from him outside the capstan house. "'You've given us a real treat tonight, and I guess all hands will feel ever so much more friendly to you for it. Give them another dose or two of the same sort of thing now and again, and I reckon they'll take care you don't get ill-treated while I'm away.' "'What about the arms and ammunition which I ask for today?' said Lance. "'You leave that to me, General,' replied Johnson. "'I guess I'll find a way to let you have them before I sail. "'I won't forget it. You trust me. Good night.' "'Good night,' was the reply, and our friends turned away in the direction of the hut. "'Would you mind walking a little way up the valley, gentlemen, before we go inside?' said Bob. "'I want to tell you something I ought perhaps to have told you long ago, "'but we have been so busy I could never find an opportunity without speaking before the ladies who, I think, ought not to know anything about it. Certainly, Robert, said Captain Staunton. Let us hear what it is by all means. It is doubtless something of importance, or you would not speak so earnestly. Well, sir, said Bob, I wanted chiefly to warn you all not to trust Johnson too much. He seems friendly enough, but I doubt very much whether he is sincere. The day that we arrived in port, when the hands went aloft to stow the canvas, I jumped aloft with them, just to keep my hand in, as it were, and stowed the driver. While I was passing the gaskets, that fellow Raleigh came on board and entered into conversation with Johnson, who spoke to him about us, and more particularly about you, Mr. Evelyn. He said that you were going to design a very fast vessel for him, and that we were to assist in the building of her, and in the fortification of the harbor, and that as long as we could be of use, we were to be treated civilly, but that when we had done everything required of us, he wouldn't care how we were treated, or what became of us. "'The false, treacherous scoundrel!' exclaimed Captain Staunton indignantly. "'Was that all he said, Robert?' "'All that I heard,' said Bob. "'After that they both went into the cabin. "'I wasn't eavesdropping it, you know, sir. "'But I was just overhead, so that I couldn't help hearing every word they said. "'And as they were talking about us, I thought I was justified in keeping my ears open.' "'Quite right, Robert, so you were,' answered the skipper. "'We are surrounded by, and at the mercy of a band of men who have outraged every law,' both divine and human. It therefore behoves us, for our own sakes, and even more for the sake of the helpless women dependent upon us, to take every possible precaution, and to ascertain by every possible means what are their actual intentions regarding us. They are detaining us here against our will. They have imposed upon us tasks which they have not a shadow of right to lay upon us. And if they meditate treachery, which, from what you say, seems only too probable, we are justified in resorting to craft, if necessary, to protect ourselves. Is not that your opinion, gentlemen? Turning to Lance and Rex. Unquestionably, answered Lance promptly. The men are, one and all, excepting, of course, the few who have refused to join the Brotherhood, as they call it, outlaws. And, as such, they have no claim whatever to be treated in the straightforward fashion with which one deals with a lawful enemy, such as one meets with in ordinary warfare. Your information, Robert, is valuable, not altogether on account of its novelty, but rather as being confirmatory of what has hitherto amounted merely to conjecture on our part. I have long suspected that our friend Johnson is not quite so straightforward as he would have us believe. Well, forewarned is forearmed. We are evidently in a very critical position here, a position demanding all the coolness, self-possession, and foresight we have at our command to enable us to successfully extricate ourselves and I think we should give the matter our immediate consideration. Now, tonight, I mean, we shall perhaps never have a better opportunity, and endeavor to decide upon some definite plan of future action. Very well, said Captain Staunton. Let us continue our walk and talk matters over. It is perfectly evident, as you say, Mr. Evelyn, that we are in a very critical and difficult position, and the question is, what steps ought we to take in order to extricate ourselves? I think it is pretty clear that this man Johnson has no intention of releasing us of his own free will. We can be much too useful to him for him ever to do that. If, therefore, we are ever to get away from this place, it will have to be done in spite of him. And as we are too weak to escape by force, we must do so by craft. I can see no other way for it, can you? Well, said Lance slowly, blowing a long, thin cloud of cigar smoke meditatively up into the warm, still night air. I fancy we shall have to try a combination of both. 
I cannot conceive any practicable course which will allow of our escaping without coming to blows with the pirates. I wish I could. Of course, I do not care on my own account, although, notwithstanding my former profession, I am not particularly fond of fighting if it can be done without. But there are the ladies and poor little May. It is of them I always think when the idea of strife and bloodshed suggests itself. Then there is their comfort as well as their safety to be thought of. Were it not for them, I believe there would not be very much difficulty in seizing a stock of provisions and water, together with a boat, and slipping quietly out to sea some dark night, trusting to good fortune, or providence rather, to be eventually picked up by a passing ship. But I should certainly be slow to recommend so desperate a course under present circumstances, save in the very last extremity. The hardships those poor creatures passed through in their last boat voyage I have not yet forgotten. It is not necessary to repeat every word of the discussion which followed. Suffice it to say that it was of so protracted a character that the three individuals engaged in it did not enter their hut until the first faint flush of dawn was brightening the eastern sky. Bob had been dismissed within an hour of the termination of the concert, with a message to the effect that Captain Staunton and his two companions felt more disposed for a walk than for sleep, and that the rest of the party had therefore better retire when they felt so inclined as the hour at which the three gentlemen would return was quite uncertain. The time thus spent had not, however, been thrown away, for after a very earnest discussion of the situation, the conclusion arrived at was that they could not do better than adhere to their original plan of endeavoring to make off with the new schooner, and that her construction should therefore be pushed forward with all possible expedition. But that, as there was only too much reason to dread a change from the present pacific and friendly disposition, manifested toward them by the pirates. An attempt should also be made to win over as many as possible of the prisoners, not only with the object of effecting these poor creatures' deliverance from a cruel bondage, but also in order that the fighting strength of the Galatea party, as they came to term themselves, might be so far increased as to give them a slightly better chance of success than they now had in the by no means improbable event of a brush with the enemy. Now that the keel of the new schooner was actually laid, Operations were resumed with even more than their former alacrity on board the Albatross, and on the evening of the fourth day, after the events related in the last chapter, she was reported as once more ready for sea. During these four days, Captain Staunton and the rest of his party, excepting Dale, who positively refused to do any work whatever, had, in accordance with their resolution, been extremely busy at the new shipyard, getting out and fixing in position the stem and stern posts, and it was only by the merest accident that they heard on the evening in question that the brig was to sail on the following day. As Lance had heard no more about the promised arms and ammunition, he at once determined to see Johnson once more respecting them. He accordingly set out in search of the pirate captain, but to his chagrin was quite unable to find him or to learn his whereabouts. He searched for him in vain the whole evening, venturing even on board the brig, and it was not until after eleven o'clock that night that he gave up the search in disgust with a strong impression that Johnson had been purposely avoiding him. On the following morning, however, he was more successful, having risen before daylight in order that he might catch his bird on his first appearance in the open air. At six o'clock the bell rang as usual for the hands to turn to, and a few minutes afterwards the whole place was astir. Lance walked down to the landing place with Captain Staunton and the others, and saw them embark in the boats detailed to convey the working party to the new shipyard. He then whispered a word or two of explanation to his friends, and allowed the boats to go away without him. They had been gone about ten minutes or a quarter of an hour when Lance saw the man he sought emerge from the capstan house and walk hurriedly down toward the beach, where a boat, fully manned, appeared to be awaiting him. A few steps, and Lance was by his side. "'Good morning, Captain Johnson,' he said with inward amusement as he noted the confusion of the pirate at the unexpected and evidently unwished-for meeting. "'Good morning, General,' was Johnson's response, given with a heartiness which was visibly assumed. "'This is a real fine morning, I call it. Nice little breeze, too, off the land. I guess we shall make short miles of it today. I am downright glad you missed the boats this morning. Overslept yourself, I suppose. I wanted to say good-bye to you and your chums.' and I declare to goodness I was only just thinking when you come up to me that I'd be obliged to heave the brig too off the rock and run ashore in a boat just to shake flippers with you. Well, I guess I must be off. 
There's the foretop sail, just let fall, and I'm bound they've passed the messenger already. I'm real sorry I can't take you all with me and shove you ashore somewhere on the quiet, but you see how tis. That feller rally, but I ain't got time to talk any more, I swile. Goodbye. By the time I get back, I reckon you'll have the schooner pretty nigh ready for launching, eh? I hope so, said Lance. By the by, have you made any arrangements for letting us have the arms you promised? That fellow rally, as you have remarked. The arms? Well, now, only to think of that, exclaimed Johnson with well-feigned annoyance. What a doggone forgetful cuss I am. Blamed if I ain't forgot all about em. I've been that busy, if you'll believe me, General. I ain't had time to swallow a mouthful of grub this four days. Half starved to death I am. Just look at my waistcoat. Fits me like a sack. But about them arms, I declare I am real sorry I forgot them, General. But never mind. I guess you won't want them. If you do, he buttonholed Lance and whispered him confidentially. Just you take them. Help yourself to them. I give you my permission, I swile. And now I really must say goodbye. Take care of yourself, General, and go ahead with that schooner as fast as ever you can. Get her finished by the time I come back, and the battery too, and I promise you shall leave the island as soon as you like arterwards. They were by this time at the water's edge, and as Johnson uttered the last words of his farewell, he sprang into the boat, which was waiting for him, and flinging himself into the stern sheets gave the order to shove off. Ten minutes later the same boat was swinging at the brig's quarter davits, and the brig herself, with her anchor stock just showing above water, was moving slowly away towards the harbor entrance under topsails and jib. At a little distance from Lance stood Raleigh, watching the departure of the brig. Ah, he muttered, there you go, you vile American dog, you cowardly mean-spirited cur. Take my parting curses with you. May you meet with nothing but ill luck and perplexity. May misfortune follow you. May the very wind and the sea war against you. May the treachery which I have planned prevail over you. And may you die at last with the jeers of your enemies ringing in your ears. Goodbye, goodbye, he shouted, bringing the tips of his fingers together at his lips, and wafting with them an ironical salute after Johnson, who at that moment glanced shoreward and waved his cap. Goodbye, and the devil himself go with you. Aha, my Yankee friend. You little know that you are taking your last look at this scene. You little dream that the brig carries a dagger whose blade is thirsty for your heart's blood and whose point I have directed at your breast. Adieu, miserable coward, forever. I hope Antonio will not forget to tell you, as he drives home his blade, that it was I who ordered the blow. My revenge will else be robbed of half its sweetness. You thought, doubtless, that because it suited me to receive your insults in silence, that I should soon forget them. Bah! You should have known better. My very quietness, the repression of my resentment, should have warned you but you are a poor blind fool without any discernment, or you would have known that a Greek never forgets a wrong. Goodbye once more, and for the last time, goodbye. I wish you all speed on your road to perdition. And he waved his hat smilingly at the fast receding brig as he saw Johnson raise a telescope to his eye and level it in his direction. When the albatross had at length finally disappeared beyond the harbor's mouth, Raleigh turned for the first time and caught sight of Lance. Stalking up to him, he said scoffingly, So, Mr. Soldier, you have lost your friend at last. Yes, said Lance very quietly, if, I, as I imagine, you refer to your captain. But I must protest against your styling him my friend. He is nothing of the kind. Ah, yes, sneered Raleigh. Now that he is gone and can no longer protect you, you disown him. But that will not do. You and he were friends, whatever you may say. He is my enemy, and his friends are therefore my enemies also, and they will be treated as such. Do you understand me? Not in the least, said Lance. I have not the faintest notion of your meaning. Then listen to me, and I will explain, said Raleigh, his eyes gleaming vindictively. Do you know that your friend yonder is fated never to return? What is the meaning of this, thought Lance? Some treachery or other on the part of this rascally Greek, I'll wager but it will never do to allow him to suppose that he is master of the situation, so... I believe, he said carelessly, there is some sort of arrangement to that effect, is there not? The Greek gazed at him in unaffected alarm. Aha! he ejaculated. How came you to know that? Lance smiled at him compassionately. Did you really flatter yourself, he said, that your plans were so astutely devised, so cunningly concealed that none but you and your partisans could possibly know anything about them? 
Really, Mr. Rowley, I fear you are greatly overrating your own sagacity. But we appear to be wandering away from the point. You were about to explain the meaning of an obscure remark you made a minute or two ago. Lance had never removed his glance for a single instant from Rowley's face since the commencement of the conversation, and he was physiognomist enough to detect the signs of fear almost approaching to panic in the countenance of the Greek. He knew, therefore, that his bold guess had not been very far from the truth, and he continued to puff his cigar with all his wonted insocence as he waited calmly for the reply to his interrogation. Yes, said Raleigh, recovering his self-possession with evident effort. I was about to explain two things. First, I wish you to understand that Johnson is not my captain, nor is he the captain of anyone now on this island. We have thrown off our, what do you term it, our allegiance, blandly suggested Lance. Our allegiance, yes, that word will do. It explains my meaning, though it is not the word I intended to use, answered Raleigh. We have thrown off our allegiance. We are tired of him, this man Johnson, and we will have no more of him. He will never return here, and now I am Capitan. You understand? Lance nodded. Good. The next thing I was about to explain is that his friends are our enemies, you and your people especially. Is that plain? Perfectly, answered Lance, still outwardly calm and unconcerned as ever, though inwardly much perturbed. And I presume you intend us to accept these remarks of yours in the light of a threat of some kind? Raleigh looked hard at his interrogator before replying. He could not in the least understand this man who received with such perfect sang Freud the intelligence that he and his friends were to be regarded and treated as the enemies of a company of ruthless outlaws such as he must know Raleigh and his associates to be. Yes, he said at last, slowly and almost doubtingly, you may take what I say as a threat. I mean to pay to you and your friends all the great debt of vengeance which that other friend of yours, Johnson, has allowed to accumulate against him. I will be doubly avenged. I will be avenged upon him and upon you as well. Lance laughed gaily as he lightly knocked off with his little finger the ash from his cigar end. This was a serious, a direful business, but he had no intention to let the Greek see that his words had any alarming or disturbing effect upon him, so he said with a smile, Excuse me for laughing at you, but under the circumstances I really could not help it. Your ignorance of the true state of affairs strikes me as so positively ludicrous. You forget, my good sir, that I am behind the scenes. In your secret, you know. He added, seeing a look of bewilderment at the other expression. Why, man, you and all your people are absolutely at our mercy. You look surprised, but I assure you such is the fact. I really do not know whether I ought to explain myself to you. I scarcely think you deserve it after your recent threats. No. I will keep my own counsel. You shall remain in your ignorance. And he turned to walk away. Stop, gasped Raleigh. What is it you mean? I must know. Lance paused for a full minute as though irresolute. At last, he said, Well, perhaps it would be better for all parties that there should be, after all, a clear understanding. You and your people outnumber our party many times. And it is indisputable that you have it in your power in consequence to make us very uncomfortable. But for all that, you are absolutely at our mercy, and therefore it will be greatly to your advantage to treat us well. You will perhaps understand this better if I inform you that your plot against Johnson has been betrayed. He did not think it necessary to explain that as far as he knew, the only betrayal of it had been in the incautious words uttered by the Greek himself at the opening of their present conversation. And that if he does not return, neither will the brig. And then how will you be situated? You could possibly contrive to exist for a year upon the provisions left on the island. You might even, aided by the productions of the island itself, find sustenance for many years. But would the spending of the rest of your lives on this island be in accordance with your plans and wishes? And do you not think it possible that Johnson, in revenge for your plot against him, may find means to direct some cruiser to your hiding place? Your imagination, I take it, is vivid enough to picture the consequences of any such step on his part. We shall have the battery and the schooner, muttered Raleigh. Yes, said Lance, if we build them for you, not otherwise. There is not a man on this island outside our own party who could complete the schooner, much less build the battery. Now do you begin to understand that I was only speaking the truth when I spoke of your being at our mercy. Raleigh was silent. 
he stood with knitted brows, intently cogitating for some minutes. Then suddenly looking up into Lance's face with a smile, he said, Ah, bah, what obtuse people you English are. How impossible for you to understand a little joke. Well, I will joke no more since you cannot understand it. We will be good friends all round, the best of friends. You shall have no cause to complain of bad treatment, and you will work hard to finish the schooner and the battery early, please. I like not what you said just now about Johnson and the frigate, but that too was all a joke, I know. You are mistaken, said Lance. I confess I was dense enough not to understand that you were joking, so I spoke in earnest. But I think we clearly understand each other now, so I hope we shall hear no more about threats, revenge, and nonsense of that kind. And flinging his cigar end into the water, Lance turned on his heel and walked away. Knowing, or at least shrewdly guessing, that Rowley was watching him, he sauntered away in his usual careless and easy fashion toward the hut, which they had laughingly dubbed Staunton Cottage, and entered it. The ladies were busying themselves about various domestic tasks, and little May was amusing herself with an uncouth wooden doll which Bob had constructed for her. Lance was a prime favorite with May, so the moment that he entered, the doll was flung into a corner, and the child came bounding up to him joyously exclaiming, "'Oh, you funny Mr. Evelyn, how is it that you have not gone with my papa? Did you stay at home on purpose to play with me?' Well, not exactly, little one, answered Lance, catching her in his arms and tossing her high in the air, to her infinite delight. Not exactly, although a man might be worse employed than in amusing you, you mischievous little fairy. No, I am going to Papa presently, and would you like to come with me, May, in a nice little boat? I don't know, answered the child doubtfully. How far is it? I don't think I like boats. No, you poor little mite, I expect not. It would be wonderful if you did after what you have suffered in them, remarked Lance, holding the child now in his arms, while she played with his long beard. But we shall not have very far to go, pet, only over to that big rock, pointing out the window, and I will take great care of you. And shall I see my papa? inquired May. Oh, yes, was the reply. You will be with him all day, and Robert is over there too, you know, and I dare say he will play with you if you ask him prettily. Then I'll go, she decided promptly and forthwith went away to her mother with the request that her hat and jacket might be put on, cause I's going with Mr. Evelyn to see Papa, as she explained. I dare say you are somewhat surprised to see me here, remarked Lance, as he replaced his tiny playfellow on the floor. The fact is that I have been watching the departure of the brig, and the idea has occurred to me that now she is gone, and so many of the remaining men are away at the shipyard all day, you ladies may with, I believe, perfect safety, indulge in the unwanted luxury of a daylight walk. You all stand greatly in need of fresh air and exercise, and I really think there is now no cause to fear any molestation. Otherwise, I should not, of course, suggest such a thing. It will never do, you know, for you to remain cooped up here day after day. You will get low spirit in and out of health, and I am inclined to believe it will be rather a good idea than otherwise to accustom these fellows to the sight of you moving freely and fearlessly about." The ladies were quite unanimous in their cordial welcome to this suggestion, Blanche only venturing to add in a whisper and with a pleading look. Can you not come with us, Lance? We should feel quite safe then. I really could not, darling, he answered gently. It would not be fair to the others, you know. Besides which, I am urgently wanted at the yard today, and we must not let pleasure, however tempting, interfere with the progress of the schooner. I should like it immensely, of course, and if I thought there was the least particle of danger in your expedition, I would go. But I believe there is none. At the same time, you will of course keep your eyes open, dear, and be on the watch for any suspicious circumstance. And if you really must have an escort, there is Dale. Shall I ask him? Oh, Dale! ejaculated Blanche with such a contemptuous toss of her pretty little head that Lance said no more. It was sufficiently evident that the ladies would be badly in want of an escort indeed before they would accept Dale. The three ladies were soon ready, and as they took their way up the valley, Lance stood at the door with May on his shoulder, watching them, and when at last they passed out of sight, he made his way down to the landing place, seated the child carefully in the stern of a small dinghy, which he found moored there, cast off the painter, stepped in himself, and shipping the short paddles, drove the tiny boat, with long, easy, leisurely strokes, down toward the rock, chatting gaily with his tiny companion the while and causing her childish laughter to peal musically and incessantly across the placid surface of the landlocked water. 
End of chapter 13. Chapter 14 of The Pirate Island, A Story of the South Pacific by Harry Collingwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The ladies make a discovery, and Bob distinguishes himself. It was a most delightful day for a walk, the ladies averred enthusiastically, and their enthusiasm was quite justified. The azure of the sky overhead was relieved by a bank of soft, dappled, fleecy clouds, which served in some measure as a screen against the ardent rays of the sun and a gentle breeze from the westward imparted a feeling of freshness to the air, whilst it wafted to the pedestrians the subtly mingled perfumes of the thousand varied plants and flowers which flourished in the deep rich soil of the island. As the ladies walked quietly on up the gently sloping valley toward the hills, their enjoyment increased with every step. Hitherto they had only ventured abroad at night, and lovely as the landscape had appeared in the clear mellow radiance of the moon, the soft silvery light boldly contrasted with broad masses of rich grey-brown shadow. They agreed that it was incomparably more beautiful when viewed by the full light of day and in all the glory of brilliant sunshine. A thousand gorgeous colors on leaf and blossom, on gaily plumaged birds and bright-winged insect, charmed their eyes and enriched the foreground of the picture, while the dense masses of foliage, with their subtle gradations of color, light, and shade, as they gradually receded into the background, and finally melted into the rich purply gray of the extreme distance, balanced and harmonized the whole, completing one of the most beautiful prospects perhaps upon which the human eye had ever gazed. Their spirits rose as they walked steadily onward and upward, breathing with intense enjoyment the strong, pure, perfume-laden air, exhilarating in its effect as a draught of rich wine, and temporarily forgetting in the pleasure of the moment not only their past sufferings, but their present and future perils. They chatted merrily and arranged a hundred plans, many of which, could they but have known it, were destined never to attain fruition. Hitherto they had been following a faintly defined track in the luxuriant grass, a track which had always up to the present determined the direction of their longer walks. But arriving at last at a point where this trail turned abruptly off, and passed down a gentle declivity apparently toward the sea on the eastern side of the island, they determined to abandon it, and, tempted by the shade, to plunge boldly into a broad expanse of park-like timber which spread before them. The welcome shade was soon reached, and, somewhat fatigued with their ramble, they seated themselves at the foot of a gigantic cork tree, and in the rich green twilight shadow of its luxuriant foliage, discussed the luncheon with which they had had the forethought to provide themselves. The luxuriant grass which had hitherto carpeted the earth here gave place to graceful ferns in rich variety, interspersed with delicate mosses of velvety texture, and here and there, in the more open spaces, small patches of a heath-like plant with tiny waxen blossoms of a tint varying from the purest white to a dainty purple. The silence of the forest was broken only by the gentle murmur of the wind in the treetops, and the soft rustle of the foliage overhead, save when now and then a twittering bird flashed like a living gem from bough to bough. And there was a low, deep sound vibrating on the air, which told of the never-ceasing beat of the surf on the island's rock-girt shore. Rested and refreshed, the ladies at length rose to their feet once more, and continued their way through the wood. The ground soon began to rise steeply, and after nearly an hour's steady climbing, they emerged once more into the full and dazzling sunlight to find themselves standing on the edge of a steep rocky ravine through which, some fifty feet below, there flowed a tiny stream of crystal purity. The rocks were of a character quite new to them, and, ignorant of geology as they were, they would doubtless have passed them by without a second glance, had they not been attracted by a peculiar glitter here and there upon their surface, which proceeded, as they discovered upon a closer inspection, from the presence of minute particles of a dull yellow substance embedded in the stone. But what chiefly riveted their attention was a small basin-like pool with a smooth level sandy bottom, as they could clearly see from their elevated standpoint. The water appeared to be about two feet deep, and the basin itself was roughly a, a circular form, about ten yards in diameter. That it was obviously intended by nature to be used as a bath was the thought which flashed simultaneously through the minds of the three fair gazers, 
and as each one glanced half timidly around, only to feel reassured by the utter absence of any indication of probable unwelcome intrusion, the thought speedily found vent in words. "'Just look at that pool!' exclaimed Mrs. Staunton. "'What a delightful bath it would make!' "'Oh, Mrs. Staunton,' said Blanche, "'do you know that is exactly the thought which occurred to me? "'I feel tired, and I should so enjoy a plunge "'into the beautiful, clear, cool water. "'Do you think we might venture?' "'I do not see why we should not,' was the reply. "'What do you think, Violet?' "'I think it would be nothing short of a luxury,' answered Violet. "'I, too, feel tired, and I am sure it would refresh us. "'I am not afraid, if you are not.' "'Then let us risk it,' said Mrs. Staunton, "'with a sudden show of intrepidity, "'which was, however, only half genuine, "'and, each borrowing courage from the companionship of the others, "'they hurriedly scrambled down the rocky slope, "'and in a few minutes more were flashing the bright water "'over each other like naiads at play, "'their clear laughter echoing strangely "'among the mighty rocks of the ravine.' The water proved to be much deeper than they had supposed, being quite four feet deep in the center of the pool, which rendered their bath all the more enjoyable. The sand was, on the whole, beautifully fine, white, and firm beneath their feet, but occasionally they experienced a sensation of treading upon small, hard, roughly rounded objects among the finer particles, and finally Blanche encountered a lump so large and hard that, curious to see what it could be, she, with a motion of her foot, swept away the sand until the object was exposed to view. It seemed to be a rough, irregularly shaped pebble, somewhat larger than a hen's egg, of a dull yellow color, and reaching down her arm, she plunged beneath the water and brought the odd-looking object up in her hand. "'What a curious stone! And how heavy it is!' she remarked, holding it up to view. Her companions came to inspect it, and Mrs. Staunton took it in her hand to make a close examination." "'Stone!' she exclaimed excitedly. "'Why, my dear girl, this is gold! "'A genuine nugget, unless I am greatly mistaken. "'Mr. Thompson, a friend of my husband's in Sydney, "'showed us several gold nuggets, "'and they were exactly like this, "'only they were none of them nearly so large.' "'Do you really think it is gold?' asked Blanche. "'My dear Mrs. Staunton, my dear Violet, "'only fancy what a delightful thing it will be "'if we have actually discovered a gold mine. "'Why, we shall be able to present our husbands with a magnificent fortune each. A charming blush mantled the speaker's cheek as she said this, notwithstanding the fact that by this time the three women had no secrets from each other. I wonder if there are any more, remarked Mrs. Staunton. Surely that cannot be the only one here. I fancy I stepped on something hard just now. The three women at once went groping along the sand with their feet, and not in vain. First one, and then another, encountered a hard object which proved to be similar in substance to the one found by Blanche, and in a quarter of an hour they had between them collected upwards of a dozen of them, though one only, found by Mrs. Staunton, exceeded in size that of the first discovery. Then, feeling somewhat chilled by their long immersion, they returned to terra firma, and were soon once more wending their way homeward. In passing through the wood they contrived to lose their way, but, as it happened, this proved of but slight consequence, as though they eventually came out at a point nearly a mile distant from the pathway which they had followed in the morning. They were quite as near the settlement as they would have been had they faithfully retraced their original footsteps, and by four o'clock in the afternoon they found themselves once more within the shelter of the walls of Staunton Cottage, greatly fatigued, it is true, by their long ramble, but with an elasticity of spirits and a sense of renewed life to which they had long been strangers." Meanwhile, the party at the shipyard had been thrown into a state of unwanted excitement by an incident which at one moment threatened to have a tragic termination. A strong gang of men were at work upon the rock, all, indeed, who were left upon the island, excepting some dozen or fourteen, most of whom were employed in providing for the daily wants of the others, such as in baking bread, cleaning out the huts, airing bedding, and so on, and the scene at the mouth of the harbor was therefore a tolerably busy one. Captain Staunton was in charge of the shipbuilding operations, with Kit as foreman-in-chief, while Rex and Brooke were superintending operations at the battery, the former with a roll of rough-and-ready drawings in his hand, setting out the work, while the latter overlooked the construction of a lime kiln. Bob was making himself generally useful. It was while all hands were at their busiest that Lance put in an appearance, leading little May by the hand. She, of course, at once made a dash for, at her father, flinging her tiny arms round his neck, kissing and hugging him vigorously, 
and showing in a hundred childish ways her delight at being with him. And the unwanted sight of the pretty little creature created quite a temporary sensation. A large majority of the men there were steeped to the lips in crime, yet there were very few among them who had not still left in them, hidden far down in the innermost recesses of their nature, and crushed almost out of existence by a load of vice and evil doing, it may be, some remnant of the better feelings of humanity, and their features brightened and softened visibly as they witnessed the delight of this baby girl at finding herself with her father, and looked at her happy innocent face. Her visit was like a ray of sunshine, falling upon them from out the bosom of a murky and storm-laden sky, and as she flitted fearlessly to and fro among them, they felt for the moment as though a part of their load of guilt had been taken from them, that in some subtle way her proximity had exercised a purifying and refining influence upon them, and that they were no longer the utterly vile, God-forsaken wretches they had been. Fierce, crime-scarred faces lighted up with unwanted smiles as she approached them, and hands that had been again and again soaked in human blood were outstretched to warn or remove her from the vicinity of possible danger. For the first few minutes Captain Staunton had been anxious and apprehensive at her unexpected presence among the ruffianly band, but his face cleared, and his knitted brow relaxed as he saw the effect which the sight of her produced. And when Lance joined him, he said, "'Let her alone. She is doing more in a few minutes to humanize these men than you or I could achieve in a year.' The child was naturally interested in everything she saw, and with tireless feet she passed to and fro, pausing now and then to gravely watch the operations of some stalwart fellow hewing out a timber with his adze, driving home a bolt with his heavy maul, or digging into the stubborn rock with his pickaxe, and not infrequently asking questions which the puzzled seaman strove in vain to answer. At length, having satisfied her curiosity by a thorough inspection of all that was going forward, she wandered down to the spot where the hulk had been broken up, this was a tiny sheltered bay or indentation in the rocks, and a large raft had here been constructed out of the dismembered timbers and planking, which were kept afloat in order that the powerful rays of the sun might not split and rend the wood. Two or three detached planks formed a gangway between the raft and the rocks, and along these planks May passed on to the raft, without attracting the attention of anyone, it happening that just at that moment most of the hands were summoned to tail on to the fall of a tackle, which was being used to raise one of the timbers into its place. Gradually she strayed from one end of the raft to the other, and presently her attention was attracted by a curious triangular-shaped object which she saw projecting out of the water and moving slowly along. She wondered what it could possibly be, and, in order the better to see it, ran nimbly out upon the end of a long plank which projected considerably beyond the rest. So eager was she to watch the movements of the strange object that she overshot her mark and with a splash and a cry of alarm fell into the water. The triangular object immediately disappeared. Luckily at this instant Bob glanced round, just in time to see the splash caused by May's involuntary plunge and to note the simultaneous disappearance of a dark object in the water close at hand. Divining in a moment what had happened, he set off with a bound down the sloping rocky way toward the raft, shouting as he went, a shark! A shark! And May has fallen overboard! For a single instant there was a horror-stricken pause. Then tools were flung recklessly aside. The tackle fall was let go and the timber suffered to fall unheeded to the ground again. And the entire gang with one accord followed in Bob's wake, hastily snatching up ropes, boat hooks, poles, oars, anything likely to be useful as they ran. Meanwhile Bob, running with the speed of a hunted deer, had passed, as it seemed to the spectators, with a single bound down the rocks and along the entire length of the raft, from the extreme end of which he plunged without pause or hesitation into the sea. A bright momentary flash, as he vanished beneath the surface of the water, seemed to indicate that he carried a drawn knife or some such weapon in his hand. Simultaneously with the disappearance of Bob, May's golden curls reappeared above the surface, and the child's aimless struggles and her choking, bubbling cries lent wings to the rescuing feet of those who had listened again and again unmoved to the death screams of their fellow men. Another moment, and there was a tremendous commotion in the water close to the child, first a sort of seething whirl, then a dark object flashed for a moment into view. There was a furious splashing, a darting hither and thither of some creature indistinctly seen amid the snowy foam, 
and then that foam took on a rosy hue which deepened into crimson. The commotion subsided, and Bob appeared once more on the surface, breathless and gasping. With a couple of strokes he reached May's side, and half a dozen more took him alongside the raft in time to deliver her into Captain Staunton's outstretched arms. "'Unhurt, sir, I believe. Thank God!' Bob gasped as he delivered up his charge, and then, when the little one had been raised out of the water and clasped with inarticulate thanksgivings to her father's breast, he added, "'Give us a hand, some of you fellows, will you? And heave handsomely, for I believe my leg's broke.' "'Lay hold, boy!' And a dozen eager hands were outstretched to Bob's assistance, foremost among them being that of a great black-bearded fellow named Dickinson, who had formerly been boatswain's mate on board a man-o'-war, but who had deserted in order to escape the consequences of a sudden, violent outburst of temper. Lay hold! Bob grasped the preferred hand and was brought gently alongside the raft. Now then, exclaimed Dickinson, assuming the direction of affairs, kneel down on the edge of the raft, one of you. You, Frenchy, you're pretty handy with your flippers. Kneel down and pass your arm under his legs, as high up as you can. Say when. Are you ready? Then lift, gently now, and take care you don't strike him against the edge of the raft. So, that's well. Now, lift him inboard. That's your sort. Now, off jacket, some of us, and let's sling him. He'll ride easier that way. Are we hurting you, my lad? Not much, thank ye, answered Bob cheerfully. There, he added, as they once more reached the rocks. That'll do, mates. Lay me down here in the shade and tell Mr. Evelyn I'm hurt, presently, you know, after he's brought the little girl round. In the meantime, Lance, almost as much concerned as Captain Staunton, had hurried after the latter and offered his assistance, which was thankfully accepted. But there was very little that needed doing. So prompt had been Bob in his movements that the poor child had never actually lost consciousness, and after a great deal of coughing up of salt water and a little crying, May was so far herself again as to be able to call up a rather wan smile and, throwing her arms round her father's neck, to say, don't be frightened any more, Papa dear. May's better now. Great seemed to be the satisfaction of the crowd of men who had clustered round the group as they heard this welcome assurance. And then in twos and threes they slunk away back to their work, seemingly more than half ashamed that they had been betrayed into the exhibition of so human a feeling as interest in a mere child's safety. If the little un's all right, mister, you'd better have a look at the chap that pulled her out. His leg's broke, I think, remarked Dickinson's gruff voice at this juncture. His leg broken? Good heavens, I never dreamed of this, exclaimed Captain Staunton. Poor fellow, poor Robert, let us go at once and see what can be done for him, Evelyn. You'll find him there under that rock, remarked the ex-boson's mate in a tone of indifference, indicating Bob's resting place by a careless jerk of the thumb over his left shoulder as he walked away. Captain Staunton and Lance rose to their feet, and, the former carrying his restored darling in his arms, went toward the spot indicated. They had gone but a few paces when they were overtaken by Dickinson, who, with a half-sulky, half-defiant look on his face, said, "'I suppose I can't be any use, can I? If I can, you know, you'd better say so, and I'll lend you a hand, and let me see the man that'll laugh at me. I ain't quite a brute, though I dare say you think me one. I like pluck when I see it, and the way that boy jumped in on the shark was plucky enough for anything. If it hadn't been for him, Skipper, that little galley yorn have been a goner and no mistake. You are right, Dickinson. She would indeed. Thank God she is spared to me, though. You can, no doubt, be of the greatest use to us. And as to thinking you a brute, I do nothing of the kind, nor does Mr. Evelyn, I am sure. I believe you make yourself out to be a great deal worse than you really are. Well, Robert, what is this, my boy? Is it true that your leg is broken? I am afraid it is, sir, answered Bob, who looked very pale and was evidently suffering great pain. But I don't care about that, so long as May is all right. She is, Robert, thanks to God and to your courage. But we will all thank you by and by more adequately than we can do now. Let us look at your leg. That is the first thing to be attended to. Will you allow me, Captain Staunton? interposed Lance. I have some knowledge of surgery, and I think my hand will be more steady than yours after your late excitement. The skipper willingly gave place to Lance, and the latter, kneeling down by Bob's side, drew out a knife with which he slid up the left leg of the lad's trousers. A painful sight at once revealed itself. The leg was broken halfway between the ankle and the knee, and the splintered shin bone protruded through the lacerated and bleeding flesh. 
Captain Staunton felt quite sick for a moment as he saw the terrible nature of the injury, and even Lance turned a trifle pale. "'A compound fracture, and a very bad one,' pronounced Evelyn. "'Now, Dickinson, if you wish to be of use, find Kit the carpenter and bring him to me.' The man vanished with alacrity, and in another minute or two returned with Kit. Lance explained what he wanted, a few splints of a certain length and shape, and a supply of good stout spun yarn. "'Do you think Rally would give us a bandage or two, and a little lint from one of his medicine chests?' asked Lance of Dickinson. "'If he won't, I'll pound him to a jelly,' was the reckless answer, and without waiting for further instructions, the man ran down to the water, jumped into the dinghy, and, casting off the painter, began to ply his oars with a strength and energy which sent the small boat darting across the bay with a foaming wave at her bows and a long swirling wake behind her. In less than half an hour he was back again with the medicine chest and all its contents, which he had brought away bodily without going through the formality of asking permission. The splints were by this time ready, and then began the long, tedious, and painful operation of setting and dressing the limb, in the performance of which Dickinson rendered valuable and efficient service. The long agony proved almost too much for Bob. He went ghastly pale, and cold perspiration broke out in great beads all over his forehead seeing which the boatswain's mate beckoned with his hand to one of the men standing near and whispered him to fetch his dickinson's allowance of grog the man went away and soon returned with not a single allowance but a pannikin full of rum the result of a spontaneous contribution among the men as soon as they were informed that it was wanted for bob with the aid of an occasional sip from this pannikin the poor lad was able to bear up without fainting until lance had done all that was possible for him and then Dickinson and three other men, lifting him upon a strip of tarpaulin lashed to a couple of oars, carried him down to one of the boats, and jumping in with Lance and Captain Staunton, who could not be persuaded to trust May out of his arms, pushed off and rowed him down to the bottom of the bay. About a couple of hundred yards from the rocks, they passed the body of a great dead shark floating belly upwards upon the surface of the water. The creature appeared to be nearly twenty feet long, and the blood was still slowly oozing from three or four stabs and a couple of long, deep gashes near the throat. The mouth was open, and as the boat swept past its occupants had an opportunity to count no less than five rows of formidable teeth still erect in its horrid jaws. Captain Staunton pressed his child convulsively to his breast as he gazed at the hideous sight, and Dickinson, who pulled the stroke oar, averred with an oath his belief that there was not another man on the island with pluck enough to tackle such a monster. "'By the by, Robert,' said Captain Staunton, "'you have not yet told us how you came to break your leg. Did you strike it against the timber when you jumped overboard, or how was it?' "'No, sir,' said Bob. "'It was this way. Just as I reached the end of the plank, I caught sight of the brute rushing straight at May. I could see him distinctly against the clean sandy bottom, and he was not above six feet off.' so I took a header right for him, whipping out my sheath knife as I jumped, and luckily he turned upon me sharp enough to give little May a chance, but not sharp enough to prevent my driving my knife into him up to the hilt. Then I got hold of him somewhere, I think it was one of his fins, and dug and slashed at him until I was out of breath, when I was obliged to let go and come to the surface. The shark sheared off, seeming to have had enough of it, but in going he gave me a blow with his tail across the leg, and I felt it snap like a pipe stem. And, instead of making for the raft, you swam at once to May, thinking of her safety rather than the pain you were suffering, said the skipper. Bob, you are a hero, if ever there was one. This is the second time you have saved my child from certain death, and I shall never forget my obligations to you, though God alone knows whether I shall ever have an opportunity to repay them. I say, mister, I wish you wouldn't have quite so much to say about God, it makes a chap feel uncomfortable, growled Dickinson. Does it, said Captain Staunton? How is that? I thought none of you people believed in the existence of such a being. I can't answer for others, sullenly returned Dickinson, but I know I believe. I wish I didn't. I've tried my hardest to forget all about God and to persuade myself that there ain't no such person, but I can't manage it. The remembrance of my poor old mother's teaching sticks to me in spite of all I can do. I've tried, he continued with growing passion, to drive it all out of my head by sheer deviltry and wickedness. I've done worse things than e'er another man on this here island, hain't I, mates, to his fellow oarsman. Aye, aye, Bill, you have. 
You're a regular devil sometimes. A real out-and-outer and no mistake, were the confirmatory replies. Yes, Dickinson continued, and yet I can't forget it. I can't persuade myself, and the more I try, the worse I feel about it, and I don't care who hears me say so. Well, you seem to be in earnest in what you say, Dickinson, but I really cannot believe you are. No man who really believed in the existence of a god of justice could continue to live a life of sin and defiance, said the skipper. Wouldn't he? fiercely retorted the boatswain's mate. Supposing he'd done what I've done and lived the life I've lived, what would he do? Answer me that. Come up to our hut next Sunday morning at eleven o'clock, and I will answer you. What? Do you mean to say that you'll let me in, and then women folks there too? Certainly we will, said Captain Staunton heartily. We are all mortal, like yourself, and the ladies will not refuse, I am sure, to meet a man who feels as you do. Then I'll come, exclaimed the man, with a frightful oath, intended to add emphasis to his declaration, and then, as the boat's keel grated on the beach, he and his mate sprang into the shallow water, and lifting Bob in his impromptu stretcher carefully upon their shoulders, they proceeded with heedful steps to bear him toward the hut. Now there, remarked Captain Staunton in a low voice as they hurried on ahead to get Bob's bunk ready for him, there is an example of a human soul steeped in sin, yet revolting from it, struggling desperately to escape, and in its despair only dying itself with a deeper stain. It is a noble nature in revolt against a state of hideous, ignoble slavery. And I pray God that I may find words wherewith to suitably answer his momentous question. Amen, said Lance fervently, raising his hat reverently from his head as the word passed his lips. In another ten minutes they had poor Bob safely in the house and comfortably bestowed in his berth. The medicine chest had been brought back in the boat and was soon conveyed to the hut, and while Lance busied himself in mixing a cooling draught for his patient, Dale, to the intense astonishment of everybody, voluntarily undertook to prepare some strengthening broth for him. The man's supreme selfishness gave way, for the moment, to admiration of Bob's gallant deed, so immeasurably beyond anything of which he felt himself capable, and, genuinely ashamed of himself, for perhaps the first time in his life, he suddenly resolved to do what little in him lay to be useful. When Lance came downstairs for a moment after administering the saline draft, he found Dickinson and his three companions still hanging about outside the door in an irresolute manner, as though undecided whether to go or stay. He accordingly went out to them and, with an earnestness quite foreign to his usual manner, thanked them warmly yet courteously for their valuable assistance. Lance never forgot that he was a gentleman and was therefore uniformly courteous to everybody, and then dismissed them, adding at the last moment a word or two of reminder to Dickinson as to his promise for the following Sunday, which he emphasized with a hearty shake of the hand. The boatswain's mate walked away down to the boat silently, and in a seemingly dazed condition, holding up his right hand before him, turning it over and looking at it as though he had never seen it before. He never opened his lips until the boat was in mid-channel when, resting on his oar for a moment, he said, "'Well, shipmates,' You've heard me say today words that I wouldn't have believed this morning I could find courage to say to any human being. Now, I'm not ashamed of them. I won't go back from a single word. But you know as well as I do what a rumpus there'd be if it got to be known that there'd been said what's been said this afternoon. I don't care about myself, not a single curse. You and as many more fools as choose can laugh at me until you're all tired. But mind, I won't have a word said about them. If this gets abroad, they'll be made uncomfortable, and I won't have it. Do you hear, mates? I won't have it. The first man that says a word about it, well, with a powerful effort to curb his passion, the best thing he can do is to take to the water and swim right out to sea, for the sharks will be more merciful to him than I will. All right, matey, all right, good-humoredly answered one of the men. You needn't threaten us. No occasion for that. We're not going to split on your old man. Perhaps, if the truth was knowed, there's others beside yourself as don't feel particular comfortable about this here piratin' business. I won't mention no names. And anyhow, you may trust me not to say a word about what we've heard today upon it. And there's my hand upon it. And mine. And mine. The preferred hands were silently grasped with fervor, and then the oars were resumed and the boat sped on her way to the shipyard. End of chapter 14